in the same uh, uh, sphere as, as, as Lars Randstrom and, and um, uh, David Abrams. Um, but what do you think about Brad Rodo getting an award? Uh, well, I think high time he did. You know, I mean, he's been doing a lot of work. Uh, his blog is exceptional. And he did take on the US academic establishment and won. And I think uh, that's really remarkable. Yeah. As, as Jerry Stimson said, he, he, um, he took on a Stanton Glantz study in particular, didn't he? And, yeah. uh, and delved into it and got that retracted, which, is, which was useful. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've seen, you know, through Jerry how difficult it is to get these retractions. So he must have worked really hard in the background. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And Kudos for yeah, them. I first met Brad years ago, like, you know, 2004, 5, 6 or something, when harm reduction was really um, just emerging as a discussion area and he was really into it then and very strong and you sort of think, you know, you watch what happened to him by vilification and what's happening to many of the uh, scientists and people working. So I agree with you that I think the fact that he was awarded it is a significant recognition of what he's done for this because he was really, uh, at least in my perspective, personal time, one of the pioneers of this, um, mm. this area. Yeah. And it was great to see him in his trade bow tie as well, yes. wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's him in his bow tie. It's ubiquitous. Uh, <laughs> OK, so we move on to today's events. And we have, we have three, three interesting sessions. Um, the first one is another keynote from Mark Gunter. Of course, Mark wrote that um, pretty awesome piece about um, uh, sort of criticising the WHO and their approach. And uh, he's written a few pieces since. But um, what are your thoughts on that? What are you looking forward to with... with uh, I'll start with you, well, well, I'm really li looking forward to that one because uh, it was for the first time that someone from inside the philanthropic establishment spoke about this, you know, and it's... And it is important it's being said because, uh, you know, that bad philanthropy, it has a devastating effect in developing nations because this money travels far, influences policy, harms millions of people. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah, I think, I think just being brave like he appears to be and I think hearing that message will resonate uh, very well with a lot of people and, you know, people starting to, from, from that background, starting to stand up and, and say things, I think it's very very powerful, or can be, yeah. And it's good that he's agreed to come here, isn't it? Like you yes. said, he comes from philanthropy rather than harm reduction itself, and he speaks a lot on a lot of different subjects. Yes. And it is a good to have a voice from outside of our kind of echo chamber, if you like. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Sure, and others can see it too, so, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it sort of validates what we have been saying for such a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the next one is, and, and I think we can talk about this at length probably, especially you, Sam, academic freedom, freedom and the ghost of Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. I mean, we mentioned McCarthyism a lot when, it, when we're talking about harm reduction because it does feel that way, that, that, that sort of cancel, cancelling element to anyone who, who speaks up in favour of harm reduction. And, and you uh, will have a lot of uh, experience of that from India, won't you? Sure, yes. Uh, I mean... First of all, academic freedom is shrinking, you know, globally and in, you know, and especially in tobacco control where walls are being drawn, people are being excluded for, for you know, really simple reasons, right? Like the, we're moving away from science and more into ideology in academic uh, writing and manuscripts. In India, this problem is especially acute because uh, the government banned vaping research, you know, so <laughs> mm. you don't have any freedom then. Uh, so it is either on the scientists then to fight back, which uh, a lot of them don't in feel inclined to do. So panels like these where, you know, uh, academicians get together and talk about this is quite important. Mm. I mean, how, how just to, just to emphasize that, say that again, they banned <laughs> vaping yeah, research. Yeah, I yeah. mean, how, c how can you ban academic research? I mean, well, they did, and I believe, uh, so uh, it, it's strange. Uh, you can research cannabis in India, but you cannot research uh, vaping devices. And uh, when the government was asked, they said, okay, we, we had a policy. I mean, they have banned, you know, electronic uh, nicotine delivery systems. So we have declared a policy and we don't want anyone uh, speaking against it. Because I think everyone knows the science and the facts are on the side of harm reduction. You know, vaping is significantly mm -hmm. less harmful. It's not very difficult to prove that. But they just don't want to give that credibility through academic writing. 
Yeah, I think that's true in, in some institutions in Australia as well that have tried to do some nicotine brain science and things like that, that due to the, the, the research um, subject matter there, they're being precluded from, from uh, doing that. But I, I think that the title, um, you know, the, the Senate McCarthy, McCarthyism, we, we all know, you know, what that can do. And, you know, and I think you, you see it in the international area with the WHO and, you know, almost sort of in some instances rewriting history, rewriting what government governments actually agreed to in the FCTC, or at least rewriting the way they should interpret it. Things like that, I think, you know, I, I, I think it's a very apt heading, whoever thought of it, and um, very, very keen to hear what the speakers in that session have to say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because, I mean, banning research is off the scale. Yeah. You know, we don't yeah. want to have this debate at all. But, um, Jeannie, we know that uh, the WHO tends to cherry-pick evidence, but mm -hmm. that's that's not quite the same as just banning the research entirely, is it? But no. you know, do you talk about what the WHO does with its evidence, especially with some of the Tobreg and, and stuff? Well, I think I think the recent Tobreg report, um, Tobreg 8, um, it's got... I mean, Tobreg, the tobacco regulatory scientific arm of the WHO, used to historically be very um, scientific, one might say. <laughs> Um, I mean, it, it did one in the past, which was really spoke about SNOS and the, the benefits of smokeless, you know, to, um, to reducing harm, etc. And then come on to the most recent ones, they're really getting into areas where you think, you know, this really isn't the science that, you know, I know from academics and other people. It's very different. And therefore, you know, are they, are they writing it in a particular way? Are they, are they you know, specifically looking for outcomes and then creating research to match that? I'm not saying that's the case, but it certainly looks like it. And those that, you know, who are on those those boards, and even what they do write or come out with, then the administrative parts of the WHO then seek to, as you've said, cherry pick now and and use those as reasons why they want to encourage governments to do certain things. And I think that's where governments really should look at their own national situation and really look what could be beneficial to them as a country to reduce the harm from smoking, instead of just slavishly following what an unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy in uh, Geneva is telling them to do. Yeah. Um, well, we touched the other day in the panel that I, I chaired about Africa in particular and how they have a perfect storm, if you like. You have the WHO encouraging them to, to restrict or ban uh, vaping products and harm reduction products, and you also have a flood of money from Michael Bloomberg going into Africa uh, to influence that. Um, Samra, you probably have, have felt a bit of this Bloomberg influence in... Of course, in, you know, uh, in, I mean, in the run-up to the ban, you could see that, you know, this, this confluence, you know, the WHO and its influence, the Bloomberg network, and also, of course, uh, the country's own tobacco interests, because, you know, the country actively participates in the tobacco trade. Mm -hmm. All of that came together, you know, so... Uh, you have WHO saying something, you know, the, the health minister at that time was a former WHO advisor, so very well steeped into that WHO prohibitionism and top-down approach. And, uh, and then came Iwali, which was used to, you know, really create panic among senior uh, uh, government officials, and that's how the ban came. So it is, uh, it is an excess. It needs to be spoken about. It needs to be uh, questioned, you know. Uh, I think uh, yesterday there was a hearing held uh, in Thailand, uh, which followed a similar script on what happened in Philippines, mm -hmm. where the ministers asked these bureaucrats, OK, so declare your conflict of interest. Who are you tied with? Which organization is funding you? So that kind of pushback, I, I, I'm really happy to see that. And I hope it happens in other countries too. Yeah, that is interesting. That's, that's good if that's happening. Yes, Very and I, I think the title McCarthyism, you know, if we think back to the time where people, neighbours were, you know, were pointing out other neighbours and really, and I think a lot of the people who are, um, or even, you know, UK and other places speaking up about these sorts of things, you know, as soon as they put their head above the parapet to reveal some of the science they have, you know, someone, you know, from the University of Bath or someone like that will, you know, finger point them and say, you know, you're, you're talking on behalf of the tobacco industry or, you know, you've got some vested interest that you're not declaring and that people are really afraid of that. And I think that's the element of McCarthyism. People started to become really afraid in the culture of, um, of being able to just go about their daily business. And here we are, or here they are, um, you know, being vilified on many occasions for speaking what the science finds. And that's, that's a real shame. So once again, 
I think McCarthyism is, is a good way to, yeah. to, to define it. It, it is a chilling effect, isn't it? Even, mm. even people that we know who would have been at GFN in the past who, who no longer are because they feel no. threatened. I mean, yeah, yeah. they don't know what's going to happen to them if yeah. they come. Even if they yeah. just come sit in the audience and watch, mm -hmm. you know, something's going to be turned into something and the, and the machine will take that on and, and make them look really bad. And that can be very damaging for scientists' careers. Yeah. And if you saw last year, they uh, put out a paper uh, specifically targeting THR consumer organizations. Mm. You know, and, and that's ridiculous. Mm. We are not tobacco industry, you know, but we are consumers who demand safer products. And if someone is making them, doesn't make us, you know, uh, in, in bed with them. And they wrote this whole paper, and if you go to Tobacco Tactics, the Inco page is just full of lies, and you know, it's just, they're trying to demonize, exclude, stigmatize, mm -hmm. and I think it needs to stop. And you know, the more we speak about it. Mm. It's interesting that, um, that I think the global state of tobacco harm reduction are doing, uh, have done some research into how much consumer organizations are funded um, across the world, not, not just one of them this is, but they worked out, I think it was around about $130,000 globally is, is it, and most of that money is coming from consumers themselves yeah. um, in fact all of it really uh, and that that's all that we've all got to fight for as consumers whereas the other side Michael Bloomberg spent 160 million dollars just on the issue of trying to ban flavors so yeah. we're really up against mm. it. I think that's the shame you know I mean you can understand Bloomberg putting uh, money in there to try and deter people from smoking and the harms of tobacco smoke which is where you know we all agree on both sides but you know to put it into an area that is actually the safer side of the argument or safer products is mm. is very nonsensical and you know therefore you can see very politically driven vested yeah. interests on the other side, for yeah, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. And we have one last panel uh, of the morning's activities, and it's uh, safer nicotine products. It's not all about vaping. Now, this is right up my street, because um, I'm often talking to consumers in, in the UK, vaping consumers, who, who seem to think vaping is the product, and they're not too keen on other products. They always feel that other products, like heat tobacco, snus, is either not their concern, or um, they feel they might be a threat and, and they might be a threat to vaping, so they can be quite... A, and my argument is always that harm reduction is a vapor's um, winning argument. Harm reduction is the, the thing that binds mm. us, us together on this and that they should all be supported. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased and looking forward to seeing that. I mean, it, Jeannie, what, what are your thoughts on that panel? Definitely. I mean, my view is that consumers um, should be able to choose whatever they want and therefore all products that are, you know, should be available. And uh, I think different products are going to different work, work for different people, even at different times, in different places. So Swedish schnoss will work for some nicotine pouches. And, you know, we've learned here there are wet ones and there are dry ones. You know, they should <laughs> all both exist. <laughs> and, you know, we move to heated tobacco. Heated tobacco works for a lot of people. I mean, Japan has now the lowest, um, almost a lower smoking rate than the UK, I understand, because they allow and have a very strong uptake of heated tobacco. And, and vaping, of course, you've got open systems, which work for a lot of people, where you, you, know, you can use the battery in the liquid, or closed systems, which is the disposable um, vaping products and the, um, and, and the, like the, the pod-type products. So you've got everything. Let, let them all exist and let people decide what works for them and it's going to help them, most of all, either quit or, or switch to something more, more less harmful. Yeah, sure. It's interesting you talk uh, there about Japan because I think their cigarette sales have gone down by 47.5%, or I think almost halved the number of, of amount of cigarette sales in Japan. And that's starting to translate into lower hospitalizations for mm -hmm. COPD and, and heart attacks and stuff like that. So we know harm reduction works, but that sort of is now playing out in real life. But it's interesting how that happens in Japan and in Sweden it's snus and, and in the UK it's vaping. And, and Samra, uh, one thing I, I've noticed is, is that I think where they're trying out nicotine pouches now tends to be in areas where they use, you know, very horrible stuff that they put in their yeah, mouths yeah. and and they they can be useful in that respect i mean sure you, yes, you would know with uh, india with with uh pan and, and all the other things they can get so yeah. so this is one panel i'm also uh, really looking forward to because uh, we started out as association of vapors india you know so vaping is in our name mm -hmm. uh, but we really wanted to contribute to bringing down overall deaths and disease from tobacco in our country and then we realized for every smoker there are two smokeless tobacco users mm -hmm. that's 200 million people 
Yeah. Now, they could be really well served with snooze and nicotine pouches, uh, which can be low-cost solutions. And also for, you know, the BD smokers, the low-end, uh, they could also transition. So, uh, the more products we have, the, you know, the, the more less harmful products we have, it creates uh, more options for people to transition from whichever product that they are coming from. So, smokeless tobacco users may find, and, I, and I'm confident they will, uh, find easier to s transition to snooze or nicotine pouches. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, smokers can always, uh, you know, use vaping, uh, and if they want, they can also try snooze. I mean, a lot of uh, vapors in India after the ban have actually moved to snooze mm -hmm. rather than fall back to cigarettes, and I think that's wonderful. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose we should talk about in. in in regard to these products, we're struggling globally with just with vaping, uh, which is mostly made by independent companies. How does the debate about harm reduction products get sort of play out uh, amongst our op opponents when the tobacco industry is involved, especially with heated tobacco and snus, where they are almost ex the ex exclusive manufacturers? How do you think that's going to play out in the future? Because if we're having a hard time with vaping products, what's it going to be like for those products in the future? Well, I suppose one thing I, I just noticed um, is that it's interesting what we were saying about Japan. Japan, you know, having smoking rates have fallen significantly and it's heated tobacco, which has been the product that has worked very well. And in Sweden, we have the lowest um, tobacco-related deaths in, in the world or it's certainly in Europe, and that's because of Swedish snus, which is also a tobacco-derived... Mm. All, all of them are tobacco-derived. Nicotine comes from tobacco, but... Um, but, I mean, that I found that rather interesting and I think, once again, all products should be treated equal. But from the other side, yes, the tobacco industry... I mean, many of them are more against the tobacco industry than they are against actually mm. smoking. And that's where we have problems, I think, that, um, that zealotism against the industry. And if that industry, um, in the same way that other industries, like the energy industry, are moving from fossil fuels to renewables and, and other things, then they should be supported and encouraged because and it's actually leading to a, a, a better and safer outcome. And yet, in this area, there seems to be a very hard core trench of people and they are the ones unfortunately that are this McCarthyism we were talking about before who drive that with their colleagues who who may move over I mean I've been around this area long enough to have known some of the people who were completely against e-cigarettes when they first started <laughs> um, or came out but you know over the time and as the evidence and science came out, they changed their mind because they could see that the science and evidence was showing a huge change. And I think where... And, and even if that did come from the tobacco industry. And I think if the McCarthyism stuff stopped, a lot of people would be um, supportive almost of an industry that's trying to transition away um, and, and move things across to, mm -hmm. to a more better public uh, health outcome. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so really, even the last uh, panel sounds like it's separate from the others. It's all interlinked, isn't it, with, with this whole concept? So, yes. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of finish up in a few minutes. So I'd, I'd like to just talk about GFN in general. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first time we've all been together in the room. Um, I mean, last year there was Liverpool, but not many people could get there. This is the first full GFN since the pandemic, for first one for three years. And... Sam, how has it been meeting up with people which well, you uh, haven't seen for such a long time? And I mean, it's, it's, of course, really exciting. You know, you're meeting people after two years and catching up because a lot of things happen when you, are, you know, meet face to face, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the Zoom life was good, but, you know, it, it, it was also a little impersonal, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, every day there was a Zoom event, but, you know, numbers kept falling because there's that, I mean, how much of it can you watch? And it doesn't feel that personal. You can engage, but how much do you engage? So when you, when you are in person, you engage a lot. So, so in that sense, it's been fantastic meeting uh, people after two years. It's also a bit exhausting because it's, you've fallen out of speaking to people in person for so long. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you're right. But when you had the Zoom conferences that we all went through. Uh, it's fine, you're, you're watching the presentations, but then in the breaks, you're going to make a cup of tea or, or go and mow in the garden, whatever you want to do, I don't know. But you're not having that contact with other delegates yeah. and you're not sharing ideas. And, and, and I, think, I think it's true, you know, you get out of the... There's some very practical elements. One of the things I've noticed is that I, d I didn't bring any business cards because I didn't even think of it. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't either. And you're kind of used to sort yeah. of when you meet people swapping a card or something like that and you think, 
think, oh, and they go, oh, yeah, I didn't, I haven't yeah. been doing this for years. So it's kind of like, uh, it, it's, it's hard to remember to get back into how things were. But I do agree with you, Samrat, that, you know, just seeing people again and, and, and seeing facial expressions yeah. in, a, in a personal way that you just don't get on, on Zoom is, is just lovely. And, you know, in a sense, you know, I think the GFN community, I mean, I've, it's what well, I don't know if it's 10 years or what, but it's a long, long time. I've come to, you know, almost every, well, all of them, I think. And I think that there's a real community spirit and I think it's, it's starting to get back and that's really quite nice, I yeah, think. Yeah. And I think that's a, a, a great place to end, really. So um, thank you, Samrat, and thank you, Jeannie, for coming on this commentary team. And um, from a beautifully sunny Warsaw, uh, to everyone at home, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day's proceedings and um, it's goodbye from us for now. Bye.
online chat and Q&A. And if you are in the room, by simply raising your hand. This year, we're very pleased to be offering simultaneous translation into Spanish for all the streamed sessions. If you'd like to access that, if you would like to access the translation, please visit our conference website for details. And if you are here in the room, please go to the registration desk because there are headsets there. With that, I shall hand over to Clive Bates, who's, who will be hosting your first keynote session. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Um, good morning, everyone. Anyone got a head like a sphinx uh, this morning, just by any chance? Yeah? Um, right, we have a real treat in store for you this morning. I was lucky enough to watch, uh, to, to watch this session earlier, just to get, a, get up to speed on it. But we have uh, the, the great Mark Gunther, uh, who uh, can't be with us in person, and he'll explain why. Uh, it's a sad story. Um, but has uh, recorded his keynote presentation, which takes a hard look, and I mean a hard look, at the role that foundations play in the politics, policy, and science of tobacco harm reduction. And it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant oration, I have to say. Um, <clears throat> once we're done with Mark, and he's got some, we've got some voting to do in the middle. Once we're done with Mark, we're going to pass to Fiona Patton, who is going to give a response to that, maybe giving us a bit of the political angle. Then we're going to go into question and answers. So I want you all to think of your questions and answers. Um, I'll, I'll chip in a few. We're going to get some online, hopefully. They'll, they'll flash up in front of me. Uh, and then we'll get a good discussion going for the rest of the session. Um, so we've got plenty of time. So without further ado, um, my signal to the control, mission control over there, <laughs> is we are good to go on the video. Let's go with the video and start listening to Mark Gunther. Thanks very much, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm sorry I can't be joining you in person. I was looking forward to meeting many of you, but my wife's 96-year-old mother has just died, so I needed to stay home this week. If anyone had told me just two years ago that I was about to write many thousands of words about e-cigarettes and be invited to speak at a conference about nicotine, I definitely would not have believed it. I hadn't smoked since college. Well, at least I hadn't smoked tobacco. Uh, I had never even tried an e-cigarette. I'm still not sure that I could pick a puff bar or a views out of a lineup of e-cigarettes. So what led me here? I'm gonna try to explain. <clears throat> I've been a reporter for a long time, not quite 50 years, but getting there. I've written newspaper stories, magazine articles, and books on a range of topics, politics, government, sports, business, the environment. And in 2015, I turned my attention to the world of philanthropy and began contributing regularly to the Chronicle of Philanthropy, a US publication that covers foundations and nonprofits. I had a lot of personal connections to the world of foundations and nonprofits. My wife, my brother, and my oldest daughter all work for nonprofits or advocacy groups. And it struck me as a sector that needed more journalistic scrutiny. I'd spent the prior 20 years as a business reporter, and it was obvious to me that foundations and nonprofits utterly lacked the feedback loops that, at least in theory, work to hold businesses and even governments accountable. We all know how it works in business. Companies need customers if they want to survive and thrive. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about Apple or Altria or the restaurant on the corner. If a company can produce a product or a service at a price that people are willing to pay, it stands a good chance of success. Particularly in competitive markets, Companies that produce the most appealing products or services will thrive. Those that do not please their customers will fail. 
It's far from a perfect system, as we all know, but it's the best we have, and importantly, it's dynamic. The Fortune 500 list of the U.S.'s biggest corporations is constantly churning as new companies grow and old ones fade away. By contrast, in the world of nonprofits and foundations, the feedback loops don't operate well. It's bad enough with nonprofits. A local food bank feeds the poor, but it is funded mostly by well-to-do donors. The quality of its food or service may be just fine or not so good, but its success depends on winning over those donors, not on satisfying those who it feeds. Advocacy groups like Greenpeace or Amnesty International or the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids may set out to serve the environment or the cause of human rights or the health of kids, but they too are beholden not to their causes but to their donors. And it's often very hard, all but impossible really, to know whether they're effective in their work. If that sounds bad, it's much worse with foundations, especially large endowed foundations. At least nonprofit groups have to explain themselves to donors. Foundations are accountable to no one. Let me repeat that. Foundations are accountable to no one. There is nothing that resembles a market for foundations. There's no competitive pressure on them to improve their performance. New money comes along all the time, but many of the biggest foundations in the U.S., Ford, the Lilly Endowment, Robert Wood Johnson, Kellogg, Rockefeller, uh, these all date back to the 1930s or earlier. They are never going to go out of business unless they choose to spend down their endowments. Meantime, foundations enjoy generous government benefits. Their endowments are not taxed. They own high-priced real estate in New York or Silicon Valley, and they are exempt from property taxes. They are regulated so lightly that the rules governing them are all but meaningless. Although they can't spend money directly on political campaigns, they can and do exercise political power by educating, and put that in quotes, elected officials and the general public. All of this raises a question. How should we think about foundations, or philanthropy rather, as it's practiced by big foundations and billionaire donors? Historically, my sense is that we've usually re responded with gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Millionaire or Mr. Billionaire for that new wing at the hospital or that new building on campus. But in recent years, this has begun to change. We're starting to see more critical thinking in academia and more critical reporting in the press about large-scale philanthropy. In a book called Just Giving, a political scientist named Rob Reich, who teaches at Stanford, makes the case that we need to think differently about large-scale charitable giving. He writes, Philanthropy, especially big philanthropy, is an exercise of power. Any exercise of power deserves our scrutiny, not our gratitude. It deserves rigorous attention. That's the approach I have tried to take in my own reporting for the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Which brings me to the story of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Bloomberg Philanthropies was founded in 2006. It's one of the newer foundations that we have. Unlike, say, Ford or Rockefeller, it is guided by a living donor, Michael Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg is best known because he served three terms as mayor of New York City, and in many respects, he was a successful mayor. He also ran for president very briefly in 2020. Mike Bloomberg made his fortune by starting a company that collects and sells financial data to Wall Street. He makes a big deal about how he is data driven, and we'll get to that in a moment. But there's no doubt that the data business has been very good to him. He is worth an astonishing $82 billion 
according to the Forbes list of billionaires. That is up from about $27 billion a decade ago. He has given away more than $12 billion, but like many billionaires, his wealth is increasing faster than he can push money out the door. Bloomberg has given across a broad array of causes. In education, he's currently funding charter schools, an alternative to public schools in the US. He has backed efforts to help low-income and African-American students attend college or medical school. On climate change, he supported a big Sierra Club campaign to shut down coal-burning power plants. In the public health arena, he has funded programs to curb communicable diseases, promote healthy eating and reduce obesity, improve road safety, protect abortion rights, and of course, reduce the use of tobacco and e-cigarettes. Much of this unfolds on a global scale. The Tobacco Initiative, for, its, for instance, covers 112 countries with a focus on the world's largest smoking populations, including in China, India, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. The foundation supports nonprofits that work with national and local government to take on such measures as prohibiting smoking in indoor public places, enforcing bans on tobacco advertising, and raising tobacco taxes. Here, I'd like to pause for just a moment and take an informal poll. Three choices. One, you support Bloomberg-funded campaigns around the world to reduce deaths from cigarette smoking. Two, you oppose the work he's done to curb smoking. And again, we're talking about smoking here, not vaping. And three, you're not sure or you have mixed feelings. The idea here is to see whether you believe there is anything wrong in principle with billionaires using their philanthropic power to influence others. So I'm actually gonna pause for a moment here and I am gonna ask Clive to take the poll as, as I read the choices and I'll be back in just a moment. So again, number one, Raise your hands if you support Bloomberg Don't funded do that campaigns yet. to reduce deaths Don't do from that yet. smoking. Listen to him. Two, you oppose the work he's done around smoking. Three, you're not sure or you have mixed feelings. Cut. Right. Okay. Now, I, I listened to that this morning and I was thinking, oh my God, that is a surprisingly difficult question to uh, address. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, the way I read this, and I think he said this fairly clearly, you are being, even, even if you think he, Bloomberg is doing something unambiguously good, and you might not think that about smoking, but just let's imagine that. Is it still right that he does it and is influential on doing that because he is essentially a found, he's doing this through a foundation with very little accountability? So that's what you're being asked to test here results versus the method okay now uh, coming back to this his first uh, his first answer is yes uh, I, I want to get the results I, I want them to work on reducing smoking second is no essentially this is the wrong way of doing things and then third I'm not sure it's too difficult okay so um, does anybody want to first say a word about this question does anyone have a thought on this question before we go on, or should we get straight to vape, straight to voting? Hang on a minute, I'm looking. Yeah, a couple down there. Okay, let's just really quick statements because we got we've got the second half of his presentation. So quick interventions from the floor, please. Go say who you are as well. Uh, Nancy Lucas from Cafra. Um, when I, he read that question, the first thing the alarm bells went off in my head. Just because you have money and power doesn't mean you should determine how other people live their lives. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone in favor of the results, no matter how they're achieved? Who's going to speak for that? I'm a little bit in that camp. People spend some money, do some good things. What's wrong with that? That's what a whole charity is. I think it really depends where you sit. Okay, because if you are a person who is benefiting for a scholarship, 
and you'd never get that otherwise, you might think differently because yeah. I believe that everybody's biased. Yeah. So we are here and we are affected by his decision in one way, but some other people that perhaps get the help that they need and you not get otherwise might think differently. So I think this is a very complex question because yeah. everybody's biased. Okay. Anybody else want to just chip in? Who's, uh, just say who you are as well, if you don't mind. Hi, uh, David Sweener. I'll uh, counter uh, uh, Nancy and say, we all have the ability to, uh, to do good things in our lives. And if that's something like you're a very good surgeon, you do surgery. If you happen to have billions of dollars and you think you can make the world a better place, terrific. Uh, so, you know, is, isn't that uh, a, a good thing to do with your life if you possibly can? So I should point out that David Sweener is conflicted here because he is a philanthropist. Okay. <laughs> Gives away money. Um, okay, anybody else? Quick, Jonathan, John Fell, down here. Run, 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 run. <laughs> there he is. Thanks, John. Hi, I mean, I guess my initial reaction is, is surprised that the question's being asked because we're conditioned not to think about this, just to mm. assume that uh, if someone's giving money away, we should be grateful for it. Yeah. No, it, it, it is a surprising question, but when you think about it, there's actually a lot of depth to it. Um, okay, it, any final, one last comment, if anyone's got one, and then we'll take the big poll, having aired a few views. Yep, say your name. Yeah, Rafi Casilia from the Philippines. I, I think it's difficult to answer the first question, or the, the, the question, because actually we're, uh, it involves both the end and the means of uh, Bloomberg. We may agree with, with, the, with the end, the objective, the yeah. main aim, but we may not agree with the means. So uh, it, it, it's really difficult to answer it as one single question. It, uh, it, it has to be divided into two uh, separate questions, okay. actually. Vote not sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. <In that> case. <laughs> All right, folks. Oh, so do you want a quick one? Quick one there, and then, we'll, then we really will go to the vote. Uh, Martin Colley from um, Scotland, uh, working for a cancer charity, we rely greatly on philanthropic income. And I see the good that that does. Um, and that would very much influence my thoughts and the use of that money. Mm. So I think the end in that respect justifies the means. Okay. John? Hi. Um, name? My, uh, my name's John Summers. I'm from the UK. Um, I volunteer with a number of charities in a lot of different sectors. Um, and part of, the work, part of the, the work that I do as a volunteer is actually keeping the uh, phil philanthropists in check oh. of actually having to say to them, yeah, you, you can help, but you need to give the people that you're helping agency mm. and actually allow them to make the decisions. Um, it's fine for you to use your money to enable them, yeah. but you can't force people. Right. I, I think we're edging to... to Right, I keep saying one more, one more. Last one there, go on. So is that Michelle? I can't see, I'm just blinded by the light. Uh, if you could just, it's a good point though. I, I think we're on to a progress in the argument with that. Hi, Michelle? Michelle Minton, uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'll very quickly say, and this is gonna, I think this is something a lot of people may not think of. Um, there can be good things you can do with philanthropy. And I'm someone who benefits, I work at a nonprofit from this. However, sometimes even if, you know, you can give a billion dollars and end smoking, uh, the other results may not be very good for the world, right? Mm -hmm. If you undermine civil society in other countries, mm -hmm. if you destroy the ability for individuals in that country to participate in their mm -hmm. democratic process, is that, you know, is that worth ending smoking? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I think that's one of the questions uh, we have to think about. All right, I am going to go to the vote now. Okay, so the first one, uh, going back to Mark's question, Bloomberg, Bloomberg spending uh, big on reducing clear. smoking around the world. Uh, yes, you're in favour of that. Hands up. Okay, a, a smattering there, smattering. Smoking, not vaping, remember. We're talking about dealing with smoking. It's probably about seven or something in the audience. Okay, Bloomberg, um, you're opposed to Bloomberg spending money on, on dealing with uh, smoking around the world. He shouldn't do it. Okay, many more, but not overwhelming. Probably, what, 20, would you say? 20? Okay. You're not sure, or brackets, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one wins. That one wins. Um, okay, great. Well, that's really interesting. I, th I think that's a quite thought-provoking 
triad of, 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 of questions there. My own sense on this is, is really it depends. If there was more robust governance and accountability, which there isn't in Bloomberg's case, then, and, and there's much more connection with the uh, at-risk population, there's much better awareness of unintended consequences, the money is flowing with better governance, then maybe. Uh, but as things stand at the moment, I'm very much in the opposed camp. So there you are, there's my biases disclosed. Okay, mission control, we're ready. Second part of Mark's talk. Okay, so let's get on to e-cigarettes. Late in 2020, I was interviewing Ethan Nadelman, the founder and longtime executive director of an advocacy group called the Drug Policy Alliance. We were talking about an entirely different story and he suggested that I look into Bloomberg's work on vaping. I was intrigued, but I have to say, I had no idea what I was getting into. As many of you know, Bloomberg Philanthropies announced in the fall of 2019 that along with the campaign for tobacco-free kids, it was beginning a $160 million three-year campaign to end what they described as an epidemic of e-cigarette use among kids. Over the course of the next few months, I researched a story about Bloomberg and e-cigarettes for the Chronicle of Philanthropy. I had several things going for me. First, because I knew nothing about the topic, I came to it with an open mind. Second, I had plenty of time to do research. And third, I had lots of space to publish what I learned. I was more than a little surprised to find that the organization supported by Bloomberg, as well as the man himself, again, who proudly talks about being data-driven, were saying many things that turned out not to be true. Bloomberg wrote in an op-ed in the New York Times, quote, all the progress we've made in reducing teen smoking is being turned around, unquote. Wrong. Teen smoking rates were falling and they have continued to fall. During an appearance on CBS News, Bloomberg said, quote, just think if your kid was doing this, meaning vaping, and winds up with an IQ 10 or 15 points lower than he or she would have had for the rest of her life, unquote. That's wrong again. No reputable scientist believes that the nicotine in e-cigarettes, or in cigarettes for that matter, causes a long-term decline in IQ. Other claims by the opponents of vaping turned out to be false as well. No, vaping does not appear to be a gateway to smoking. No, vaping is not, as they claim, ineffective as a smoking cessation tool. And no, vaping is not comparable to smoking in terms of its impact on human health. As I did my research, there were two moments for me when, as the Brits like to say, the penny dropped, meaning that I came to an understanding that I had not had before. The first came when I read an essay in the journal Science that struck me as a rebuke to Bloomberg and the campaign for tobacco-free kids. The authors were Amy Fairchild, Cheryl Helton, David Abrams, Jim Curran, and Ronald Bayer, who are all deans of the schools of public health and door people who had devoted their lives to tobacco control. They warned against prohibitionist measures and argued that it was a mistake to restrict access to vaping products while leaving lethal cigarettes on the market. Stephen Schroeder, the former president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, was another important voice in the story. He lives in San Francisco, where thanks to a ban on e-cigarettes pushed by Bloomberg and tobacco-free kids, you can now buy cigarettes on any corner, you can buy marijuana, in licensed dispensaries, but you can't buy vapes. That doesn't make any sense. The second aha moment came when I asked the people at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids to point me to scientists who supported their efforts to get flavored e-cigarettes off the market. They sent me to Stan Glantz. That was telling. His 2019 study alleging that vaping doubled the rate of heart attacks had to be retracted when it turned out that some of the heart attacks took place before 
people had started to vape. I dug a little deeper into his work on both cigarettes and e-cigarettes, and it didn't take me long to learn that Professor Glantz is an ideologue who has allowed his hatred for all things tobacco to distort his science. Here's the problem though. Despite the bad science, despite the misleading claims put forth by Bloomberg and Tobacco Free Kids and the Center for Disease Control and others, and largely because of the confusion, uh, confusion created by these opponents around the dis disease that has been misnamed Evali, the anti-vaping campaigns have been effective. The work of Bloomberg funded groups and others, including the Truth Initiative, has helped persuade elected officials in four states, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, to ban flavored e-cigarettes. <clears throat> California voters will have to decide this November whether to ban flavored cigarettes and e-cigarettes. About 50 cities and counties have done so as well, including Washington, D.C., Chicago, and most recently, Los Angeles. Federal law was enacted that prohibits selling vapes through the mail, which creates a burden on consumers who live in rural areas. This was an unusual story for me and for the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Big foundations frequently spend a lot of money and don't accomplish much. They poured billions into the issue of climate change, for example, and they have little to show for it but it is much less common for a big foundation to spend a lot of money, make progress towards its goals, and wind up doing more harm than good. In my opinion, at least that's the story here. So if the anti-vaping campaign was not guided by science, you have to wonder, what explains the decision by Bloomberg and Matt Myers of Tobacco Free Kids to take such a hard line against e-cigarettes? Clive, as usual, puts the question well. He wrote on his blog, why would it make sense to ban the much safer nicotine product, deliberately deny law-abiding smokers better options, protect the cigarette trade from competition, and stimulate unregulated black markets? I didn't have a clear answer to that question then, and I'm afraid I don't have one now. I could speculate that Bloomberg has always been a bit of a scold. You may remember that as New York mayor, he got the city to ban supersized sodas until that regulation was overturned by the courts. I could speculate that Matt Myers, having largely succeeded in curbing smoking by teens, needed a new target to justify the continued existence of the campaign for tobacco-free kids. Its most recent tax return shows it employs 120 people and has an annual budget of $41 million. It's also possible that the activists who oppose vaping, like Professor Glantz, have such a visceral hatred for the tobacco industry and a predisposition to believe that they have to oppose anything that the industry does. Finally, I must agree with Ken Warner of the University of Michigan that questions of social class come into play. As best as we can tell, many team vape vapors come from good, and I'll put that in quotes, good families, well-to-do families in Manhattan and Silicon Valley. By contrast, smokers tend to come from lower socioeconomic groups, marginalized groups, and they have become mostly invisible to those of us who are well-educated and comfortable, and as a result, they elicit little sympathy. Okay, although my story for the Chronicle was very long, it focused entirely on the US. It didn't get into Bloomberg's global work, which is extensive. Once again, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids is a key partner, as are other nonprofit groups, all of whom, as best as I can tell, oppose both combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes around the world. Just to run down a few of those. 
There is Vital Strategies, a big nonprofit health consultancy based in Washington that publishes the Tobacco Atlas. Vital Strategies got $23 million for its tobacco work from Bloomberg in 2019, according to the foundation's most recent tax return. I should note here that one of the many problems with holding foundations accountable is that they are ridiculously slow to file their taxes and disclose their grants, and that's one of the very few things they're required to do under U.S. law. There is The Union, a global NGO based in Paris, which just a few weeks ago published a position paper calling for a ban on all e-cigarettes in low and middle income countries. About 80% of the world's smokers live in these low and moderate income countries. Bloomberg also funds global tobacco control work at universities, including Johns Hopkins, his alma mater, and at the University of Bath in England, which is home to an industry watchdog group called STOP. It stands for Stopping Tobacco Organizations and Products. This reflects that rather mindless belief that anything the tobacco companies are doing needs to be stopped. I could go on and on. Bloomberg funds a media collaborative called the Investigative Desk based in the Netherlands, which takes a hard line position against these cigarettes. With the Gates Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies supported tobacco control products at the uh, programs at the World Bank, which offers policy advice and technical assistance to governments again in those low and moderate income countries. And most damaging of all, I'd guess, is the relationship between Bloomberg and the World Health Organization. The WHO obviously holds Mike Bloomberg in high esteem. He has been given the title of Global Ambassador for Non-Communicable Diseases. He has in turn generously funded the WHO with many millions of dollars for a variety of projects, including $5 million for its tobacco work again in 2019. There's a lot we could say about the WHO. Its messaging around e-cigarettes is one-sided, misleading, and harmful, as Clive recently pointed out at some length on his blog. It's frankly stunning to me how the WHO manages to confuse people about questions that should be settled by now. The fact that e-cigarettes are less dangerous than cigarettes, the fact that they had nothing to do with e volley the fact that vaping can help people who want to quit smoking. Arguably, the WHO goes even further than Bloomberg, calling for bans on all electronic cigarettes. Last year, the organization gave its highest award to Dr. Harsh Pardon, India's health minister, for leading the way as India banned e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products. This, in a country where about 30% of adults use tobacco products and an estimated 1.2 million people die from tobacco-related diseases every year. About 35 to 40 countries now ban e-cigarettes, including India, Brazil, Argentina, and most recently Mexico. How much of the credit or blame for that belongs to Bloomberg and his allies is hard to say. It would take a team of researchers a long time to track his influence country by country, but there is no doubt that it's vast. Michelle Minton of the Competitive Enterprise Interest Institute has done great work on this, tracking Bloomberg's work in places like the Philippines and Vietnam. So I would refer you to her work if you want to know more. Let me wrap up by returning to the question of accountability. Bloomberg Philanthropies is, in theory, governed by a board of directors. There are 24 members, most of them at the end of distinguished careers. The former U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, Admiral Mike Mullen, the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, former U.S. Senator Sam Nunn, and former CEOs of big companies, including Bob Iger of Disney, John Mack of Morgan Stanley, Sir Martin Sorrell of WPP, Sam Palmasano of IBM, Ken Chenault of American Express. None are really experts in public health or climate change or education, but 
they are each paid a modest $10,500 a year for their services. And unfortunately, it's essentially impossible for an outsider to know what oversight, if any, they exercise. That's the board. What we do know is that Mike Bloomberg and the paid staff of the foundation have demonstrated by their actions that they are unwilling to question the assumptions behind their e-cigarette work or better understand the effect of what they're doing. After my story ran in the Chronicle last year, a dozen or so public health experts wrote to Bloomberg and asked for a meeting. They included Steve Schroeder from formerly at Robert Wood Johnson, Cheryl Helton, founding president of Truth Initiative, and other folks with impeccable credentials, including Cliff Douglas, Ken Warner, Mike Cummings, et cetera. They got nowhere. Even after providing extensive documentation, they could not even get a meeting. That to me is troubling. As Cliff Douglas told me, all we wish to do is provide information and insight and explore key questions, the answers to which will affect the lives and well being of millions of people. What's the downside to that? Very good question. To wrap up and move into questions, I'm tempted now to quote Woody Allen, who at the end of one of his stand up routines said, I would like to leave you on a positive note. Would you take two negatives instead? But unlike Woody, I am going to try to conclude on a positive note. I can't be sure, but I'm starting to think that the anti-vaping movement has peaked. The so-called vaping epidemic among teenagers is clearly over. Two years have passed since the Avali scare. Globally, the number of countries that have enacted prohibitions on vaping has actually fallen in the last couple of years. And recently in the US, the state of Colorado rejected a vaping ban. It's worth noting too, that Bloomberg's three year $160 million commitment to the campaign for tobacco free kids winds down this September. Will it be renewed or extended? I have no idea, but the science continues to make clear that vaping is a safer alternative to smoking and for many adults, a way to end the smoking habit. The issue is complicated and hard to explain as you all know, but I don't think it's too hard to reach an evidence driven policy that balances the needs of adult smokers with the risks to kids. Make vapes available to adults, double down on efforts to keep them out of the hands of teenagers, and most importantly, tell the truth about the science. For many of you, I imagine it must be hard to fight what is a difficult battle against powerful forces. I've only been writing about this for close to two years now, and there are certainly days when I wonder why I have to say and write the same things over and over again. But I try to remember the words of a great American reporter social critic and contrarian named H.L. Mencken. Mencken said, it's not worth an intelligent person's time to be in the majority. By definition, there are already enough people to do that. So let's all of us please keep doing our best to seek out the truth and then to tell the truth. Thank you very much for listening. Ab absolutely fantastic. Uh, I hope that's going to prompt a really good question and answer and discussion session. But for our first reaction, we're going to go to Fiona Patton, a uh, member of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Victoria, brilliant politician, very articulate advocate. I'm going to hand over to her now. Fiona, what did you make of that? Oh, it was terrific. And um, I think Mark hit the nail on the head. And, and I think it really kind of... I, I suppose I was somewhat surprised, probably because I, I don't live and breathe um, tobacco harm reduction, but 
how often we've been talking about Bloomberg over the last few days. Um, I'm sure he'd be quite chuffed about that, that, you know, he's been, he's been on our minds and, and in our thoughts uh, over this time. But it, it, I think Mark has really articulated a lot of the issues, again, that have been raised. Also, I think Lars yesterday in his um, really splendid analysis of the, um, the effectiveness of Empower um, or the lack thereof it goes, goes to, what, um, to what Matt was saying in his, in, his, in his speech today. But the one thing that kept striking me about, um, about Bloomberg and about the way that, that Mark has presented um, this argument was the Catholic Church. I just couldn't get the Catholic Church out of my mind. Here was another huge enterprise that um, funded schools, uh, didn't pay tax, uh, had very, put in very moral um, funding arrangements into developing countries. So you know, we see developing countries not being able to have access to family planning um, because of funding from, from the Catholic Church. So I could see these real connections to it. Also, the fact that um, both of them are not accountable. Uh, both of them uh, have billion, spend billions and billions of dollars in areas where governments also spend money. And I think it's that overlap. And that, that concern, that, you know, I think that's, that's where we see that lack of accountability. And it's, you know, when we look at charities um, or charitable status or even the definition of charity, it's in the Tax Act. It's not in some other well-being piece of legislation. It's in the Tax Act. So we never, people just say that they're doing these, the, have these goals. We never test whether they achieve those goals. Where we do, if it's a publicly funded organisation, we test whether, those, whether publicly funded schools meet the goals of educating children. We test whether our public hospitals meet the goals of treating people and saving people's lives. We don't test that when it's um, foundations or or um, not-for-profits such as, such as well, not Bloomberg's not really a not-for-profit, is it? It's, I mean, you could almost question whether it's philanthropy or tax evasion. Um, they, you know, I mean, Bloomberg doesn't pay very much tax for a man who earns so much money. Uh, and that's because, you know, ostensibly he's putting that money into good things, uh, much the same as the Catholic Church ostensibly has been doing only good things as well. Um, Mm. The, the other thought I had was, um, weirdly, Harry Anslinger. Uh, I don't know if people know Harry Anslinger. He was the drug czar. Um, first, he, first he led the kind of prohibition of alcohol. He led the, the policing of the prohibition of alcohol. When that failed, um, he was left with a, a big army of people um, who needed a job. So they moved over to cannabis. Um, and started the, the, what we know as the war on drugs. And I, I couldn't help thinking of Matt Meyer in that same situation where he'd managed to reduce smoking in children so, to such great levels that he needed something else to do to keep, him, to keep those people in, that he, to keep the people that he employs employed. Um, and I couldn't, you know, I can't help making those, those connections. I think finally, one of the points that Ma Matt, that Mark didn't make and, and needs to be talked about is the amount of money that Bloomberg actually donates to politicians. So he is a very big donor of the Democrats. He, I think a lot of um, uh, politicians in the United States would, um, would rate their electoral success on the donations that they had received from Mike Bloomberg. So I don't think there's a single door in the Capitol that is closed to this to this person, and I think that is when you really need to question, question the accountability and the need for greater transparency in organisations like Bloomberg, but I would also say organisations like the Catholic Church. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my comments there, but I, I found it fascinating and I, I ended up um, going down a whole bunch of rabbit holes this morning um, as a result of, um, <laughs> of the things that, 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 that were triggered um, by, by this really terrific um, speech. Very good, Fiona. Thanks very much. Um, an interesting parallel there between the Catholic Church and Bloomberg philanthropies, both judged by the Almighty and well, Bloomberg, accountable in the afterlife. Bloomberg <laughs> says that he won't be judged by the Almighty. He's got a clear free pass into <laughs> heaven, I believe. Um, I saw a quote from him this morning saying that he would not be interviewed by God. He'd be going straight through. 
His, uh, his catchphrase is, in God we trust, uh, everyone else bring data. Yeah. Uh, and as Mark, Mark did a brilliant piece saying, bring data unless it's data we don't yeah. like. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which, do as uh, I say, not as like, I do. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to pick up on a little bit on one of the questions, the second of the questions that's coming online. If you're watching online and remotely, don't forget put your questions. They're going to arrive in front of me here, so you're going to have a place in the discussion. But what what I'd like to ask, just to get the discussion started, I ask both of you, um, Fiona, you're you're part of a power structure that has democratic legitimacy. I mean, at least that's the theory. In, in, uh, you know, people vote for you, they elect you as a politician. Um, what, is the, what is the role of politics in, in terms of its interaction with this other center of power that is perhaps less accountable than we, we would like? What, what should politicians, how should, should they be, as Mark puts it, grateful, oh look, there's a new hospital wing, thank you, thank you. Or should they be like, hang on a minute, you know, who put you in this position? I I'm really troubled by it, by it, and I have been for quite some time. And again, I I apologise um, for, for for making the the um, religious analogy here again, but um, we we don't put the same level of accountability on um, organisations that that don't pay tax, um, and organisations like Bloomberg or organisations like the church that don't pay tax, we don't put that accountability on them, and I'm very troubled by that. And in, in Australia, we have a very large Catholic school system. Now, we don't actually question the results that that school system gets. In fact, we even, we give them a bucket of money and say, go and spend it as you choose. Uh, so I'm, I'm increasingly troubled by the lack of accountability for not-for-profits and the growing um, reliance that governments are having on these organisations. And, you know, frankly, I'd just like them to pay their tax and then the governments could fund good health care, the governments could fund good education, the governments could fund good, um, you know, harm reduction campaigns. Um, so. From a politician's perspective, I have been calling for greater scrutiny of these organisations and greater accountability of why they don't pay land tax, why, um, I again go back to the Catholic Church because it's the one I've looked at the most, but in Victoria, it is the largest landholder um, in Victoria with the exception of the, state, of the state government and it pays no land tax. Um, and, and I'm... I'm increasingly troubled by that, and I think we do. If they're not going to pay tax, at least prove that they're doing what they say they're doing. Yeah. Mark, uh, first of all, this is to test the connection and the audio and mission control and everything over there. Have you got any thoughts on what the kind of interaction... You, I mean, you're quite, you're quite eloquent on the fact that uh, many foundations have very weak governance and accountability. The boards are non-specialised. There's no one else in the picture. There are no beneficiaries. There are no funders. What about government and ministers, either ministers or politicians, legislatures? How should they interact with powerful foundations? What sort of thing would you expect to see, and what are you seeing? Um, good morning. Uh, I think that's a hard question, Clive, because unfortunately, at least in the U.S., um, the government agencies, particularly the CDC, uh, have not covered themselves with glory on this issue of e-cigarettes. Now, more generally, like Fiona, I wonder whether we should continue to give foundations and nonprofits the kind of very favorable tax treatment uh, that they're getting. Um, the problem in the U.S. is actually worse than I uh, described in my, in my talk because more and more billionaire philanthropists are not even forming foundations, which at least are subject to some minimum rules around disclosure, uh, distribution of their assets. They're simply setting up these legal entities called LLCs, limited liability corporations. Uh, Laureen Powell Jobs would be an example. Um, uh, there are others who, who don't come to mind because it's 4.30 in the morning or 4.50 in the morning here and I'm not operating in top form. <laughs> but these LLCs essentially have no disclosure 
But Mackenzie Bezos is another one who's operating through a do donor advised fund. We don't have to get into all the technicalities, but essentially um, even the minimal requirements um, laid upon foundations don't apply to those two philanthropists just to pick two you know, multi-billionaire examples. And if we layer more regulations onto the foundation world, you'll simply incentivize people to avoid the foundation structure entirely. So I, I don't have a good answer uh, as to how to hold this billionaire power accountable other than you know, to a degree, the media, you could, Congress could certainly do much better in terms of asking questions of these folks. There have been congressional hearings over the decades on philanthropy that had some impact, but uh, there's no easy answer here. Do you want to no, there's not, I mean, there's not an easy answer. Um, I, I, but I, you know, I think we, 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 we do need to, governments do need to start looking at that accountability and transparency, whether it's in foundations, um, particularly when we are so generous, as you say, Mark, um, with, with our um, tax relief and uh, to those organisations. And I don't know whether it would, you know, if, if it's all about tax evasion, then, then maybe you will see LLCs coming, starting up, but quite often it's, um, it's not necessarily about that. And I, so I think, I think we can, I think we, we can achieve greater accountability, but it does require legislation. And then, you know, who, who in the capital is going to put their hand up to say Mike Bloomberg, um, you know, Needs you know needs greater accountability and and greater controls. Um, right now, I don't think there'd be a single single politician in the capital who would do that. All right, I'm going to go out to. We've got a couple of questions in from outside, uh, but I want a question or two from. I'm going to stand up so I can see people. Question or two from in the room. Please keep the questions brief and to the point. Uh, and if you've got a point to make, make it briefly uh, or make it in the form of a question. Okay, I think it's Amanda. Is that? Yeah, okay, Amanda, Wheeler, then John, and there's one over there. Thank you, Amanda Wheeler. Uh, Mark, thank you for your talk, it was really excellent. Um, Mark mentioned in his talk that one thing that struck him was that on this particular issue, the philanthropy was successful in a much shorter amount of time than other issues. I think the example he used was climate change. And I wanted to ask why in particular they were able to be so successful on this issue where you know, billionaire philanthropy has taken longer and yielded less results on other topics. <laughs> well, can you hear me okay, by the way, Clive? Yeah, we can hear you, for, well, I can. Everyone else here? Great. I can, yeah. Okay, well, climate is a much tougher issue. Um, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. Education is another area where U.S. philanthropy has generally been pretty ineffective. I think the reason it has worked so well here is because they got they. Bloomberg, Matt Myers essentially got the entire U.S. health establishment to walk in lockstep in a very short period of time around the issue of vaping. I mean, you, you know, it was also Truth Initiative. It was the Heart Association. It was the Lung Association. It was the Cancer Society. And the timing, um, unfortunately, fell into place beautifully for the anti-vaping crowd because right at the time Bloomberg pushed his money out, you had the rise of Juul. You did have significant increase in teen vaping numbers. Um, you then had the Ebali crisis. I put that in quotes because it wasn't really a crisis and there was a lot of misinformation around that. And, and those combinations um, were, you know, laid the groundwork for a very effective campaign. I think to me, the one, I mean, I guess I see two areas where there might be room for some pushback. One is I am really struck by the class elements to the conversation in the US. Essentially, the smoker is sort of forgotten in all of this. The smoker tends to come from lower socioeconomic groups. You know, as I said in my talk, those of us who are well educated or, or live in nice suburbs, as I do, rarely see smokers. So there's clearly a class element. And, and that's why, in a way, it's sort of shocking how the Democratic Party in the US has completely dropped the ball on this issue. 
And I think the other reason for the success, and, and this, Clive, you've written about this very, very well, is this kind of mindless, um, you know, hatred might be too strong a word, but antipathy towards the tobacco industry. And everyone keeps pushing that button. I think it accounts for why there's been such unanimity among the health groups on the issue. But, you know, it, it, as a business reporter, it makes no sense to me. The tobacco industry is doing what it does, which is satisfying a consumer demand for a legal product. And if they want to move into the world of vaping rather than feeling threatened by that, it would seem to me that the appropriate response would be the same as if, you know, an oil company starts building a bunch of, you know, solar panels, which is thank you for, for moving from a product that does some damage to a product that can do some good. Um, but those, those are the two reasons that I think it's been successful. They were on the right side of a class issue and they pushed the buttons on tobacco. Can, can I just, there's an interesting premise in Amanda's question about what success is. What they've been successful at is passing legislation. They haven't been successful at all at what the outcome is supposed to be, which is supposed to be, you know, reduced risk, reduced disease, better health, public health. They, they've got no public health outcomes to show whatsoever for any of that money anywhere. Uh, they, what they have is laws passed, and once the laws are passed, they consider their jobs done. They're not interested in following up on what the effect has been, and actually when people do follow up and find that there have been unintended consequences, they really don't like it. So I think we have to be careful about crediting them with success when actually they've been successful at something that is intermediate to the actual ostensible goals of the programme. Fiona, comment? Or I, well, I just, I, I think it just going back to, the, I think, Mark's second point, which I think is the stronger one, is that it's really easy when you can find an enemy. Mm. You know, and climate change, it's a lot harder to find, to have, to have the enemy, where in this one, it was very simple to paint the enemy of big tobacco and, and that, you know, and to win the hearts and minds of, of well, of legislators on that. Um, no legislator wants to be on the side of big tobacco, or very few feel like feel comfortable there um so i think that was a you know that was a simple and it's it, it's a great it's a great strategy you know find a good enemy and then and you know and put them up and then that that makes for that makes for an almost a simple and straightforward campaign right i'm, I'm gonna before we go to john i'm gonna take uh, one from uh, online um and let's get some quick answers in so we've got a lot of yeah. questions building up um how yeah. should we approach the world health organization uh, considering they're funded by governments, uh, but also by these, actually it's a large number of voluntary contributions uh, from foundations, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, uh, other sort of interest groups. What, what is the right approach to World Health Organization? Mark, do you want to start and then Fiona, yeah. let's have some quick... Let me punt that one back to you and Fiona, because that's really outside of my area of expertise. Look, I don't know that I don't I don't I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but I you know, I think I think it is quite right that governments fund the World Health Organization. I think it's quite right that we do that. So I wonder whether one of the solutions to this is actually feeding that money that pharmacy pharm, pharma, pharma, pharmacy companies or or um, or foundations actually that that goes via governments rather than going direct to the World Health Organization, and that might somehow dilute the influence that those organisations can have on the World Health Organization. Yeah, I I, I think that's that's right. I think. I mean, I think as, as advocates or an, anybody concerned about public health, you should always look at what the democratic pathway is to accountability here and try to, um, you know, electrify that in some way. So the democratic pathway is through a national government, which is a member and a shareholder, essentially, of the WHO, and the member state governments make the decisions via the World Health Assembly. So that, that is actually the democratic accountability route for WHO. And if WHO, and it's difficult to use it, but if WHO is misusing voluntary contributions or is uh, handling these conflicts of interest badly, that's the, that's the pathway to activate, I think. 
John? Uh, John Oyston from Toronto. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your presentation and for the work that you've done. I really support everything that you've said. When I was a student, I had a friend who was very socialist in her political leanings, and she said that all charity was completely wrong. In her belief, people who make lots of money should be taxed very heavily, and then that money should be given to the government, and the government should do what's necessary to, for the good of humanity. And at the time, I thought she was completely wrong. That struck me as being very much communism. And, but I was blown away by what she said, and I've thought about it for the rest of my life. Now we have this example of what unbridled capitalism can do when somebody can make so many billions of dollars that they can give away a billion dollars without even thinking about it. And you know, I'm beginning to think maybe she's right. Maybe this sort of situation where you can make that amount of money and then use that money for whatever suits your whims isn't the way we should be going. Any, yeah. any thoughts on, on billionaire capitalists spending their money on good causes rather than super yachts? <laughs> well, I think as long as they pay their tax, um, which they don't, mm. uh, and that's, to me, that's, it's, that, it's that massive tax evasion of these large multinationals um, that, that I, I think um, brings, into, brings that into question and also by, by you know, siphoning it through foundations, by siphoning it through um, so-called not-for-profits, that, they, that they, they evade tax and, and, they, and they diminish the, 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 the universal health care, they diminish universal edu you know, public education by, by avoiding those taxes. So not so much get rid of charity, but, but certainly um, you know, charity after they've, after they've paid their fair share of tax. Um, uh, any, any thoughts on that? Um, you know, what, what happens when they've paid tax and they've still got money to spend? Legitimate or not, Mark? I mean, I, I, the problem I have is that I don't think government has covered itself in glory, at least yeah. on this particular issue and on many others. So I don't know that, that higher, you know, on this issue anyway, I don't know that higher taxation would have uh, done anything other than send more money to, to the government agencies that have also done a very poor job of communication around public health when it comes to vaping and smoking. All right, now there was somebody over there earlier, but this gentleman here, and then, uh, and then Derek, I think you want to say something? So go there. Nice short question, nice short answers, please. Yeah, I'm Jagannath from India. I think what we are doing wrong is painting everyone who's uh, doing philanthropic work with one paintbrush because we have one bad apple. In countries like India, we have problems of plenty. Okay, we have healthcare issues, we do have education, and the government itself is very young. We are only 75 years old, and so we really can't do so much on just the government's team. Even if they had all the money, they don't have those resources. So when you look at uh, philanthropists who are contributing towards such causes, they are actually doing a hell of a lot of good. So there should be a regulatory mechanism, yes, but can we start differentiating mm. and saying, I will allow you in this segment and not in that? That might prove to be a problem, including the Catholic Church. They are setting up schools and they are giving out free education. The quality of education, at least it's education, rather than not having any, right? So that's one of the things that I think should be thought about. So, so we're coming to a more, in, the, in that view anyway, a more conditional acceptance of philanthropy. You know, what's the governance like? What areas are they working on? How political is it? Maybe, maybe the activity and legitimacy of philanthropists should be circumscribed by, to some extent, how they hold themselves accountable and the, and the nature of the issues on which they work. So that's what I took from that. Shall we get, um, hang on, uh, Derek's been waiting. Then there's a bunch over here, so let's get some more quick ones in. Let's have Derek, then uh, yeah, Ben in a minute. Um, thanks, Mark, uh, excellent. And I, I do associate with the last set of comments and I even apply them to Bloomberg himself, having seen the incredible good that he's done in so many spheres and constantly wanting to know why does it not apply to this area. My question, Mark, is, um, you know the story as a, a leading journalist about the tree falling in the forest. And here there are trees falling in the forest. Why is it that this story, your story, about a leading philanthropist 
actually has not broken through into the, me the media, and it's just us talking about it alone. Okay. Mark, why does no one read your work? <laughs> Except for the people in the room, yeah. That's a great question, and I honestly don't know that I have a good answer other than, although I don't think the policy questions are complicated, in other words, how we deal with this issue of vaping and smoking, the science is pretty complicated. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about nicotine, even among medical professionals, as we've seen from some polls. And it takes a lot of time to dig in and figure it out. But, you know, it would seem to me that something like the, uh, it wasn't really an, a paper so much as an essay by the presidents of the Society for the Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, where you have these 15 quite distinguished scientists saying, you know, we're getting this all wrong fundamentally. Why that, that didn't punch through, um, I don't know. Now, I'll make a small excuse for my colleagues in, in the world of media, which is COVID. So essentially, the reporters who know something about health science and public health have had another story to cover for the last two years. And it, it's possible, at least if the COVID story ever fades or goes away, that, that this might rise up and get more attention. But um, yeah, I, I, I really find the coverage of this in places like the New York Times, um, uh, even the Wall Street Journal, to be pretty disappointing. I, um, I do wish the mainstream media paid more attention to science and they, they, the mainstream media doesn't, you know, is, is, you know, really is lacking in covering, I think, not necessarily Mark's work, but as Mark was saying, the work of those scientists, the work of those heads of schools, like that, that is, that is a bit, that should be a big story and that should then complement um, the work that Mark's doing. All right, I'm gonna go to Michelle, please, quickly, Michelle Minton. Quick question, Very briefly Michelle. on the same thing, on uh, the same vein, you, you seem to be the only reporter covering uh, Bloomberg's global work, uh, global crusade with tobacco control, and it, I'm very curious as to what the response has been, besides the campaign for Tobacco for Kids, response to your work, but even within your own organization among your colleagues, because I noticed you do some writing on this issue at the Chronicles of Philanthropy, but also you post on Medium. Uh, which I'm wondering if that's because your, you know, the Chronicles doesn't have the space or isn't interested in such in-depth reporting on the topic. Okay, Mark, quick response on that. Um, the response has mostly been, again, from people in this room and on Twitter who are interested in, in issues of, of harm reduction. Otherwise, the numbers are actually good on, on these stories in terms of readership, but no, I don't, it doesn't seem to punch through to, to others. All right, two over here. Gentlemen first, and then Cecilia. Uh, I, I just came through my head is, is both the intent and the accountability and, and where we sort of think about both those things and how do we strengthen the intent, the, the accountability without maybe perhaps jeopardizing some of the philanthropic intent behind it rather than political intent. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to a point that was made earlier, having worked both in the public sector and in philanthropic and charity sector, I've seen much more innovation in, in civil society than I've ever seen in the public sector. Mm. So I would worry too much about not, I mean, not reinforcing that or, yeah. or rewarding that or uh, ensuring that sustains. So, so this is a view that's kind of don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, basically. There are good things here to be kept, captured, cherished, and then there are bad things, perhaps to do with accountability and uh, political nature of the enterprise, to be challenged much more fiercely. I'm going to take that as a point rather than a question so we can get another one in. Cecilia? Hi, Cecilia from Switchmatch. I'm pretty sure that we would have another discussion if Bloomberg had been on our side. Uh, it would have been happy and mm. But I think the main question is really why is the universe of foundations against tobacco harm reduction? I can understand that they're against the industry, but it appears that they don't really care about the smokers, really? So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, first of all, are we all just a bit um, upset because they're, they're, they, they're promoting things we don't like? Uh, and is that just us being a bit biased? But I think that the deeper question 
is what's really driving this? Um, and it's one of the questions I have, is what's the, what's the kind of motivation of someone like Michael Bloomberg? What does he think he's doing? What, what, what's he in this? He's clearly not in it for money, because I think, according to my notes, he's got $86 billion. So, you know, a few billion more is not going to make any difference. So what's driving these people, and how big does the specter of the tobacco industry and maybe their own role as sort of heroic defenders of youth against the predatory evils of big tobacco. Is that how they see themselves? Is that what's really driving this? Um, I, I think going back to the point that not everyone, but in, it probably in Bloomberg's case, it is his enormous ego. Uh, that he, you know, that if he can beat big tobacco, then, you know, that, well, that actually gives him even a, even a faster, well, he may never die, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> according to him, when he does, he's got, he's got the, um, the first class, business class, um, fast track into heaven. So, you know, is this just shoring, shoring that up? Um, but no, I, 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 I think it's, Sorry, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really got to do with his ego and, you know, we see many other organisations that, that do do good things and are accountable and do mm. question and change if, you know, and are agile and I think civil society is a good example because civil society can be more agile that when something isn't working, they actually change and, and, and evolve as a result of that and that's why we get innovation. All right, uh, we have a question here. Uh, I'm going to jump in, which is, is basically Bloomberg doing this for the money because he's got conflicting interests? I'm going to take that one. No, definitely not. He's got so much money, more than any of us can even imagine having. That is not what it's, it's about. Prestige, how he feels about himself, his image, his sense of playing a heroic role, uh, rising above the fray of financial services information, which is where he made his money into much grander themes. It's about the man's prestige, and I'm sure of that. That's how these guys think. Uh, oh, Mark's he, nodding, so If that's, he can't that's good. be president... <laughs> he can't be president, because he made a complete pig's ear of that. Uh, certainly, <laughs> now he's going to be too old. Um, so that's the next best thing, is to be ambassadors and emissaries and all of that kind of stuff. Um, Bent had a question. He's been very persistent and over, over several minutes. So let the man have a microphone. Yeah, pass the mic. Yeah, nice short question, Ben, because we're running the last couple of minutes. Yeah, short question uh, to Mark. Can we draw any conclusions of what the Bloomberg Foundation avoids, which is, for example, the Swedish experience of snooze? Swedish experience has taken Sweden down to the uh, WHO end game target, no smoking. All right. Let, let's just paraphrase that question, because how does Bloomberg, or should a foundation, deal with contrarian evidence? E evident, evidence that sort of defeats the underlying rationale for their, for their giving, uh, defeats their policy assumptions or whatever. Everybody can get things wrong, but how would a well-run foundation deal with incoming evidence from Bent about the Swedish experience or data from San Francisco that says that smoking increased when vaping was banned or whatever. What, what should happen inside a foundation when that happens? I mean, I think the answer is obvious. The, the, the doors should be open to, to critics. Um, it's just not the way foundations work. And again, they're out, there are others who are even less accountable than Bloomberg. I mean, you know, Lorene Powell Jobs will not even release a list of groups that she gives money to. And I'm, I'm familiar with one or two of those groups. And she's asked them not even to say that she's financing them. So, you know, no transparency. Um, I think maybe one thing to think about, and I know people I've interviewed have thought about this, is finding credit, credible, independent foundations and billionaires making the case to them and at least creating some debate in the world about these issues. I mean, I know that was part of the goal of the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World, but I'm thinking of you know, going to an existing foundation, Robert Wood Johnson or the 
the Arnold Foundation, which is very evidence-based, or the Open Philanthropy Project, which is part of the effective altruism movement, a lot of Facebook money there, and saying, you know, no one is paying attention to smokers. We have a solution. Look at what happened in Sweden. Something quite analog analogous could happen in the U.S. Let's get a real debate and discussion going around these issues. Because that's what's really been lacking is effective communication on the uh, uh, harm reduction side. All right. I, I know there's a few more questions, uh, but uh, we are, I'm afraid we're actually out of, of time. I'm, re I'm really sorry, folks. Um, what I'd like to do is ask both of our, both Mark, our keynote, and uh, Fiona, our respondent, just to, just to have one final reflective, that was a good reflective thought from um, Mark at the end there, but what, what should be done? What, who should do what? what? What's the right way to address this now? If you're giving advice to people in this room, what's, what's, what should they do? Fiona, you go uh, first, because Mark, Mark's thinking. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his thinking uh, face on. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it's four, four in the morning, so. Yeah. Look, again, you know, I mean, while, while Bloomberg is terribly powerful, it, uh, we as electors, uh, well, OK, I'm a politician, but I still vote. Um, you as voters are very important to our elected officials. You are how they get to be elected officials. So I think continuing the pressure on our elected officials, continuing to present that evidence, it, it will get through to some. Yeah. It will get through to some. And I think, you know, I think Mark was finishing on that positive note that that maybe this this campaign against um, vaping and tobacco harm reduction is starting to peter out. But we need to keep the pressure on. We need to keep the pressure on our elected officials in all of our countries. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we can do that just as well as, as Bloomberg, maybe not with the tens of millions of dollars, but, but at the ballot box and, and proving to our elected officials that this is a voting issue. Excellent, great advice. Activate the democratic pathways. Mark, final word from you. Yeah, I don't think it's actually a, an issue that's going to be front of mind for, for voters. So I think the way to proceed is somehow get the science in front of the key elite opinion makers, whether that is board members of Bloomberg, if there are any connections there, board members at other foundations, key legislators and staff in Congress, but somehow find the time to sit down with those people or write to those people and, and get the science in front of them. Excellent. Great, great. Okay, we're going to wind up there, folks. That's the end of this, uh, this session. Could you please give a big hand for Mark and Fiona uh, and also for yourselves for great questions. We'll wrap it up there. Thank you, Mission Control. Thanks,
Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to the ghost of McCarthyism. People are still settling in. Thank you. So let me just uh, outline how we will proceed. I'll introduce myself and then I will uh, make some remarks for those of you who were born after Joseph McCarthy and may not be Americans and may not know who he is. And then I'll introduce our briefly august panel, uh, whom I'm going to refer to as the survivors and thrivers, you know, of academic and other kinds of hostility. So again, welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin McGurr. Oh, and I see Shri is with us. Welcome, Shri. Shri, are you in the U.S. or are you in India? I'm in U.S. Okay, welcome. And you, uh, which time zone are you in? What time is it? It is. Uh, it's going to be six in the morning. I'm in uh, uh, Detroit. Uh huh. Okay, so you're up bright and early. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin McGurr. I am a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco. For those of you who may not be aware or remember, it's the former home of that warm and fuzzy guy that we all know by the name of Stanton Glantz. So he and I are, are basically, um, we're not necessarily pals, but we are in the same academic institution. Uh, so let me say a couple of words about Joseph McCarthy. Uh, Senator McCarthy was a member of Congress and he was elected to his seat uh, just a couple of years after World War II uh, in the US Congress. And he emerged you know, at a time when we had a pause in the sort of anti-communist, anti-Marxist uh, hysteria that had begun to evolve you know, after the Russian Revolution. We had a pause, of course, because we were allies of the Soviet Union of Russia during the war. But once that was over and we began to emerge into what became known as the Cold War, uh, Mr. McCarthy was very successful in navigating and leveraging a growing antipathy and hostility and fear of communism in the US. And again, communism being an alternative idea. And again, separate perhaps from the government of the Soviet Union, but an alternative idea to what had very much become uh, a very significant investment. And I use that term literally and figuratively in the kind of capitalist free market system. And McCarthy was very successful in creating uh, and fomenting a lot of hysteria and fear around communism and communists being in various parts and in many different industries in the US. People may be aware uh, that he created that hysteria within the entertainment industry, uh, which became known as the blacklist of people who may potentially be members of the Communist Party not having their roles and, and thriving within their entertainment industry. That, of course, then migrated uh, with some significance into the academy, uh, where academics were basically muzzled, uh, excluded, uh, repressed, uh, lost academic positions, were prevented from academic positions, simply because they were tainted with even the possibility of being connected with communism and Marxism. And of course, there were significant numbers of uh, inquiries and hearings that occurred you know, within universities where people oftentimes were asked to name names of you know, fellow travelers in the area of communism. Uh, and of course, Mr. McCarthy eventually lost favor because of his outrageous approach and techniques. And of course, you know, he, uh, the emergence of television 
uh, in the early 50s were both his advantage but also his downfall, where Americans got to see both uh, you know, his fear tactics you know, on, full, uh, on full awareness, but also just how outrageous he was and eventually was censured by the US Congress. I, again, before I introduce the panel, I want us to begin to uh, think about, and I, I think Mark Gunther's presentation very um, earlier this morning, and of course, um, Konstantin Farsolinos' presentation yesterday, is really a, a very great preview in terms of you know, alternative ideas you know, that we've been embracing you know, in this room and at this conference now for some years, and that being in opposition, or maybe I should say in complement to the tobacco control industry. You know, the, the idea that there's another way of helping individuals change their smoking habit, that became and is still a very threatening idea to very invested in, in interest in tobacco control. And what has happened as a consequence, given that threat, and again, it's why I mentioned that uh, people here on our panel today are survivors and thrivers. They have experienced the hostility. They have experienced the harm. They have experienced perhaps the fear. But they fortunately, they've overcome you know, some of that or all of that hostility and have gone on and are now thriving in the work that they have done. You know, <clears throat> fomenting a new idea and a new approach about how we basically help particularly you know, vulnerable pop populations in low and middle income countries and even very, very vulnerable populations in the high income countries like Europe and the US. So again, let me just turn this over. Uh, we have, um, and again, please forgive me if I'm doing uh, damage to people's names, uh, we have Sri Sukarita, uh, who I mentioned is um, uh, in the U.S. today. Uh, she is a community uh, health uh, medicine professor uh, in a university in Chennai and has led a tobacco, I'm so, I should say a harm reduction association, you know, within India. On my left is Brad Radu, and those of you who were here last evening uh, got to see uh, his award for the incredible work that he's done over the years and currently is a professor at the University of Louisville in Kentucky, you know, which of course is nested in a lot of tobacco, farming, et cetera, et cetera. To my right is Derek Yak, who has a CV longer than I could ever imagine having. And of course, uh, Derek has done incredible work historically with the World Health Organization, and more recently has been the founding executive director of the, of the Foundation for the Smoke-Free World. And then on my right, and I'm not talking about politically, uh, is Marawe Glover, uh, who has done also some incredible work around advocacy as well as academic work having to do with particularly native populations, you know, down under. So we've got some incredible people who are here to tell their story of what they've had to contend with with respect to having alternative ideas and how they've thrived and continued. So let me start with Sri. Would you like to lead us off and describe? Um, by the way, I should also, uh, excuse me, uh, people have, uh, all of our panelists have, uh, videos online which you can watch. And what they'll be doing is essentially providing uh, a brief summary of that video just to kind of get us beginning talking and dialoguing around some of this work having to do with uh, academic freedom. Sri, please uh, start us off. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, opportunity to be here, though not physically with all of you there. It's wonderful to see all of you and I can uh, recollect my past memories. The only time I was there after that uh, COVID happened and I could not come back again. Uh, 
this time i tried my best but in spite of that i could not get visa uh, so the video i have submitted uh, if some of you have gone through i have highlighted the academic environment uh, in the institution i worked with for almost 10 years but the moment uh, in the past 5 to 6 years has been a little bit of uh, a unique journey uh, i would say it a little bit of unique journey because it was riddled with challenges and uh, uh the challenges were uh, uh, more in the, in the context of tobacco harm reduction because it was a novel concept for the panelists uh, when uh, my research later revealed that most of the indian healthcare professionals are not aware of these alternative uh, solutions for addressing the tobacco epidemic they are steeped in prevention or control and in that control also they are not much Uh, practitioners of uh, nicotine replacement therapy these are all the things which we came later to know because of our research but initially when i started with uh, tobacco harm reduction and proposed a uh, research application to the committee that is when uh, the first time i have experienced this hurdle of uh, not having the freedom to explore a topic of research interest that is the point of our topic today academic freedom as a researcher we are just curious to understand what is the phenomenon happening in our society uh, and in a country with 300 million tobacco users definitely it is of concern for us and we want to see what why the time tested uh, mechanisms and strategies are not yielding the results or outcomes at public health or population scale and when we have alternative solutions and people are already using some of these solutions i just wanted in 2018 to explore who are these users of alternative uh, mechanisms and submitted a proposal when i wanted to go for the lung conference world lung conference happening at that time in hyderabad unfortunately that was the time i experienced the first time and till now the proposal has been suspended without given any ethics approval so to start off with uh, because uh, we will come back to it in during the discussions the academic freedom the researcher's curiosity to explore a phenomenon of interest that should not be curbed because of the members assumptions or the institutional policies because the freedom to explore and to uh, elicit the determinants for such a phenomenon existing are taken up by the population it should be the uh, researcher's uh, prerogative or discretion and the committee should not be in a position to tell us what kind of research we should undertake what kind of uh, avenues we should explore that is my contention thank you thank you dr jukodita uh let's turn to uh dr badu and let us hear from his experience uh well thank you very much for this opportunity i i think i'll put it in context and i hope everybody's seen the 10 minute video but i'll put it in context In 1994, and this is purely because of timing. Anybody who's ever published a paper knows you don't control the timing. But in 1994, I published three papers. The first one was pure mainstream. We published uh, the first ever study of nicotine levels in smokeless tobacco products by brand name. Nobody had ever tried doing it by brand name. I guess everybody was scared. We didn't know any better. We just go ahead, went ahead and put the brand names in and published nicotine levels, and we were trying to show that they had as much nicotine as any cigarette did. So it would serve as a source, as a basis for a switch. But it was mainstream. Never got a peep of controversy. The second paper is what I described in my 10-minute video. It was about my idea that smokers who couldn't unable or unwilling to switch or unwilling to quit tobacco entirely switch to a smokeless tobacco product which provided the nicotine and that's what generated that whole 10 minute video that I went over. The third paper was a little bit back to mainstream. It was with Dr. Cole and we talked about the life expectancy from American Cancer Society 
uh, of smokers compared with smokeless tobacco users based on what we knew of the risks at that time. Now, it was published in Nature, and that's a pretty good journal. And my other colleague, Don Miller, who I mentioned last night, he said at the time, Brad, you publish a, a, with a publication in Nature, that can make an academic career. That's what I thought he said. But what I didn't hear, I, I don't hear real well, I think what he actually said that that can make an academic career miserable. <laughs> because that's what ended up happening that's described in that video. So I'll turn it over to the others with, the, with that final comment. Thank you, Brad. So let's uh, turn it over to Derek. Thanks, and I, I don't want to um, repeat my, my video. Um, I hope you'll not watch it because I really look pretty bizarre, maybe as bizarre as I am here. But listen, um, I hope you'll get some ideas. What I, I thought I'd rather ask is an interesting question that I've asked um, my whole life. Um, where have I been freest to express my views and to carry out research? And uh, where have I been most constrained? And I'm not going to get into them. And um, the problem with my, my, my career is that I can't keep a job, and, um, which meant that I've been in the private sector, in the public sector, in a WHO agency, in a foundation, and God knows what. Um, and every time, I think one learns things. So if I had to answer the question of where I was freest, I, I, I come to myself with strange answers. The first place was actually uh, way back in South Africa during the end of apartheid. Remember, just the end of apartheid. South Africa was banned by WHO. Uh, South African academics were banned from international discourse, um, and uh, except with ANC permission. So when we wanted to travel, we had to get ANC permission out of London to go to a conference. But within the institution, epidemiology and biostatistics were seen as truly important to open freedom about expressing differences between groups by race, by class, by geography. And never did I feel any effort to censure or to control or to stop the publication or the work as long as the intent was to have data that could improve health. This is in an apartheid medical research council. And for me, the sort of epitome of the surprise, even to me at the time, was when the townships were burning in the late 1980s. And I went to the then conservative president of the Medical Research Council and I said, we need to document the impact of police violence in the township on health and health services. His answer was, tell me how much it costs and we will not go through the normal process. You'll have it tomorrow because it was important to do. And the publication eventually came out in the American Journal of Public Health. What thought me was that the outside world may have seen at the time a view of South Africa that was not reflected by the internal uh, desire of an institution that remained true to the ethics and cause. The second was, um, again, surprising, was at PepsiCo, where our good friend Stan Glantz claimed I started my transition to the dark side. And what a glorious transition to the dark side it was. Um, Indra Nui was my boss, essentially, and I was an early hire. And I'll never forget the first meeting when the president of the International Union of Nutrition Scientists came to meet with her and me and said, on behalf of international nutrition scientists, we want to express our concern uh, that you're taking somebody out of public health and uh, you're going to use that person to distort data and results. And our answer to him was, if he does anything but not continue what he was doing with you, He's of zero value to this institution and will be out of here before he knows it. And I mention that because that's the way it played out. And anybody who's been inside the last R&D facility of a corporation would maybe be surprised. I learned not to be surprised that the openness there is actually greater than I saw inside the hallowed halls of academia. The discourse was very real. You had to get it right. Because if you got it wrong, the company would lose profits and go under. So you better get it right. There was a double motivation of getting it right for science, and science was usually going to have to be aligned with better products. 
And that's, of course, the start of my second transition. And the third one was when I completed my transition to the dark side. And those early discussions with the then CEO of PMI were about the most open, most interesting discussions I've had about tobacco control that I thought I'd ever have. Um, it was with somebody who was deeply knowledgeable, and we knew only a fraction of what they knew about what truly worked, the role of taxes and everything else. But it boiled down to taking the stuff that mattered, the stuff that was killing you, out of the core product. And those discussions, which went on for several months, led me through the laboratories to meet some of the scientists from the pharmaceutical industry, asking them, what on earth are you doing here? And they said, we're promoting health. The pharma Many of them came out of frustration that the pharmaceutical industry hadn't got on with that very same job that the tobacco industry is now left to do, is to recognize the role of nicotine and separate it from the stuff that was killing you. On that, um, I obviously completed my transition to the dark side. And um, when I looked back now, seven years later, what have been the results? Well, we now know that same company is now getting 31, 32% of revenue from reduced risk products. It was zero at the time. Uh, the FDA has ruled that this is appropriate for the protection of public health, where at the time there was no regulatory belief that this had any particular benefit to public health. And so I feel vindicated. If I was just to go one, one minute more and say, so where did I feel, feel most restrained? And I won't go into details, and I, you know, maybe you'll ask in, in question time, but it was in places I shouldn't have been most restrained. WHO was not a particularly open environment for the discourse on science. And remember, I wasn't just in tobacco. I was in tobacco, non-communicable diseases, mental health, violence, and many other areas of public health where there were certain topics which were simply taboo for the institution and still are today. There were certain discussions about countries and um, political reality that couldn't be brought up. So I think one needs to often question oneself about where are you freest? to actually express your views and what happens to that freedom. Let me just end off by saying um, there's a wonderful piece that I hope people look at in the American Journal of Public Health, and I hope the activists in the audience read it and respond to the American Journal of Public Health. The title starts off very promisingly aligned with this session. Harassment of health officials, a significant threat to public health. That sounds great. And then you read uh, somewhere down here, controversy in public health is not new and isolated experiences of harassment are, are common. Before COVID, health officials faced opposition from members of the public for supporting efforts to ban youth vaping and the sale of flavored e-cigarettes. So they were saying that it was the harassment um, by those trying to promote e-cigarettes, which was a big threat to health officials, ignoring, of course, the entire session that Mark outlined earlier, showing where the true harassment came from. And the fact that this can appear in the American Journal of Public Health is particularly ironic, since they've just banned Brad and I from publishing a response they requested um, on issues related to what the FDA now needs to do to address e-cigarettes. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Certainly a lot to think about. Uh, Marobe, you're on. Okay, good morning and thank you for flying with us. I know that you have a choice of airlines. <laughs> and we're great, it's great to see so many people here. So um, my video, uh, you know, it's quite hard to talk about the attacks and uh, not get emotional and, you know, dredge it all up. So I took a more analytical, um, you know, push it out and be, be the scientist and look objectively at it. I did some analysis of it. And, and just as a little bit of background, uh, I, at a master's level, so I, all my training was in psychology and then community psychology. Community psychology tends to look at, um, you know, we look at community development, the process of policy analysis, advocacy, and also just facilitating, you know, not-for-profits or community groups. So that's what I trained in. and before going into policy analysis and public health and finding, you know, well, where can I spend my time to most use? Obviously, work on the uh, thing that was killing the most, uh, well, the biggest killer of Māori people, the Indigenous people of New Zealand. So that led me to work on tobacco, and I've been doing that for 30 years. Um, and 
we are making progress, and I certainly um, know that I've had a lot to do with that. But, you know, I think when you make progress and there's some reward at the end of it, or certainly awards uh, and recognition, it, and then also we had to lobby a lot for extra funding for tobacco control, uh, and it kind of opened up a wild, wild west situation, or more like the gold rush, uh, and uh, my head of department and PhD supervisor who was in the gambling area talked about this model of the gold rush, the wild, wild west. And when you have a gold rush, um, so if you think of the wild, wild west, there are medicine men and there are gold diggers. And so there were the, kind of the three Gs. And I saw it happen starting from being the first full-time uh, indigenous person working on tobacco in New Zealand. And, and then that frontier opened up and there was money, and the three Gs are sort of gold, glory, and girls. Um, and, and that's what it kind of became like. A lot of people rush in for the three Gs, and it, get, and it became very competitive, and it's like rats in a box, you know, uh, a lot of competition over the funding. And, and then the more people that are there and the more people that sort of figure out how they're going to become the expert, and you, it's quite cutthroat. Academic has, academia's got quite cutthroat, as there has been an increasing number of people coming through universities, getting degrees, getting PhDs, seeking research funding, and there just isn't, the, the funding doesn't grow, that funding pool. So. Uh, I actually, and Steve, my partner, always said it's always about the money. I'm like, no, it's not. I know these people. Uh, but I, I think I have come round to it is about money. And, uh, and so that's what I talk about. This campaign against me started a long time before, uh, you know, Derek suggested, why don't you think about... <laughs> a centre focused on Indigenous people globally. I mean, I never could have imagined that I ever would have got to work at a global level focusing on reducing the harms of tobacco use for Indigenous people worldwide. Uh, what an amazing opportunity. And certainly, you know, we did our due diligence and we thought about it a lot. We thought about the flack that would come, but there's a higher kind of goal, you know, if you're spiritual or you, you believe in God or, or whatever. At, at the end of the day, uh, you have to do what you can to, to improve the world, especially for your people. And the opportunity was too great. I either remained um, cut out of tobacco control as I already was. They had already got rid of me out of the university where I had kept a job for 15 years, and I had been very successful getting research funding, millions of dollars of research funding, researcher initiated. If I hadn't won that funding, I wouldn't have had a job. And I'd built a centre up. Um, I had 11 staff. I had won a government uh, contract to roll out one of my interventions, a national uh, stop smoking competition. And, you know, so, and then a colleague and I won an innovative um, research grant where we would be holding the budget and we would get to dish out, you know, have funding rounds. So it was a real innovative trial of could we fund researchers in a different way? The Ministry of Health and Health Research Council which was a joint venture. They wanted to bring all of the leaders in tobacco control in New Zealand together to work together, bring the greatest minds together to, to be on this, um, this fund together. And I was one of those uh, leading minds. Well, the, another university, uh, they wanted to win that and they refused to work with me. Uh, they they saw my colleague as the softer touch. They'd be able to get him over to their side. And thankfully to him, he stood by me uh, and, you know, didn't give in. So we did win it. And boy, did they hate that. And so that was a five-year uh, program of money, $5 million, so very significant in New Zealand. And somewhere along the line, you know, it just continued the undermining and eventually uh, 
they, they got rid of me out of the university using whatever means possible, complaints, um, you know, manufacturing. Uh, anyway, it's in my talk. Please have a look. So uh, I was offered a chance to go to another university uh, because another professor did not like what he was seeing, so that was great, and then promoted uh, and up to professor. I mean, I didn't even think I would even become a professor. Uh, so that was fantastic, but I was out of tobacco control. If you want to get research funding in New Zealand, you are judged by a panel of your peers. Well, they were not... Um, my peers anymore <laughs> and so that was it and it was kind of like well you do 25 years ex uh, you know developing your expertise in a topic and then they've just cut me out um, so I began working on obesity and other topics and teaching and so when Derek and others formed the foundation for a smoke-free world and this opportunity came up how could I say no uh, I might be able to do some good again using my expertise. And it's a topic I love, and, uh, and it's a work of love, you know, for the people who are being harmed and who are being left out and left behind. So I did that, and yes, <laughs> the flat came. Uh, really surprising how vicious, how violent it has been. Obviously, nobody's actually punched me in the face. I would actually prefer that. I've got, I've got a lot of experience being beaten up and uh, bad childhood, so yeah, come punch me in the face. Don't do all of this, you know, highfalutin, backstabbing and what they do, which I talk about in the video. When I did my masters, I actually wanted to work on domestic violence and the reduction of sexual abuse. Um, I'm already a survivor of that, so, you know, if you've been through worse abuse, then I think that has helped me get through this, um, and I am a fighter and a survivor. So I wanted to work on that, but that was kind of really heavy, <laughs> but I did learn about violence, and I began to see the same pattern. Um, some of you may be aware of the Duluth model. Uh, from Duluth, there's a Duluth model, the power and control wheel. So I would encourage you to have a look at that. And when I was asked to put together a presentation um, about the experiences, about these strategies, I could see the same kind of model. There was a chronological strategy, and my uh, master's thesis was on male partner violence against indigenous women. And one of the first things that men do is isolate the partner. So they will move to another town, they will separate her from her friends. So the isolation is one of the first steps in domestic violence. And it's also what uh, these public health uh, competitors do. So isolation is the first one demean, belittle, put down, destroy your self-confidence um, and make you doubt yourself, gaslighting, all sorts of things to destroy your, uh, you know, your mental health. So that's the next strategy, is that kind of emotional abuse. The sabotage in terms of academia is rife, um, but you know, anything they can do to sabotage your work, to sabotage your chance of getting f uh, funded, published, uh, to be, speak at conferences. Um, and then the fourth um, theme or category was erasure, to erase the person altogether. Now that is, um, this is a very long-standing strategy in academic, academic bullying, uh, and there's a phenomenon called mobbing. And there are many books on it, and I've read it having been through that before joining the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World, um, and I mentioned one of those in the video. One of uh, the books was called, well, I always remember it as getting rid of that pain in the ass professor. And he kind of wrote the book in a tongue-in-cheek way. It's like a manual for how to get rid of a professor. And this whole thing of erasure, the first thing, really the best thing, 
that they try to do is get you to commit suicide. And this is a very heavy issue. There have been over 400 suicides of academics, of professors around the world. Um, and so it's not an uncommon, it, I guess it is uncommon, uh, but it, it happens. So I was, um, yeah, that's kind of very scary. I knew that I had to look after my mental health and, and survive this because that's, that's the easiest thing if you want to get rid of someone, uh, drive them to suicide. If they don't leave uh, or kill themselves, then you start implementing all of these other strategies. So please have a look at the video. It's not all sob sob, you know, poor me. It's more an analytical kind of push it out a little bit, make it easier to, for me to talk about and maybe for you to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, pose a question to the panel. I mean, given that you are here and you have survived and you've thrived, uh, I know that you're all aware <clears throat> of younger people who are trying to break into the research world, perhaps trying to break into tobacco uh, research. And I've had many people who've said, I will not partner with you, I'm afraid. Particularly in the context where I have been the belly of the beast. What do you say to young people? How is it that you basically pushed on through? How do we advise individuals to stick with their beliefs, with their intentions, and overcome the hostility that they may be experiencing? Well, I, f I first want to um, uh, c uh, commend um, uh, Jerry and Paddy and uh, the group for the Kevin Malloy scholarships, which are doing just that. And um, the three winners uh, last night, I think, epitomize what is certainly beyond my answer. Why are they doing what they're doing? And they're doing it because they have a passion to address the public health consequences of smoking. And they see that as a more powerful motivating force th for their careers than the potential harassment that they may face along the way. And I think that is always going to be the most powerful motivation for them. On the downside, I do worry, of course, that um, there are a growing group of young people, young faculty, uh, young people in masters and doctoral level who, are, who feel that they are harassed out of their careers. Um, I think it was uh, Donna Carroll uh, from University of Minnesota and, and a bunch of uh, young people who wrote a piece in one of the journals a couple of months ago, spelling exactly out this problem, that their career prospects they were fearful of were being hampered if they continued in tobacco harm reduction in general, regardless of the source of the funding. And of course, that has a very chilling effect. My answer to them again is, as uh, the scholars will say, you've got to go where, uh, the, in my case, I've always in public health believed I go where the biggest public health gains are possible regardless of what the consequences of taking them on are. For some people, that's a motivation. That's not the only motivation people have. It could be curiosity. This is a field where science, technology is getting very exciting. The merger of digital, biotechnology, behavioral sciences, intellectually, this is a, an area of great endeavor. And the transformation of bad into good, in the case of nicotine, is coming faster than we suspected as we start looking at the aging brain. So there are many reasons and motivations for people to, people to do it, and it will be up to them to decide what motivates them. You were talking about how to push through, yeah, and what to say to young people. So um, I obviously like harm reduction. You have to start where people are at, and everybody has their own circumstances. So. I understand why many people have completely cut me off and they're not allowed to talk to me. They're not allowed to read my work. And, you know, where once we were, I, you know, sort of friends, I thought, uh, but at least friendly colleagues. And, you know, they haven't talked to me for a couple of years now. now and I understand that they need to do what they need to do to feed their families. And, and for their career. Um, certainly, it's, it's a struggle, you know, you th oh, thought we were friends, well, 
in my book, a friend wouldn't do that. So, okay, we were just colleagues. And, uh, yeah, uh, I, I understand people have to do what they've got to do. And young people particularly are probably going to be forgiven because they didn't know, you know, how could they know at the start of their career or something like that. So I think that young people will, they won't have that same, uh, uh, you know, um, erasure or, you know, you're complete, you'll never have a career in academia. But I have seen some leaving, you know, they've done their PhD on harm reduction and they've gone to other fields and that is a loss for us. So it is important that we put time into developing up and coming and emerging researchers, but I, I'm kind of careful to offer that given that I know what's, you know, what they potentially are going to uh, be met with. And the other thing is that I front this. If anyone's got anything to say, you hit me, you know, you're not, you're not to hit any of my staff or anyone that works for me. So I front everything. And in, in, in academia, I guess, that could be seen to be, oh, you know, she wants her name on, she wants all the glory and the gold and obviously, you know, we won't talk about the girls. And, um, but, but it's not, it's about protecting everybody else that's involved. I made the decision and I, you know, it should, the buck should stop at the top and the bombs can be chucked there as well. Shri, uh, did you have uh, comments, please? Yeah. <clears throat> this is a very important question because uh, from my own experience, uh, after uh, some time, it, it starts taking a toll on you because the academia, uh, at least in India, I, I'm, I'm sure it is different in different parts of the world, but in India, because of lack of uh, a very good awareness about the potential of this alternative uh, avenues and harm reduction, similar to drug narcotics, it has not been taken up uh, drug harm reduction is widely accepted in India, whereas tobacco harm reduction has not made equal uh, attention at the policy level or even in academia. So in that kind of environment, if someone is choosing to work exclusively on tobacco harm reduction or a major chunk of their research being uh, tobacco harm reduction, like me, for the past six years, I have faced a lot of a lot of uh, hostility and a lot of challenges, repeated appearances in committees and all that. It, after some time, it takes a toll on you. And it, as uh, Professor Mareva alluded, the first point is isolation. And there is a kind of uh, halo around you that you are doing some kind of unmerited or demerited research because it's not widely accepted the topic why 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 some why not something else kind of uh, halo surrounds you so in my experience i after all this uh, 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 journey i am stepping out of academia because it's high time to pursue freely you need your own avenue so and we are not beginners so we, at least my career is 15 years. Uh, my Professor Marevas is 30 years. But for someone coming into this field, as uh, uh, again, Dr. Derek has mentioned, uh, there, is, there is a price you have to pay to pursue certain career options and what are your motivations. But still at this level, a global conference like this, when a question is posed like that, we know the problem that youngsters who are going to pursue or even established uh, academicians like us are facing. Can we think of a solution and uh, propose a support network where all of us, if even we can be just, you know, a sounding board when someone expresses, because uh, Professor Mareva again mentioned mental health, especially for women scholars, because we are more sensitive to these issues because there is, there is ge gender component here so maybe at this global forum, I would suggest maybe we have to propose a support network for at global level for any academic uh, scholars or anyone facing some kind of disturbances in their pathways related to research or career. Maybe we can have a forum at least to express and seek out mentoring solutions or some kind of support that will help help a lot of people to continue keep up their aspirations and 
uh, get some solidarity and you know keep moving forward because we did not give up we are just stepping out from a hostile environment to pursue it freely so alternative channels can be opened up thank you i i really like the idea of beginning to foster you know a supportive network globally and perhaps this conference you know serves that purpose why don't we uh, open this up now to Oh, right, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, mine will be brief. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I ran a clinical trial of skull bandits and, as a smoking cessation method back in the mid-90s, and I had a resident in oral pathology. I was in charge of a residency program, and he didn't have any other choice. He had to work with us. Uh, that's a good thing about residency programs is your residents have to kind of follow the rules. But he got first author on our publication in the American Journal of Medicine, so he was rewarded. Since then, fortunately, I haven't had to answer that question because no students have ever wanted to work with me. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Uh, Questions from the audience, questions um, from the virtual audience, please uh, let us know what you're, you're thinking, your comments, your reactions. Please. Uh, Young Jafir from New Zealand. Uh, very, sorry, very similar question um, to the students and emerging researchers. What one piece of advice would you give them to help them protect themselves? You know, again, I think it's something I, I think about a lot. And for me, the most important thing is to have a, a mentor over the long term. And that's why um, I, I really think uh, the last comment of Sri's is so important. I, I think this, this conference really could think deeply about how do you actually create that mentorship system, which in the end must have a lead mentor, but then have that um, uh, group that you could actually phone into and know you'll have a trusted person who's been there and understands uh, where you're at. Um, and th there need to be people who really have a, a depth of understanding and a re relatively long experience. So just to reiterate, I think uh, Sri's suggestion mustn't go unpassed. I, I really think there's something there that we should build on and uh, think about how you can put into effect. I think that one of the ways to protect yourself is really to strive for excellence in your scientific work. So, you know, developing your skill and your writing skill, your, your research abilities. I mean, if you write an excellent paper, you should be able to get it published somewhere. The, the whole publishing realm is, is pretty corrupt, really. But, um, and, and it's even more corrupt now that, uh, you know, we've formed a list, some of the grantees. We have a list of all of these publications that refuse to publish our work because we are funded by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And, uh, you know, so I started looking like, how come we can't get published and yet industry, tobacco industry scientists are getting published. I mean, they might not feel that they're getting published all the time, but they are compared to, to us. So I started looking, well, where are they getting published? Okay, well, I'll submit there. Uh, that clearly, they don't have the same policy. So there are many journals uh, that are not, that have not been corrupted by the, uh, you know, the tobacco control people leading this attack and um, you just have to and again we must communicate so we share that information among ourselves where are we getting published uh, where are there still open doors and and the other thing we need in terms of support well i really think that's an important um, suggestion of Shri's as well. And we do need a better support network, maybe more frequent communication around this, because one of the other things that this blacklisting and uh, that is included in this McCarthyite type strategy is that they will not review any of our papers. 
Um, I remember when I was deep in tobacco control, um, you did not review any paper written by a tobacco company scientist. That was a rule. And now that's been extended to people uh, funded by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And, you know, so we need also a list of people who are willing to... Uh, be more robust scientifically and review a paper regardless of the funding. You, Of course you're going to look for bias and evidence of, of a conflict, but really is there good science there? I would say strive for excellence and we definitely need more frequent communication and sharing of information and we need others outside of the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World grantees in academia who have published, who are willing to review. And please let me know if any of you are, because I'm tobacco section editor of the Harm Reduction Journal and struggle to find people to review for us. Thank you. I, please, over, over here. Hi, it's John Summers from the UK. Um, when I studied um, science, I, I was always, you know, brought up to um, to engage in debate. You know, you 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 can agree to disagree. But one thing that I've, I, I, I'm increasingly seeing across all of academia is this notion of deplatforming, of of dehumanising people. And do we think maybe that, that you know this is something that's happening generically across academia, that there's an, a hyper-politicization of students and of, of study of, of academia itself that needs to be formed? Um, I, yes, the answer is yes. Um, I, I've been tracking particularly, um, I think which is a growing deep concern, that it's, it's coming, any contrarian view uh, now has a difficult time having an open, respectful debate in the traditional uh, spirit of academic openness and discourse. We're going against the UNESCO codes of conduct on uh, open science. And I think people really need to be reminded of what UNESCO says constitutes open science and open dialogue. Um, it says that nothing should be banned on the basis of anything except the underlying methods of the science, not the source of the funding. Of course, the source of the funding must be fully and completely uh, explained and outlined in great detail, but that shouldn't be a criteria to remove it. I think the bigger concern is that I see is the schism between um, the private sector and the public sector and private funding and public funding. Not, forget the tobacco sector. I think the last of the latest cumulative developments we're seeing out of WHO are going to make this substantially worse. The creation of a commercial, a, a unit called a unit on the commercial determinants of health, I think represents a chilling effect to anybody with any industry interests. So the thesis of this unit is basically that profit-making entities are bad and should be regulated and taxed, regardless of what they do, pharma, food, tobacco, alcohol, whatever it is. And they lump them all together, and you can read that. Um, the assumption is that they are always bad. Um, many of us uh, would not be alive today if we didn't have Pfizer and Moderna doing their great science, um, some of them not getting any government funding, using their own basic science to do it, the others producing vaccines um, take the PMI investment in a vaccine, which people don't want to take because it's going to come from with some tobacco money. Well, that's insanity. And we should be actually having people call it out in those terms. It's just totally unacceptable. But the same is happening in the food sector. Uh, food scientists are being uh, dizzed if they are supporting efforts to lower salt or sugar or trans fats or to promote healthy food because the source of the funding is the food sector. And the creation of this commercial determinants of health in my mind, is a throwback to the 1980s in the UK when there was a very heavy-handed approach to try and dismiss or make sure that the oh, private hey. sector innovation you know, it's not and entrepreneurial spirit didn't this, emerge. But you it. Pretty like, certainly didn't get it he all. Couldn't, he he couldn't actually era. say that Inside this possibly WHO. wasn't. Digital space are soaring and are probably going to be the key to our most complex problems we face, everything from climate change to feeding the world to improving health. We should be encouraging and embracing that nexus between 
entrepreneurship, the private sector spirit, innovation, technology, and many universities are actually grabbing that and seeing that when you put that nexus together, we're actually gonna have breakthrough innovations to benefit the world. At that time, it's difficult to comprehend that WHO and many of the thought leaders there are going in exactly the opposite direction. And that will have exactly the effect that you are worried about. Could I just add? Um, you know, what happened during COVID-19 and the scientists that tried to speak out about some of the things that were said early on with a lack of evidence and, you know, so leading medical scientists uh, began to speak out and, and I saw the same strategies being used against them and a part of me was like, good, this, this is going to, a lot more people in a different sector uh, leading, you know, medical scientists are beginning to experience some of these same strategies Maybe now, uh, because, you know, just what happens to us in tobacco control and because of the existence of the tobacco industry, there's not a lot of sympathy for us. But what, when, what about when these strategies happen to others in the medical profession who start questioning the modelling on, you know, how many people will die from COVID and, and all of the arguments around the infectiousness and the, everything that they began to challenge and critique, and then they start uh, being blacklisted and defamed, and, and I, I kind of hoped that that will create a more of a backlash against this academic mobbing and or bullying. Um, yet to see it happen, uh, maybe when we get through uh, a little bit more, there, there will be, I think that they will start to say, and we do have as well, because it's all within the political um, you know, context as well, there's a lot around free speech um, and a lot more backbite on that, on free speech. So some of this links in there, it's definitely happening in other sectors. Um, I think there was a scientist in South Africa, lo a low carb, healthy fat scientist, that they were deregistered and had to take it to court. So it is happening in other sectors. And I think it's about this whole isolating us thing keeping us isolated if scientists across sectors got together to talk about these strategies and to start to, uh, and more research was done on how this was being used uh, across academia. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to add uh, two comments to uh, what people have been saying. Uh, building on the idea of you know, supporting younger people, I think us, older types, at least I guess I can refer to myself that way, uh, we do have the longer view historically, and I, as a person who had been involved with harm reduction since the early 90s, I've seen in the US how we've come from incredible hostility and rigidity around abstinence as being the way to basically help people around drug use but it's taken in the US amongst government funders now over 30 years to actually use the words harm reduction. So there is hope, uh, change does occur. But again, the other piece I think I wanna add to that is remember in the US and in Europe, harm reduction began not from the top, but it began from the bottom. Street health workers, street outreach workers went out and delivered clean needles to individuals, to vulnerable populations. It did not come from the public health professionals. It didn't come from the pharmaceutical industry. It didn't come from politicians. People had to take risks. And so that's important as well, that people have to understand that if you're going to do the work, that it's also going to require some level of risk. And I think that ultimately you can and will be rewarded. The other piece that I wanna to respond to Eric, uh, Derek talking about calling out, the other piece that I've sometimes gotten very frustrated with in the US, particularly 
and unfortunately from some harm reduction circles is that because of the historical damage that has been done by the tobacco industry, uh, they, have, they are succeeding oftentimes in creating this argument that being anti-tobacco harm reduction is a social justice issue. When, from my perspective, the, ir the irony is by denying access mm -hmm. to individuals, to vulnerable populations, and I, I really appreciated what Mark Gunther was saying earlier, that it's a class and economic issue in the US. It is poor people, people with mental illness, people with substance use issues. They are the individuals who are still smoking. They're the individuals who need the most help and the greatest access to any product that's going to help them change or quit smoking entirely. Yeah, I, I, I think, um you know, that leads to this, this question, I think, of the importance of tobacco harm reduction for really working far more closely and thinking of joint opportunities with the broader harm reduction community. I think that represents a very important way forward to actually have a fresh language as well about what that means. Because there's virtually no area of public health where progress is being made where we aren't dependent on harm reduction strategies. The entire COVID campaigns um, are based on many aspects of harm reduction. We know the HIV AIDS uh, issues. Um, you mentioned needle exchanges. I'm always reminded um, uh, of long discussions with Thomas Zeltner, who was the chair of the WHO board and is currently the president of the WHO Foundation, who tells the story of when he was uh, heading the Swiss Public Health uh, Department and launched the needle exchange program in Zurich and the incredible hostility and abuse that he got, uh, particularly from the mothers and, and women of uh, Zurich and German-speaking um, uh, Switzerland at the time, that he actually had to have security protection. Um, and when you and then, when you hear that, you wonder, well, if that's a known experience, and I was at WHO at the end of the period, and our job was to evaluate the impact of the programs through the mental health and substance abuse programs, and of course they showed enormous success. Why did that not cross over into an understanding in our field? Uh, why have we not yet been able to bridge that divide? I think part of it is that we're not meeting enough and talking enough about having a decent common language to actually say there's nothing peculiar about tobacco harm reduction. It's normal public health policy in anything where there isn't a black-white solution, which is basically anything related to behavior. You think of a single behavior that we want to bring about in terms of changes from a desirable health point of view, and it'll always be along a spectrum of least risky to most risky, and our job in public health, I've always felt, is to provide people with the choice, the tools, and the supportive environment to move ideally along the path to lower risk. Um, and um, I think that's what tobacco harm reduction and all harm reduction does. Um, Question over here. Can I just jump okay. in again? Sorry. I wanted to say that um, in terms of meeting, you know, when I get down, uh, and I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful for the funding from the Foundation F F for a Smoke-Free World, and one of our projects is a longitudinal study with people who smoke, who don't believe that they will be able to quit, and or they don't want to quit. And so we're following these people through, we're doing in-depth qualitative studies with them. I listen to every single uh, recorded interview and we're writing up the stories, uh, the case stories, and it's all on the website for everybody else to see as well. And it's part of that excellence and research and transparency. So when I, when I do start to feel sort of a bit down and, and, you know, there's been another attack, I listen to the interviews. And it really grounds me in why I'm doing, why we are doing this work. So it's that importance, and you talked earlier before about you know, you're working with the people that we are working for. I work for you, the people who vape. I work for the people who smoke. I don't work for tobacco control. I don't work for a university. I don't work for the foundation. And, and it's, so it's about staying in touch 
and listening to them, the struggles, the context of why they smoke, why they vape, the injustices that they suffer, the marginalization that they suffer, and that drives me and that you know keeps me going. The other thing that has kept me going is the community of people who vape. The vapors in the world, on Twitter, um, on their, uh, what, what's it called, the video shows, the radio shows that they have, and, and interviewing me. Um, so when nobody else wants to hear about my research results, they do, and they share that among themselves. So, you know, your vaping associations are so important to keeping me going, and thank you. Thank you. Important. Helen, I think you had a comment. <clears throat> Actually, Kevin, something you said made me think of, um, I just wanted to share what happened to me recently because what's happening on, on your level, it's actually happening on another level in terms of uh, bullying and being blacklisted. And I'm a, a social worker, and for years I've done tobacco harm reduction vaping groups with people who use drugs, people with mental health issues, people who are homeless. The exact group of people that we need to bring vaping products to. And for a couple of years I w was doing these groups at a, a social service agency in New York City, and they were great. Uh, waiting list to get into the group, and really having lots of uh, conversations with people at this agency, breaking down the myths and the lies around vaping, because the junk science is so powerful. So COVID hits, all the groups have to stop. Once the agency was back up and running, I went back to them and I said, I want to start these groups up again. They were like, great, let's get it going. Uh, so I, I got everything into place. And I have a relationship with Juul. I know people who work there. I love their products. And they offered me a $5,000 grant to do this group, just to provide food and other things. I did not want to use Juul. We had another product that we would be giving to people for free. So I asked the agency, I said, I know this could be tricky. Do you want to accept this money or not? They said they would accept the money all ready to do the group. A week before the group start, was about to start, I get an email and then a phone call. We're canceling the group. You can't do it. Well, why? And she wouldn't really come out and say, but it was because of Jewel. And uh, this conversation was terrible. She was saying all of the, the junk science that um, they don't work. You just want people to buy a particular product so that you can make these companies rich. And I was just absolutely blown away. So now I am tainted because of guilt by association, essentially, because I offered this agency a grant from Juul. So this is how it can play out and shut things down. I mean, I was, and one of my arguments was to her, Kevin, you just mentioned it, was this is about health justice, this is about racial justice. The people who come to this particular agency to get uh, sterile syringes, it's an overdose prevention site. You're doing harm reduction, this is tobacco harm reduction, this is reducing the harms of tobacco, these products, this is what, this is, should be part of this harm reduction family of products. I could not move her. Then I said, I want to come to your agency and do a presentation and let's have it out, right? Come at me, I'm ready for it. Never happened. So if you're trying to do this work on another level, just bringing products to the groups that need it, you might face some blowback, guilt by association, et cetera. And it means that the people who need these products the most are not gonna get them until we can break through. So I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, except to say I made a huge mistake by even trying to get a dual grant. Like I'm thinking I never should have done that. So maybe that's the lesson here. A lot more work to be done. We have uh, time for one more question. Uh, the gentleman in the back, I believe it was. Yeah, my name is Christoph. I'm from PMI, Germany. And for the past six months, I had the opportunity to work together and collaborate with a very reputable university in, in Germany. And these are very bright uh, five and six semester bachelor students. 
and uh, we had the opportunity to provide a challenge for the students so that they can work on, and this is in the area of harm reduction. And um, the students are completely free in how to tackle the challenge, and they decided to, to, to tackle the challenge with um, making qualitative interviews with certain people that are in the area of regulation, tobacco regulation, and so on and so forth. So they contacted professors throughout Germany, and what they experienced it was that um, they were shunned out, so they, weren't, uh, they, they couldn't initiate a conversation with those people. And I think this was a very hard experience for those very young and bright minds that were just trying to solve an academic problem that we provided. And uh, the solution I presented them until now was um, make this part of your thesis. So um, talk about that because it's a very new experience for, for this academic area that um, your thoughts are not open. They are not openly uh, discussed and uh, maybe you have an additional comment how um, they get the answers they, they are looking for because they, they want to write about science. Yeah, they don't want to write about how they are not able to initiate a conversation, right? So maybe you have a comment on that. Thank you. Well, that's, that's hopeful. Uh, we have one last comment from this young lady up here, and then hers will be the last. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Wheeler, I do a lot of sort of political small business advocacy in the United States. And um, you know, one, one thing that we worked very hard on this year was the flavor ban in Colorado. And um, you know, it's something they've been pushing there for a long time. And the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, they bring in hordes and hordes of scientists and people from academia that, that talk at length just blatant lies, things that are not backed up by anything factual. You know, um, we had um, worked very hard this year uh, to bring in some PhDs and some harm reduction experts to talk about that. And you know, first of all, it was a very hard thing to do. We had to ask um, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of people just to get you know, a small handful uh, that were able to come do it. And you know, one, one thing is you know, I would be interested to hear uh, what the obstacles are to weighing in in, in policy hearings and, and debates on legislation. Um, but it was really interesting because uh, we had one person there who um, was talking about, you know, why a flavor ban would, would be, you know, a bad idea. And uh, Stanton Glantz popped up, you know, to talk about why what this person was saying wasn't, you know, credible, you know, which is very ironic because this is a person uh, that, that has never had their research retracted being criticized by someone who is the king of, of junk science, right? Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, when, when we had those people that were willing to, to show up and, and talk about those things, it really resonated with a lot of the lawmakers because they were able to see it wasn't just those of us who own small businesses or, you know, those of us who use these products saying these things, but there's actual, you know, research and science and data behind it because so often, you know, there are a hundred scientists just spouting lies and it's a very unbalanced conversation. And so I guess I would be curious as, you know, what, what are the obstacles to, to getting more involved in, in, in policy discussions and, and when things are being voted on? Does anyone want to respond to? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I front up to those. You have to be very strong. Um, you know, you present, they sit in the background scoffing and blah, 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 you know. Um, and then immediately after I've spoken, the next speaker will defame me, go on radio, defame me. Uh, the MPs themselves will also, um, you know, you can't rely on them to be professional. So you have to be strong and... Uh, but somebody, you know, somebody's got to do it. And the thing is that we are on the side of right. And I think as time has gone on since my first GFN 2015, uh, you know, there is more and more evidence that we are on the side of right. And with Stanton Glance, I mean, he's a funny little man, really, but he's actually very easy to undermine. So if you are ever in the room with him, um, he hates to be challenged. He will quickly lose his temper and show just how abusive he is, what an abusive little man he is. And in a meeting, and, I'm, and we, it came up about e-cigarettes, and this was... Uh, he visited New Zealand, and 
he wasn't even coming to talk about e-cigarettes, just the anti-vaping, anyone that they could bring. They say, could you please talk about e-cigarettes? Oh, I didn't really come to talk about that. But anyway, they want people to say negative things about it. So um, it was a small private conversation with a few of us, and he started talking about e-cigarettes. I said, well, my, my sister smokes, and I'm going to give her an e-cigarette. And he just turned into this. <laughs> it was like, all of us were like, whoa. Um, he is not professional at all. And he just sort of went, well, you kill your sister then. And it was like, wow, Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, easy to, un to get him to, you know, when in court cases and they try to get people to lose their temper and then their credibility. Yeah, he's um, easy to undermine if you just... And you would be perfect at that because, um, yeah, you'd really, yeah, you would really get under his skin, Amanda. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm getting messages that we definitely need to end this, uh, this uh, GFN TV commentary happening. So please tune in. Thank you so much for your participation today. Happy. Hello everyone, um, my name is Fiona Patton, I'm a politician from Australia and I've been really lucky to be part of um, the, the Global Forum on Nicotine and we're on um, day two and today I'm being joined in the very smart studio by Paddy Costa, one of the founders um, and pioneers of, of this conference and Shahan Lungu who is um, also a, a, an extraordinary young man, but a scholarship winner. So we're going to start talking to you, Sahan, about the scholarship and, and a little bit about where you are, what you're doing now and, and how you came to, to get the scholarships. Uh, all right. Um, I heard about the scholarship through one of the first round of scholars, uh, Chimwe Mengoma. Uh, he is uh, one that uh, introduced me to tobacco harm reduction in Malawi at the time in 2018, around 2018. So we set up tobacco harm reduction Malawi at the time. And then through that, I started learning more about tobacco harm reduction and it grew my interest in the field. Yeah, so after a while, I applied for my first uh, round of scholarship and it was on uh, developing a documentary film Mm. Uh, talking to tobacco users, uh, uh, having a feel of their experience with tobacco use and if they had any knowledge about tobacco harm reduction and tobacco harm reduction interventions and products. Yeah, so after from that, I, I grew to understand the gap that was there in knowledge yeah. on tobacco harm reduction among tobacco users in Malawi and other uh, low and middle income countries where there's limited access to harm yeah. reduction interventions at the time. Yeah, what, so what are the smoking rates in Malawi? In Malawi, there's close to a million people smoke mm -hmm. on, in each, every day. And around 5,000 to 600 people uh, are affected by tobacco-related morbidity almost every year. Wow. Yeah. So was there much knowledge of tobacco harm reduction? No, there wasn't. Yeah. Uh, for most of the people that we talked to, it was their first time hearing about tobacco harm reduction interventions. They understand that uh, tobacco use, uh, smoking to combustible tobacco cigarettes is dangerous for them. Yes. But then most of them try to quit, but then they find it difficult to quit, and then they don't know where they can access, or they don't even know if they have options that are available for them yes. to help them make the switch or to quit uh, using combustible tobacco cigarettes. So it's kind of still quite of a challenge. 
Are, are some of those t safe nicotine products available in Malawi? Yeah, they are available, but not in the greatest amounts. Like the, for you to access them, they are ex too expensive for yes. a lot of people. They can't afford that. Yep. Uh, for a country where uh, it's still with a lot of people that live below the poverty line, it's like mm. spend less than two dollars a day. So it's very difficult them for them yeah. to afford. Uh, an e or a web device that may go for up to $100, for instance, mm. to wow. access for them. Yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm imagining that tobacco is quite cheap in Malawi, seeing as yeah. it grows there. Yeah, for, for, for them, it is cheaper to buy a cigarette, mm. for a combustible cigarette, because yeah. uh, it's some use hand-rolled tobacco cigarettes. They will just, uh, straight from the farm, just <laughs> dry the tobacco leaves, they throw their, yeah. they'll roll their own tobacco. Yeah. Uh, or they'll buy cigarettes. C cigarettes will go for as less as uh, uh, less than thirty cents, or maybe yeah. ten cents. Ten cents for a pack. Mm. Also, yeah, for a pack can go for like one dollar. Wow. For a pack of, say, of thirty cigarettes. So yeah, which makes um, things like safer nicotine yeah. products a real challenge mm. in low to middle income countries. countries. Uh, so. Last night they announced that you were one of the um, scholarship award winners. <laughs> uh, what what will you what will you do with the scholarship? Yeah, I'm trying to uh, enroll into the Malawi University of Applied Sciences and Business and Applied Sciences. I want to study uh, be, uh, health and behavior change communication. I'm also advised in health and behavior change communication, mm. and because I'm really looking into understanding the. Uh, health behavior mechanisms that influ that may influence a tobacco user to change from uh, using unsafe uh, tobacco usage to safer forms of tobacco, looking at this, uh, both the interventional and psychosocial factors that may affect all of that. Fascinating. Oh, well, I can't wait to see you next next GFN to find out more about this. Yeah, Paddy, yeah. this I'm. I'm imagining, as with many things that happen at the Global Forum for Nicotine, this was your idea, the scholarships. Um, it was an idea that we came up with as a group, uh, right. the staff team. Out of every tragedy, something good comes, and yeah. we lost a very, very um, valuable and much appreciated colleague last year to cancer. And we approached the the funders, the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World, who fund the scholarship program, because yeah. we wanted to make some special awards in memory of Kevin Malloy. Mm. And they were very, very generous in enabling us to make three fairly significant yeah. awards for two years. Yeah. So the people didn't just get a taste of what tobacco harm reduction is and then go off and do something else, mm. but this is actually Enabling people to build a career. We're yeah. building the next generation of tobacco harm reductionists, and I think it's something we're immensely proud of, and I think we're, we're entitled to be quite oh, proud absolutely, of. Absolutely, Paddy. Uh, and I know and that this year's um, award recipients of the Kem Kevin Malloy Scholarship come from Nigeria, Malawi, Afghanistan, so mm. all low and middle income countries. Yeah. Is, that, is that part of the scholarship's um, objectives to focus on those countries? The, the scholarships are a competitive, um, it, it, it's a competitive yeah. process that people apply for it and we judge it on a base of a number of criteria. Mm. But obviously the need is greatest in LMIC because yeah. in LMIC, it's a, it, if you take the World Bank classification, it's 80% of the world's population. Okay. And what you're also talking about probably is 80% of the world's smokers. Oh, yeah. And yes. what we want to do is we want to target what, that, they're not massive resources, but what we've got, we want to target mm. at places that they'll be best used. Yeah. So, Yes, I suppose there is a targeting of it, but you know, we, it's open to everybody. And indeed, the, um, the application process for the scholarships generally will begin, I think, in Oct late September, early October this year. So right. if people are watching and people are thinking they might like to do it, then they need to go to the website and yeah. have a look. And there's lots of information on there about the scholarships. There's lots of people's stories, including his. Yeah. Um, and it's... Um, the website is actually, a, it's, a, it's a living thing because we keep adding to it all the yeah. time about 
the achievements and, and mm. whatever. Mm. And in fact, before we came, just literally before we came on air, I was informed by John Derricko, who, who manages the whole thing, yeah. that one of our scholars has just won an award for a film at the Tribeca International Film Festival. Wow. Now, Fantastic. this is a serious thing. The, yeah. the, this is not just a, a gimmick. This is something that we've invested heavily yeah. in. And time, not, not just in terms of, of money, but in terms of time and other resources mm. to get this right. Yeah. And it, it's down to all of the scholars themselves, because yeah. they've brought different skills. They've brought different needs. Mm. It's been challenging. You know, it, but to have the new cohort of basic scholars and advanced scholars for the coming year, to have 20 or more, 21, I think, of those have been able to join us here. Yeah. Sadly, due to Vases. issues with the, the yeah. Polish authorities yeah, and visas, un others were unable to come. Yeah. I think we have to forgive the Polish authorities to some extent because they are dealing with a crisis across the border as well at the moment. That's but, it, absolutely. But absolutely. it's great to have people here and they, they contribute. They don't just take from the conference, they're contributing mm. to it. Mm. So. And I think, uh, Suhan, we were, we were on a panel. <laughs> you, were, you, were <laughs> last, you were asked to speak on that panel. It's a bit like A, a today. panel with about... Yeah, yeah, that, yeah <laughs> just, we're doing it to you again. He's yeah. so with, like, two, two minutes' notice, you were asked to speak on a panel around consumers' voices, uh -huh. but also around the World Health Organisation and COP10. Yeah. And, you know, it, and I think we've been talking about World Health Organisation a lot oh. and, uh, at, at this conference this time. Uh, and, and where does Malawi sit? Like, is, I know that you know tobacco harm reduction is, you know, is not something that the World Health Organization is um, promotes or, or, or even uh, actively discourages, yeah. even though it's it, it's in their treaties. So where, how does it work for Malawi? Oh yeah, like uh, I said last time uh, during that that panel, that um, Malawi is uh, heavily dependent on raw tobacco exports. Yeah. So. For countries like Malawi, it is very difficult to uh, balance the line between uh, public health and uh, economic needs yeah. of the nation. You've got, a, you've got hospitals and skill, schools to build. To build. So yeah. where do this, this, the, does the money come from? So like 60% mm -hmm. of the for like domestic revenue from Malawi is from raw tobacco sales. So we have a very, uh, I should say, a very um, economic interest, like a very, mm. very deep economic interest yes. with toba raw tobacco. I was like looking for that word, like uh, yeah. deep interest with to uh, tobacco. So it's very hard for countries like us to find the balance where you say, we're trying to protect the lives of our smokers or the lives of people who smoke. And then I also have to make money for our country. Yes. It was interesting when some of my colleagues visited yes. Malawi to do some work yeah. with, with a number of people who are on the, our program there. And one of them asked about, is there a tobacco control plan in Malawi? Mm. And they, oh, yes, we've got a tobacco control yes. plan. So they started talking about the tobacco control plan. And actually what it was, was quality control. Yes. Yeah, they were, they were, it, was the, it was quality control <laughs> of the product rather yeah. than controlling the use of the product. Yeah. So it was... Yeah. It, it's a whole new ball game yeah, that you guys yeah. have got into there. There are quotas and like the tobacco growing and tobacco industry infrastructure yeah. is very far much entrenched in Malawi. Mm. From the farm to the market, is everything is organized. So if yeah. you were to say we move from growing tobacco today, where does all this infrastructure go? There's yeah. like there's so much money has been invested in it. Millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Millions of uh, very large corporations are operating in Malawi because yeah. of tobacco. So it is very difficult to say we are moving away from this. There's like people in the transport industry transporting tobacco from the field, mm. people in the export business, exporting tobacco from the, the, yeah. the auctions to, to abroad. There are people, now there's a uh, tobacco, a cigarette manufacturing company that's in the country, which sponsors one of the biggest uh, football club in the country <laughs> right now. Uh, right. So it's like so a lot so of vested interest. Yes, so not a signatory to <laughs> the WHO's <laughs> no, treaty on this. Let's and not tell FIFA. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, that's right, you know, but I think, I mean, in Australia, we also grow tobacco, and yeah. in, in Victoria, we grow tobacco, but it's becoming less and less, and I suspect that we import from Malawi now. Yeah, um, should be. Which is, you know, it's, and it's one of these things of, you know, wealthy countries like Australia actually, you know, getting, uh, uh, relying on um, other countries to do the sort of dirty yeah. work. Yeah, because Malawi said we produce the, the highest, one of the interpreted Bali and, um, what's this other tobacco brand? Uh, Bali and, uh, 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 we say we call it uh, flu cure tobacco. It's right. one of the top quality, mm. top rated. It's yeah. from Malawi. So a lot of the cigarettes that you see out here, the tobacco comes from Malawi. Malawi. Yes, but, high, high graded. But it's interesting as well that a lot, a lot of the large companies buy the tobacco, take it away, process it, turn it into cigarettes, mm. and export the cigarettes yes, back, back to Malawi for Malawians yeah. to purchase. Yeah, yeah. and then it's they take advantage of the situation where because we don't have any regulations, so you can yeah. pretty much sell yeah. cigarettes in any way you want. You can uh, package them in a uh, nice packaging, you can advertise, because in Malawi you find tobacco advertising. Anyway, you find a billboard with the Ministry of Health warning saying uh, smoking is uh, bad for you, and then next to it there's a, a, a billboard by a, to a tobacco company saying, oh, these cigarettes are very nice. Yeah, the finest, they're, the, smoothest. They're smoothest, yeah. so, you know. It is like that. So how, I mean, in that, in that landscape, you know, the idea of tobacco harm reduction uh, must be very difficult. Yeah, it is. It, it is. But then what we, what we discovered as, you know, through this scholarship and due to the work that we do is it's best to talk to the consumers themselves yeah. because they understand their rights because the <laughs> consumer is uh, as a rational being. So yeah. if rationally, they will get the information that will give them, and then they start inquiring about the options that are available. Now they get, they get to ask us, oh, so you are telling me about the uh, vaping device, you're telling me about snus, where do I get these things? Mm. Now that now you are trying to, we are creating demand for that. Yeah. So now as the demand is increasing, then the interest for tobacco harm reduction also increases. And then maybe later on we can go into uh, enabling, policy, uh, enabling policies that will help uh, regulate them so that people have easier access to such things. But yes. that right now, the consumer is the most important person and the most important voice mm. that we target right now in Malawi. And I think this is what we've been talking about with the, with the upcoming COP10, where we'll be talking about um, tobacco treaties. And, and I believe tobacco harm reduction, despite the best attempts by others, is yeah, yeah. On the, it will be on the agenda. Mm. But whether consumers will be allowed into the room is another I, matter. And I, I, I don't think any leading bookmaker would be giving you any odds against yeah, that right. at the moment. Um, why is that, Paddy? I mean, why, you know, nothing about us without us. We always, you know, the World uh, Health Organization has been very the, proactive the, around lived experience. The United Nations and the World Health Organization specifically have written into their, their rules and their governance a commitment to transparency. Mm, yeah. Now, as far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong on this, but there are only two meetings, regular meetings that take place within the UN structure where the proceedings are held in camera. One is the, the Security Council, which uh -huh. I don't mind, you know, yeah, I'm happy for that to happen. And the other is the Framework Convention of Tobacco Control. Mm. Um, conference of the parties. What have they got to hide? Well, that's right. What do they have to hide? I, I, I find it astonishing, but WHO just seems to have a blind, a, a blind spot. Ideology has come into this rather than pragmatism. Mm. And in countries like yours, Suhan, where, you know, y y you're right, it's, it's so difficult for your government to, um, to take a different, to, to, well, to sign up to yeah, a lot yeah. of the approaches that countries like Paddy's in the, England and, and Australia can do because mm. of where you are in, your de, in the development. Yeah. So what else, you know, could World Health Organisations do? I mean, it, could they play a role in tobacco harm reduction in Malawi, do you think? Yeah, yeah they could play a role. They, they, they should play a role because um, 
the thing about the World Health Organization is they do a lot of great work in other areas of health as well. Yeah. So in Malawi, the, the burden on uh, public health is from uh, with these uh, non-communicable diseases. And non most of the non-communicable diseases are caused by uh, people that are using tobacco and tobacco-related infections. So if we are to mitigate uh, the, 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 the impact on public health, yeah. we need to talk about tobacco harm reduction. And they, if they are willing to engage us in this, I'll be very happy to, to, to oblige because yes. it's very important because you can't just say tobacco will go away. It can't go away. No. Tobacco will never go away. We always and, be and there. And we know that the, that's right, that the, 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 the deaths and, and disability from tobacco harms are happening in, in, in low and middle income in countries. countries. Yeah. I think, in, to put that, this whole thing in context, I mean, my, mm. my colleague Jerry Stimson, who's well known in the, in the field and is well known as a researcher in drugs, HIV, yeah. and is respected. And he's, he takes a very simple view of it, and that is that, unfortunately, there isn't a role for public health in all of this, except to stand back and let people yeah. take control of their own health. Yeah, yeah. And in the process of doing that, not a single taxpayer is going to be harmed mm. because we're not asking for money. Yeah. Not asking, all we're asking for is a, a framework that has sensible regulation mm. and the regulation is based on safety, yeah. not the, on prejudice. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, it's actually... It's, it's, I mean, there's... Well, in Australia, you know there's two things. I, well I do, Australia. and I mean, we know mm. that... You know, there's one issue that Australia... You know, the Australian government still makes a lot of money from yeah. taxes yeah. and very high taxes yeah. on our yeah. tobacco, which is making it unaffordable to people. Most expensive people. cigarettes in the world. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Great. Winning. Um, <laughs> but it's led to a huge black market. It's led to yeah, a criminal yeah. involvement now in the tobacco re in the tobacco space. Um, but also, we've criminalised and prohibited. Um, safer nicotine yes. products and mm. if you were cynical you'd say well that's to protect the the tax income mm. from the the smokers um, if I try and be optimistic it's just mis it's misguided and it's you know it's misguided because the World Health Organization is telling us one thing and that gives our our health officials a, a sort of a I guess a leg to stand on but from a taxpayers perspective it's it makes economic sense yes to be reducing the harms of tobacco um, that, you know, because we know that the harms of tobacco cost us millions of dollars yeah. every year, if not billions of dollars every year. The problem is short term thinking mm. because the, the impact of tobacco harm reduction, if it was implemented in a proper way, is going to be felt a long time in the future. And most politicians, with the, some exceptions, yeah. have a very, very short attention span. Yes, that's right, till the next election. And I think that the other thing, with the, I, 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 I sent you, I think, a, a wonderful article that was written by a previous Michael Russell orator oh, yes. called Ron Dworkin. Yeah. And he's an anesthesiologist and a bit of a philosopher. And basically he said that harm reduction is very hard to sell to politicians because it's pragmatic, it's not an ideology, yeah. and you can't distill it, you can't distill the concept into a three-word slogan. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was actually, this is where we're having the difficulty because, but what do I need to do? How do we do this? We don't yeah. do anything. That's the, yeah. that's the whole point. Yeah. Just leave it to people to do. And I, and I think, you know, in, well, in, in my country, it's, it's a very binary argument. Mm. You're either yeah. for tobacco or you're against yeah. it. Yeah. You can't, there's nothing in between. Nothing in between. Yeah, there's no nuance to it. Where you look at some, somewhere like Malawi. Actually, I wanted to ask you, given that there's so many crops there, do people use tobacco in other ways other than smoking it? No, no other way. Just smoking it, and then maybe if you're using traditional smokeless tobacco, um, most of the women in Malawi, they believe maybe it has some healing properties. Oh, they use it to, to calm their nerves. So right. Well, I think there's anxiety. a panel on after lunch on the benefits of nicotine, uh, yeah, yeah. so they so, might be onto something. Uh, yeah, so it's like, oh, maybe when I get a toothache, I'll use a little bit of tobacco so to numb the senses, something like that, when I'm feeling anxious. Or they believe maybe it cures uh, uh, symptoms of arthritis for some. Yes. 
Yeah. Mm. So th it, this is interesting compared to Sweden or Norway, yeah. where we've got high levels of snus use yeah. amongst the men, but yeah. not the women. Yeah. So you've got high levels of smokeless smoke. tobacco right. amongst the women. Yeah, so that's why when I was doing my second uh, scholarship project, I focused on uh, women who use smokeless tobacco. So I felt like if they're already using traditional smokeless tobacco, which is regarded dangerous, what if they maybe made the switch to another form of smokeless tobacco, which is safer, which is snus? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so most of them were very receptive of the idea because they understand utility value. Mm. That's why I was saying uh, tobacco users are rational beings. So if you give them a, a very rational argument, they are willing to accept it and they are willing to adopt things that will help them because yeah. everyone wants to live. It's a right for, for you it, to absolutely. live healthy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, you know, and, and this is, you know, the tobacco companies are listening to that, basically. Yeah. Their consumers don't want to die from cancer. Um, what industry in its right mind would kill 50% of its customers? Mm. No. It's not a good business. It is not. And I think, you know, I don't, th I, I don't think that the large tobacco companies have suddenly become philanthropic organizations, mm -hmm. but they're very, very conscious of a business model. Mm -hmm. that They didn't want a Kodak moment, yeah. so that they were producing something nobody wanted, mm -hmm. but also they see the benefits of people who are gonna be long-term users mm -hmm. of products. And nicotine is, an en for some people, is an enjoyable substance. For other people, it calms the nerves. For yeah. other, it does a number of things for different people. and. There is absolutely no imperative to quit. Mm. If you want to quit, quit. Mm. But if you don't want to, use safely. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, most people in their, their, their daily diet are consuming nicotine. Do you eat tomatoes? Yeah. Do you eat mm. aubergines? Yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, they, this is mm. a naturally occurring substance. It's, not, yeah. it's no more harmful than caffeine. Yeah. And no one's saying we should yeah. close Starbucks. No. <laughs> and I think it's, and this you is know, the, it, it's you know, I, I think this is the, the, the issue that so many of us are struggling to, to get through to our, to our legislators that, you know, vaping is not smoking. Mm. You know, it, it, is, it is the tar. And when you separate the tar from the nicotine, the, the nicotine is, you know, a, a very different health issue and a, a, a probably a much less important health issue no. than, than the tar that, that mm. is happening when, when we combust it. Yeah, um, the independent studies are there to prove that uh, the, the nicotine or the, uh, alternative uh, nicotine devices are safer, 95%. And yeah. then for snooze, they say it goes as high as 99%, I think. Uh -huh. so, well, we're all familiar with the cliff of risk. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Bur you burn something, it's not gonna be very good for you. And then yeah. you drop off to a slightly less yeah. steep decline in the, the levels of risk because of the different products. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you go down to things like snus that are probably mm. less than 1% mm. risk. I, I think we're, we're running out of time here. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just, um, it's great to talk to, to you and congratulations yes. on getting the scholarship. Thank Paddy, you. thank you for, for doing these scholarships because I think it's remarkable and it's, you know, we, we know that quite often um, low and middle income in countries and, and, and scholars and people like um, Sahar struggle to get the, mm. the, the access oh. to... Uh, to do this quite interesting work. Yeah. Well, since we started it, we've had now over 100 people go through the program. Mm. And an interesting byproduct of it has been that a large number of those people came from different countries in Africa. But the, the whole tobacco harm reduction Africa, mm. as opposed to individual countries, there's a lot of work going on. Yeah. I mean, there's guys, in, there's guys in Kenya working with the guys in Malawi yeah. and in Nigeria. So it's not just one part yeah. of Africa, yeah. it's, it's across the piece. And we're delighted with that. Yeah. And I think that's something that, you know, the work they've done, they should be in, immensely proud of because they started from nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Started from a zero base. And what we've got now is absolutely... It, it's and incredible. we want to replicate that. I know. And I, you know, and I want to, um, you know, I, I don't know what odds you bookmakers are going to get me, give me, but you know, copies coming, COP10 is coming up next year. Um, consumer groups and consumers and anyone who's watching today, please 
start getting make involved. Let's make a noise. Let's ensure that the voice of the consumer is heard. And I think specifically for, yeah. um, for, for our African countries, for our South American countries, where, you know, those voices need to be heard and they're not being heard under yeah. the current World Health Organization yeah. policies. Get us through the door. That's and listen right. to yeah. us and, heard, and listen. And I've heard yeah. Panama is lovely at that time of the year. <laughs> so. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I hope you're enjoying the Global Forum and Nicotine. It's, um, it's been absolutely fascinating. I know the next couple of days there's even there's some great stuff, and I know you'll, there'll be more on shortly. Um, Paddy, again, thank you for, for everything. It genuinely so, is a pleasure to be here, and yeah. it's just seeing people. Yeah, I know, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's not been just great. their faces, the backs of their heads. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Fiona. It's thank been you. very thank you. great.
tell from my accent that I am from Glasgow in Scotland and it's quite a broad accent. Um, so I'll try and speak slowly so that you can understand me properly. Normally I start with a, a video about understanding the Scottish accent because it's, it's not particularly straightforward, so, but I'm always very conscious of that um, when speaking with an international audience. So I'll bear that in mind. Um, welcome to this session, uh, you're very welcome. Um, you know the format already, so uh, our panellists here, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, will talk about uh, the things that are important to them, uh, things from their perspective about the benefits of nicotine. Um, hopefully you've had the chance and the opportunity to see their presentations and videos on the conference website. Um, but they'll just give you a short, short summary of that, uh, and then hopefully we'll, we'll engage in a bit of a conversation. Um, the role of, of the chair, my role in this is just um, trying to keep us in time, um, trying to stimulate a bit of a conversation, but I can't do that without your help. Um, what you get out of this session will pretty much depend on what you put into it. Um, another role of mine is to, to keep to time. I'm not always good at that. Um, sometimes when I speak at conferences myself, I run over my own time. In fact, I remember talking at a conference once where I had 10 minutes to present my, my um, conclusions and findings. And after about 15 minutes, um, I could see the chairperson getting really nervous and upset and anxious. And I apologised and I said, look, I'm really sorry, but I don't have a wristwatch on and there's no clock in the wall. And someone from the back of the hall shouted, yes, but there's a calendar in the wall behind you. So, so I'll be very mindful of that. Um, I'll try and keep us in time. Um, let me just introduce our panel to you. Uh, Paul, uh, lovely to see you there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have Paul Newhouse, uh, we have Sud Pitwarden, we have Ricardo Pelosa, and of course we have Michelle Minton. Um, now what I'll do is just ask each of our panellists just to sort of introduce themselves a wee bit at the beginning. Um, I know that they will be well known to many of you in the audience. Um, but predominantly just to spend a few minutes, minutes or so um, discussing the key elements from the presentation. Excuse me. No, thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you. That's perfect. Now here's where I start getting nervous because my notes fall all over the place. That's good. So um, I think the order that we'll start in is, is Michelle and then I'll, I'll pick it up from there. Um, and I will make sure we afford you the opportunity to ask questions um, after the end of each person's presentation, if that sounds okay to you. Michelle. Hello, everybody. I am Michelle Minton of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C. in the United States. And I write about consumer policy, so that includes food, gambling, alcohol, cannabis, uh, nicotine, obviously, and other drugs and behaviors that the government tends to try and tax or regulate for public health, for our own good, for the moral... Yeah, uh, health of society, however they want to phrase it. And my presentation is a little odd. I'm kind of the odd woman out here as a non-clinician, a non-scientist, uh, and what I really wanted to talk about, and I thought uh, when I was invited it would be a valuable contribution because it's not discussed very often, especially when you're talking about the benefits of nicotine. We have to make the arguments that it's good for smoking cessation in certain forms or it's, uh, you know, it has medical benefits. But one of the benefits that's not discussed is the pleasure benefit, enjoyment, um, dealing with stress from the world, you know, from your life. Those are real benefits that are hard to measure and quantify, which is why they're ignored by both science and government, because government funds a lot of science, and government wants numbers to inform policy, so the scientists focus on the things that they can quantify. And pleasure is a difficult thing, and it's a personal thing to quantify. But and if you've watched my presentation uh, prior to the panel, there is a ton of evidence from the history of medicine about these kind of hard to quantify benefits, these collective life circumstances and how they affect physical health and community or public health. So one of the things that I got into in my presentation that I found just absolutely fascinating was the the traditional medical uses of tobacco around the world. and. Uh, especially when I saw uh, you know, a tribe in a South American country and a indigenous population in a Pacific Island nation using tobacco hundreds of years ago for the same thing, like hair loss. You, know, you start to look, I look into it where I'm like, what do these two groups of people know that 
modern science has yet to verify or even look into. And sure enough, when multiple cultures are using uh, tobacco uh, or nicotine or some kind of extract from tobacco leaf uh, for two very similar purposes, there's something there for the science that has, you know, when modern Western science has investigated it, almost all of these uses have some evidence for effectiveness. They're not all safe, <laughs> to be fair. Um, putting a paste of you know, nicotine-laden tobacco on your child for their eczema is not necessarily a safe thing to do. But modern science, usually you know, Western science specifically, does this often. They eventually, after uh, deriding traditional medicine constantly for decades or centuries, someone will finally look into it, figure out that there's something there, extract the most potent element from the plant or herb or whatever it is, call it something else, and then put it into pharmaceutical products. And the rest of the world has no idea that another group of people had been using it for that purpose. And they will continue to say, you're witchcraft. Like, this is happening to tribes in, in certain countries in Africa uh, where they've been using products. And they, they, the tribes are a minority in that group. And they are subjugated and marginalized. And they're, they're, their traditional medicine, the traditional healers, are, are called witchcraft practitioners. But you know, one of the, Ibogaine is a drug I'm sure some of you might have heard of that is showing extreme promise for treating dependency disorders, addiction. And that is what that tribe has been using it for in traditional therapies and traditional ceremonies for a very long time. And eventually that, that therapy will make it into, make it past the gatekeepers. This is one of the things I talk a lot about in my presentation is <clears throat> Western science's perspective, the bias or the lens it comes at world health from, and it's, it's Western, it's objective. They want to see science, they want to see data, they want to see centuries of data sometimes, um, before they will say, okay, we accept this, and we're going to give it to this pharmaceutical company. Uh, then they're not interested in cultures that have been practicing certain things, uh, whether that's um, using tobacco in traditional Ceremonies that have nothing to do with health, it's just spiritual, you know, not physical health, but spiritual health. Or whether it's that cup of chicken noodle soup that your spouse makes for you when you have a cold, which, you know, people would say that's just, you know, mother's wisdom, but now there's actual signs that there actually is a physical effect of chicken noodle soup uh, on immunity, on the immune response. So I could, I, I suggest if you want to hear more about the tribal uses of tobacco or nicotine, and of course, nicotine is one constituent. There are other constituents of tobacco uh, that could be valuable for therapy and have therapeutic application. But you know, watch my video, and I hope I get some interesting questions I could delve further into. Thank you very much. I think that deserves a round of applause, don't you? Thank you, Michelle. A great segue into thinking about some of the science behind this. So um, perhaps, Paul, this is a good opportunity to come to you uh, next, if that's OK. Um, may I introduce Paul Newhouse, who's director of the Vanderbilt Center uh, for Cognitive Medicine in Tennessee. Paul. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you in Warsaw, um, but uh, I'm on the Pacific coast of the US at the moment, and it's 5 AM, so. Uh, it's early, the sun's just coming up. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my work over the last number of decades has been focused on trying to understand the role of nicotinic receptors in the brain and their role in, in brain function. And uh, I've spent the last 30 to 35 years studying nicotine and uh, its analogs uh, for its potential utility as a treatment for brain disorders. And we've studied over the years, conditions as disparate as Alzheimer's disease and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, we are still learning uh, more almost every day now about how nicotine and nicotinic systems work in the brain. And we've made tremendous progress. We've had hiccups along the way. There's been an effort over the last 25 years to try to develop nicotinic therapeutics, uh, to develop analogs of nicotine uh, that maybe are more selective or less selective for the brain, and uh, that effort continues. Um, we ourselves are very excited to be conducting 
large multi-center studies on how nicotine uh, itself extracted from tobacco may be a potential treatment for a memory loss. Uh, so we, I direct the MIND study, which stands for Memory Improvement with Nicotine Dosing. That's a 42-site multi-center trial in the United States. Uh, treating patients with uh, early memory loss, uh, the prodromal condition of Alzheimer's disease. That study is still ongoing, so uh, I can't give you any results from that as yet, but um, we are uh, continuing that study and hope to have readout of the study within about two to three years. We're almost fully enrolled uh, and we're um, continuing that research very exciting days to come. We are also studying nicotine's effects in mood disorders. Uh, there's long been a suspicion that nicotinic receptors in the brain are involved in mood regulation as well. And we, uh, my colleague Warren Taylor in my center is actively studying that with support also from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And we have some exciting preliminary data suggesting that nicotine when added to antidepressants um, in patients who are not responding well to antidepressants rapidly improves mood and cognitive function. We believe this is because it actually influences the activity of brain networks uh, in, uh, and establishes or enhances the brain's ability to process information. We have a specific hypothesis about which brain networks, um, and we hope to have validation of that data quite soon. Um, my colleague, uh, Julie Dumas at the University of Vermont has been studying the impact of nicotine's effects directly on brain systems using magnetic resonance imaging uh, scans. And during task performance, She's been able to show that nicotine uh, alters the activity of brain circuits involved in cognitive operations, such as working memory, and that uh, conversely blocking those receptors uh, with a drug that can block nicotinic receptors in the brain changes the activity in the opposite direction. She's hoping to examine the effects in older individuals versus younger individuals soon, so we should have data on that uh, over the next uh, three to six months. Finally, um, we are exploring potentially new approaches for nicotine's therapeutic uh, potential. Um, not surprisingly, we're all interested in COVID these days. And we have uh, my colleague Shizuko Morimoto at the University of Utah and I have recently proposed a large study to the NIH to um, use nicotine in conjunction with cognitive rehabilitation uh, techniques using computerized cognitive training to treat the cognitive problems associated with long COVID. And uh, we think that this is a particularly applicable um, condition to potentially treat because we think that nicotine will enhance brain plasticity um, and enhance the ability of cognitive training uh, to do its job. And so we have that proposal currently under review at the NIH and we hope to that we get a, uh, we hope to initiate those studies uh, hopefully later this year. So that's just a brief summary of, of sort of where our nicotinic research is going. Um, there's still a, a lot of exciting uh, work going on. I'm also, uh, collaborating with colleagues who are studying nicotine as a potential treatment for hearing loss. I didn't talk about this in the talk, but um, I'm, uh, there is a group at the University of California uh, campuses that are studying the potential effects of nicotine for treating uh, late life hearing loss, because we know that nicotinic receptors in the temporal cortex are involved in the hearing process and the processing of auditory information. So their work is quite exciting and hopefully we'll learn more over the next year or so. So that's just a quick quick tour over the potential 
for nicotinic therapeutics, and I'll stop there, and uh, we can discuss this further. Thank you very much, Paul. Some fascinating work there. Again, a round of applause, I think, is in order. I'm sure there'll be many questions as a result of some of the things that Paul touched on there. Just to move us on a bit further, um, Sud, perhaps we'll bring you in at this point in time. Um, may I introduce Sud Pitwarden, who's the co-founder of the Centre for Health, Research and Education in the UK. Sud. Martin, thank you so much, and uh, hello all. Uh, good to see a lot of you again from yesterday's LMIC panel. And the reason I say that is uh, it's good to have a kind of continuation of the theme in some way. But let me come back to that in a second. For those who have actually watched the video online, uh, I will just uh, not do too long an introduction to what I've said there. But the idea is very simple. Uh, I'm a trained medical doctor, so I look at nicotine and its impact on the human body from a like a doctor's perspective, having trained in uh, the physiology, the pharmacology, and the pathophysiology, and the other way around for that matter, in terms of diseases, it makes me think about nicotine in that sort of a order or that sort of a sequence. So let's, and what my request would be for all the audience here, science or non-science trained, would be to understand nicotine in the way it acts in the human body, and that's where we start with which are the receptors, and of course we have a very esteemed uh, distinguished panel here who can definitely throw more light on that in terms of their study of various receptors in the human body where nicotine does act, and a, a good subset of those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors is where the signal is transferred from across uh, the, the, the nerves in the body. And it's, it's fascinating to see how these receptors on which nicotine can act are present in various parts of the body, not just in the central nervous system or in the peripheral nervous system, but also in peripheral tissues. Uh, and that means a lot in terms of how it acts in the, in the normal physiological way uh, when it's consumed by people and what it means in terms of whether it does or does not cause certain diseases that it's ascribed to. Uh, what may be very fascinating for us is uh, the studies that, that Paul and team and some other researchers have done over the years to start with Nicotine was completely connected with the tobacco that was part of the way it was packaged and presented to the human body was in a, in a combined form. It is not being thought of as an isolated molecule, which means that a lot of the, the research, the work has been uh, kind of shrouded in the, the broader tobacco cloud, if I may use a, a mixed metaphor here. But uh, the, uh, the, the interesting approach uh, that people have taken over the years to understand, start correlating some of the epidemiological data, especially around neurodegenerative diseases has really led people to, and again, Paul, we look at some of the work you have done, and of course, uh, that has started to throw some light on it in terms of, is there a potential neuroprotective effect of nicotine uh, in current smokers or those who have potentially in the future uh, can, be, can be addressed some of the, uh, the, the issues that uh, people have over their lifetime, and can nicotine or its analogs or molecules which have a similar mode of action as nicotine on specific receptors. Uh, that's one question that scientists are dealing with, and we are looking at it uh, from a medical perspective and thinking, OK, that may provide a great opportunity. For those who have seen the video, I've presented also about the, uh, the logical one. And I'm sure, Ricardo, you're going to throw some light on this. But let me just give my one liner on that, which is 1.1 billion people smoking cigarettes around the world including other combustible forms of tobacco. Another 250 million people consuming oral tobacco products, equally toxic given the way they are manufactured in countries such as India and, and South Asia generally. Um, the benefits of nicotine in, in this population is quite self-evident. And I keep on making this point that, look, we could just get away from this session saying, look, if we can ensure that cleaner forms of safer, cleaner forms of nicotine are made available to these consumers with the right information, uh, I think the potential benefit of nicotine can be very clearly realized around the world, and we could just get on with it. Having said that, I think there is a whole range of neurological conditions where nicotine can be potentially beneficial, especially if we can take it away from its packaging around uh, the fact that it's combined with tobacco in the way it's currently consumed. And that's what I was hoping we would talk in this session, so hopefully we'll have a bit of conversation about it. I'll finish with one thing, though. And for those who know me and my work over the last 15, 20 years, the first, I believe, the first big survey I was involved in doing uh, and publishing was around the perceptions around nicotine. And I keep on bringing this back because we can have all the best conversation about benefits of nicotine, either uh, possible potential or proven benefits. What really comes in the way of this narrative is this wild, widely prevalent misconception that nicotine in tobacco products causes cancer. 
And I, I keep on highlighting this in every opportunity I get because our work in the UK uh, at the Center for Health Research and Education and in India with clinicians, the people that we talk to in our work, is about, first of all, identifying, documenting this, what I call nicotine illiteracy, and then actually actively working with them to take them from the point of this misperception, this misconception, to a point of nicotine confidence. And any work we do and we discuss here today in terms of current and future potential benefits of nicotine for, for, for humankind, I think has to be also contextualized in how can and should we, and all those here and beyond here, uh, who understand the, the, the benefits of nicotine, how can we play a role in educating key opinion leaders and ultimately the consumers of nicotine on the very fact that it is not the one that causes the cancer for tobacco products, and it has potential benefits. So I think getting the narrative right on nicotine is going to be something that all have to invest in. It's not going to be easy because decades of miscommunication around nicotine, nicotine equals tobacco equals cigarettes equals cancer equals death, has been uh, propagated uh, willfully, willfully or not is not the point. The point is it is there. 70% of GPs in Sweden, UK, India, that we have documented, Greece with one of my research collaborators, and USA, which you have seen last year from the Steinberg paper, consistent. One thing if that is consistent globally is the nicotine misperception, and that's very unfortunate. We need to change that narrative, and then we can have a real proper discussion on benefits of nicotine. So that's a prerequisite. I hope that we have a bigger conversation around that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sid. Thank you. I am sure we'll pick up on the theme of framing the narrative. I think that's, that's probably one of the key factors that, that we'll get into in, in part of the discussion. Now, lastly, may I introduce um, Ricardo Pelosa, who's the founder of the Centre for the Acceleration of Harm Reduction in Italy. Ricardo. Hello there. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm a doctor, and I started my medical profession as a doctor. And as a doctor, I immediately realized that what was the problem with smoking and what was the opportunity with smoking prevention. So long time ago, uh, it was around 20 years ago, I started the first uh, smoking cessation center in Italy. Actually, in Sicily, sorry. Now it's the third most active in, in Italy. Trying to do what the... Uh, the health regulators were not doing basically prevention. And I discovered something really interesting that in the course of uh, the cessation, there were so many things changing in the pathophysiology of the people with diseases. So I decided to uh, involve more and more of my time in uh, substantiating the um, evidence for harm reversal. Harm reversal is a concept that applies to smoking cessation, but more so to harm reduction, if you think about it. Because when substituting a product that can still provide the enjoyment that Michelle was talking about, in somebody who would really like to get, get rid of the cigarette, but still has that sort of attachment, emotional attachment, psychological attachment, physical attachment to the product, the only solution it was just there, harm reduction. And the harm reduction became a reality uh, about 10 years ago in Italy, when I, we first ran the first randomized control trial with electronic cigarette. And my first thought in the first month of the study was, wow, we'll be out of business if these products are going to work the right way. Because, of course, we were talking about early generation products and they were not extremely, extremely effective. But nevertheless, because these were smokers that were not intending to quit, we had uh, uh, modest to good results. So our activities at the Center of Excellence uh, for the acceleration of arm reduction, now is concentrating in systematically trying to provide evidence for harm reversal. Anything can be harm reversed if you intervene in time. Meaning, if I quit smoking when I'm 40, I will basically offset all the damage that I've accumulated in the previous years of smoking. But if I stop smoking when I'm 80, there's very little to be salvaged. 
So the electronic cigarette, even in that case, offers a great, great opportunity, and I'm sure all of you agree, because most of the switches switch in the age 20, 30, 40. This is a fantastic window of opportunity. In that particular area, we started to work with people with pre-existing smoking-induced diseases, people with COPD, for example, and we were to able to show even the longest follow-up of five years is the longest follow-ups, clinical follow-ups of people using electronic cigarettes, five years, and we were able to show consistent, long-standing improvement in quality of life. Quality of life is important for patients. Number of yearly exacerbation from uh, uh, the disease, respiratory exacerbation from the disease, which is very common in people with COPD. Improvement in, uh, in the respiratory function, and also improvement in uh, exercise tolerance, meaning that my level of fitness was increasing. All these elements were also confirmed in studies in asthmatic subjects, where we saw improvement in quality of life, improvement in uh, lung function, and improvement in the rate of uh, respiratory exacerbation. Uh, we also delve into other studies in people with high blood pressure and being able to show that even people with high blood pressure were improving the level of systolic blood pressure in time, uh, over time. Uh, what about people without overt smoking-related uh, diseases? We start uh, uh, in the, in, 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 you know, working with, let's call it healthy smokers, okay? It's very difficult to substantiate improvement in healthy smokers. Why? Because they're already healthy, so there's nothing really to measure. I, I mean, nothing to measure if we rely on the standard study endpoints we use in clinical trials. For example, a spirometry in an healthy smoker is gonna be normal at baseline, so there's very little to see over time. However, we'll be able to identify a number of very early uh, health effect indicators that they are now showing that even in healthy smokers you can um, measure something that can improve when you switch over time. So the, the, to cut a long story short, because I can talk for hours about this argument, and I'm sure it's gonna be an element of, of the discussion, I can just uh, add another benefit to, uh, this is a logical benefit, using nicotine as a treatment for smoking-related disease. This can be a, a topic. Another topic is using uh, nicotine uh, or nicotine from electronic cigarettes to manage weight, and particularly to manage post-cessation weight gain, which is a big crux, particularly for smo uh, women smokers that really want to quit. And that's one of the reasons why they really are quite reluctant to quit, because they're fearful about putting up weight. But electronic cigarette seems to be also one of those solutions to the problem. More later. Thank you very much indeed. You, you hold on to that. Okay. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, lots of food for thought there. Um, I got a couple of questions myself, but uh, there's a saying that says, if you tell me something, I'll forget it. If you show me something, I might remember it, but if you involve me in something, I'm going to understand it. So this is our opportunity to involve you in the discussion and debate from some of the themes that, that our colleagues have emerged. Yes, there's a question right from the middle there. Hello. Um, I've uh, never been a smoker and never been a vapour. But last week, I decided from my own reading that I was going to start using nicotine. And so last week I did in the form of nicotine pouches. And essentially I've been using one every day now and I've already in, in a handful of days noticed that I'm, you know, when I use it, I'm much more alert, I can focus, etc. And in talking to a few people here, I've also heard that there can be benefits of nicotine use for uh, weight loss for postmenopausal women in terms of weight reduction and metabolism, etc. And 
pe perhaps my question is to more to Paul. Um, is there, or any of you, is there any truth in that or any, any science that I can read on that as well? Thank you. Paul, do you want to respond to that first? So there are certainly anecdotal reports that people uh, who are non-smokers using nicotine will notice uh, enhanced ability to pay attention or be alert. Um, I would only caution that that data is anecdotal uh, rather than um, uh, been done carefully. What we, what others, uh, not so much us, but others have shown is that if you treat people who are functioning normally cognitively uh, in terms of their cognitive abilities with nicotine, you actually do not generally see an improvement. Um, and this is because uh, nicotine actually works on a sort of upside down U-shaped curve in terms of function. And so if you're working near the top of your game, nicotine isn't necessarily going to enhance that. It may actually push it over the other side and actually impair performance. Um, whereas if you're operating at a lower level of abilities, uh, nicotine may actually bring you up more towards an optimum setting. So you can think of nicotine as kind of optimizing brain function. Um, so we have generally not encouraged people who are cognitively normal to start nicotine because we don't have any evidence that it's all that helpful. That being said, uh, this has not been studied chronically, um, but mo mainly in sort of acute single dose studies. Um, and so we don't really have a lot of data on nicotine's ability to help people who are cognitively normal a function over the long term? That's an interesting question. As for weight loss, I think I'd have to uh, pitch that to Ricardo. Ricardo? I just wanted to, um, to add a little bit of things of what Paul just said. I mean, we're not su suggesting that uh, Jeannie is uh, subnormally cognitive, I hope. Uh, uh, but I agree with Paul, we really need the good quality uh, studies on naive nicotine people that never used nicotine before, because most of the literature, and Paul is surely very knowledgeable about this, is full of uh, people who have been already exposed to nicotine. So anything we say is a sort of uh, reconditioning about whatever we then, then tend to move. And I would be very, very happy to uh, link up with Paul and try to design some innovative studies in this particular area because, quite frankly, I don't see the data. I think you might just have initiated another study there, Jeannie. <laughs> just before I come back to the audience, Michelle, was there something what you wanted to... Because in your presentation, you really focused heavily, not just in the... Well, less so in the physiological, you know, benefits and changes, but more in the emotional and psychological. So is there anything you'd like to add? And as someone who has a master's degree in nutrition, which most people would never know because I almost never write about nutrition, uh, I, f I feel like, you know, like most things in life, uh, particularly with nutrition, and we're talking about weight, it's so personal. It's so dependent on a person's circumstances at the moment of their life, not just their genetics and over their, the course of their life, but, you know, with weight, weight gain or weight loss, it is, a lot of it is psychological, right? It's about, I hate the word willpower, and I like the word bandwidth, mental bandwidth. And so, you know, if you are a person who has, for example, ADHD, or you're going through menopause and it's causing some, some sorts of extra stress, psychological or cognitive, and nicotine helps you with that, that in turn would allow you to be more, make more conscientious food choices, to have more energy to be active. Uh, if you have mood disorders as well, you know, if you, have, if you find you have menopause-related mood disorders, depression, something like that, and nicotine helps you with that, that is very likely going to impact your ability to control your weight. I think there was a secondary or a follow-up question. The gentleman there just at the, the end, and then I'll come to you next. Yep, thank you. Hi, I'm Carl Fagerström. To start on the anecdotal uh, level here, uh, there is a lot of uh, jockeys, not disc jockeys, but horse jockeys uh, that is smoking. 
and there is also a lot of ballet dancers uh, doing the same. Eh? Uh, but we do not have any control research from the areas, whether it's real or not, uh, the eff effect of nicotine. However, there are some laboratory well-controlled studies. Hofstetter is one that looked at during the 90s at uh, the energy uh, turnover from smoking, and smoking certainly increased the energy turnover. During my Life with nicotine replacement products and, and before that running a smoker's clinic, you certainly see that smokers that stop go, gain weight. So what is the reason for that? Yeah, there are several reasons, of course, when they cannot put the cigarette in the mouth, they usually put some, something else in the mouth, but the cigarette and nicotine might also do something. Anyway, so in the pharma company, we were looking at the see if uh, the nicotine replacement products could reduce the weight gain. And what happened was that the patch didn't seem to be effective at all, more or less. While the nicotine nasal spray seemed to be, have some of an effect on the reduced weight gain. So my hypothesis here is that I think there might be pharmacodynamic differences between a pulsatile administration of nicotine and a more even concentration that the system regulating weight get tolerance to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I assume that was more of an observation than if, a question. If, yes, um, and if I add to uh, Carl. Carl, that's an excellent observation. I think that what we see in our studies using electronic cigarettes in people trying to quit quitting smoking is exactly that. Not only you have a nicotine generating pacifier, so you're, you're adding your nicotine, so you're maintaining your metabolic rate uh, uh, stabilized, you're keeping your mouth busy, you're not snacking, but also you have that particular pattern of, uh, of uh, uh, nicotine intake, which may account for what you just said and uh, was generated from your earlier studies. So that's the reason why when you switch uh, to complete uh, uh, cigarette abstinence, you don't see that much post-cessation weight gain for that particular reason. I'm I will sure say that, that, that um, I don't know where you guys... For 34 years, sorry, Paul. Uh, um, go ahead. I haven't been a smoker for 34 years and have stopped. I think I've, I've put quite a bit of weight on since. So, um, sorry, Paul, on you go. Um, so we do see weight loss, uh, uh, Carl, in our, I think you know this data very well. Uh, we do see weight loss as a, a reliable effect of nicotine in non-smokers. It's about two to three kilograms usually uh, in a chronic study and it tends to stabilize uh, after about that. So uh, we do see it as a reliable effect of transdermal uh, nicotine in our studies of, um, of non-smokers. Cool, thank you. Gentlemen there have been waiting for some time, so just here in the front. Hi, my name is Andrew Manson. Uh, I've been working uh, for a while at looking uh, with a, a psychologist at some of the beneficial effects of nicotine. And uh, there's clear evidence that a lot of um, sportsmen and women are using nicotine um, covertly uh, to increase their focus and their concentration, which relates to something that, that Jeannie said. And there has been some scientific studies, I, I can provide the citation for this, uh, with archery athletes um, that um, in a balanced controlled study, uh, half given nicotine and half uh, not, and these were not former nicotine users, that they, they, <laughs> they performed better, significantly better, with the um, enhancement of nicotine to such an extent that the World Anti-Doping Agency is, is looking as to whether nicotine should be controlled with regard to um, uh, athletics and other sports events. It's a, it's a very important cognitive enhancer. 
It explains why in the days when uh, you were allowed to smoke indoors, all poker players smoked, all snooker players smoked, all darts players smoked. It's because it enhances focus and enhances performance. Thank you. There's a gentleman at the back there that, that has his hand up a few times. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, the first off on the on the weight control issue, every ballerina for the past 100 years has known that smoking helps to keep the weight off. So, uh, Jeannie, you may have a, a future career change coming. <laughs> and but their smoking rates were very high. My name is Charles Gardner, I'm with INCO. I'm a developmental neurobiologist by training, so this area, this issue is very uh, interesting to me. Just a couple of comments. One, the National uh, Academies of Sciences in the United States produced a comprehensive report on the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids in 2018. I believe it's reprehensible that we don't have a comparable full study of that kind, looking at all of the literature on the health effects, good and bad, on, on nicotine and its dependence forming characteristics. So the other thing to uh, mention relevant here is that I spent some time last year interviewing the heads of patients advocacy groups in the neurodiversity area and in Parkinson's disease. So ADHD, autism, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, Tourette's syndrome, um, and they're potential partners. Uh, but what I found among the leaders of these organizations is that they have very little knowledge of smoking the, or the fact that their, their community is smoking at a, in extraordinarily high rates. So with adults with ADHD and autism, it's 40% in the United States. Among adults with, ADH, with bipolar disorder, it's 60%. Schizophrenics, 71% are smoking. And the leading hypothesis is that they're self-medicating. I approached all of them um, from that perspective. It was really a discussion about smoking because they have all of the same misconceptions that the general public does about nicotine. And what I found is that they are completely ignorant of their own community's high smoking rates and of the potential therapeutic benefits of nicotine, which have been shown with uh, controlled, generally small, but controlled trials with nicotine patches um, that uh, benefit people with ADHD and so on. The one thing that stood out for me was when I uh, had a conversation with the president of the American Parkinson's Disease Foundation, because the first words out of his mouth before I had said anything was, oh yeah, nicotine is neuroprotective. Let, let, let's try and get a couple of questions, and let me start that a wee bit. I mean, if, if we respect the science, um, we understand the stigma associated with nicotine that you touched on, Sud. How do you frame the narrative? How do you change the narrative? And who is your target audience? Uh, Martin, I think you can read my mind. <laughs> uh, really, I think I was, uh, I'm very glad that Charles brought up the, uh, the point about the neuroprotective effects of nicotine, but also, uh, a very strong case in terms of uh, the neurodiverse populations and the, 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 the very well-documented high tobacco consumption rates among those smoking specifically. I, and I don't want to mix the words here myself when I say tobacco consumption rates because uh, there is no data to my knowledge from the use of smokeless tobacco and how high its use is in, uh, in South Asian populations. But for sure, smoking and the rates you mentioned, Charles, uh, is, is well established. To your question, Martin, how do we kind of how does the narrative now change in terms of understanding nicotine without its association with tobacco in this context? Uh, I can give an example of what we're doing currently at the Center for Health Research and Education. Uh, we are working with one of the largest private mental health hospitals in the UK uh, across 80 sites, uh, and these have inpatient and outpatient uh, facilities. And the biggest hurdle, of course, we, uh, we, had, we had documented that to begin with was the, the, the very fact that patients, of course, have high uh, incident of incidents of smoking, but also the healthcare practitioners in these hospitals uh, were not very comfortable prescribing nicotine replacement or just doing anything in terms of smoking cessation among their patients. Uh, what we like to say, uh, rather ironically and tragically, is that uh, smoking is expected and accepted in mental health hospitals and mental health settings, and that's not acceptable. 
honestly. And that's the whole approach we are taking, saying, look, how do we ensure that the healthcare practitioner prioritizes smoking cessation among their patients with the idea? There are two, two things to do there. One is to ensure that they do not have to up the doses of antipsychotics, for example. So many of the medications that people on ment with mental health conditions, many of the medications are broken down quicker by the liver because of smoke components. Let me add here, in case I send you back with wrong information, it is not the nicotine in the smoke that's causing it. It's the other components of the smoke that's causing the liver to metabolize many of the drugs much quicker. Now think of it logically. That means that the psychiatrist has to up the dose of the same medication just to achieve the same levels of the drug. And I remember in conversations with psychiatrists saying, look, what do you do about your smoker patients? Uh, very honestly, I love this about clinicians. They want to do good for their patients, for sure. They said, well, we just up the dose of the drug. I'm like, have you considered smoking cessation among, the, among those patients as a thing you also do, along with you doing uh, treatment of their presenting mental health condition? They said, no, we never do that. We just increase the dose. But no, you know what, we're going to do that henceforth. And that has been the, uh, the kind of turning point in how we try and communicate the need for getting the smoker, mental health patients off the smoking. Now, the, just to finish it off, we are also ensuring that these practitioners understand how nicotine replacement can be provided in adequate quantities and for long enough. Let's not make the, uh, let's not, we, we ensure that the doctors don't feel the need to rush to wean off their patients of nicotine and then again throw them off the cliff in terms of going back to smoking. Because relapse is the biggest problem with smoking cessation. Uh, it sounds like a logical sentence. But you know what I mean? It, it is the biggest problem with what we face in the world that hundreds and thousands and millions of people uh, have tried quitting, but they kind of go back to smoking. So if they're comfortable about nicotine replacement, and again, just to qualify, when I say nicotine replacement, I don't necessarily get stuck with gum or patch. I would say gum and or patch and or e-cigarette, whatever is legally allowed in that country, either as a pharmaceutical or a consumer good. And I think that's the way to kind of bring back nicotine in its own way and not get linked with the tobacco consumption behavior. I'll, I'll come to you in a minute, but Michelle, would you want to pick up on, on this issue of the stigma associated with, with nicotine, particularly around you know its association with tobacco, but it, focusing on changing the narrative or, or thinking about who the main target audiences. Yeah, I mean, there's two ways to go about this. There's the, the very specific narrative on nicotine. You know, the, as my other panelists, you know, I, I'm quite honored to be among these you know, gentlemen because they've already done such stellar work. And from their work, we have a lot of evidence about the clinical benefits of nicotine, you know, uh, and that work should be ongoing. But honestly, there just isn't as much research into this pharma like pharmacological agent as there should be given the vast uh, array of potential uses for it. There's very little work being done investigating the pharmacological effects of nicotine for a variety of different issues. Um, I just wanted to comment really quickly on something Sud said. You know, this is the kind of thing that public health often doesn't think about because they don't have, they observe their patients, they don't really try to understand why the behavior is, they just try and figure out how to stop the behavior. And you know, if you're talking about someone with nicotine and you have clinicians who are saying you need to not smoke, here's a nicotine replacement therapy, but nic nicotine's not good, so we gotta wean you off, we gotta cut you off. And then when someone with a mental health condition uh, leaves and then relapses, that, you know, you have the relapse, the nicotine, the smoking, and the health effects of smoking, if that's how they've decided to go back to it, but you also have a very significant mental effect from that experience, from that failure, or depending on how they view their own behavior. If uh, they lack willpower, they fail, they're, it's reinforcing some of the stigma, the internalized stigma that just the way we all talk about smoking, the way we were raised to talk about smoking and tobacco companies and tobacco and nicotine, uh, that has internalized a lot of smokers. And there are, there are quite a number of studies that show internalized stigma f among smokers is a cause of relapse, right? So if somebody feels bad about themselves, they are more likely to continue smoking, even if they feel bad because they're smoking. It's, it's this weird, vicious cycle. But you know, so the solutions, I think, obviously I would love to see a National Academies uh, of Science comprehensive study on the benefits and harms of nicotine, the effects, the medical uses, therap therapeutic uses. I don't know if or when we will ever see that. I doubt it'll be in the next 10 years, but hey, you know, it's worth pitching it to them to put out a grant for or something. Um, but then there's kind of a different argument, a broader argument, a more, uh, uh, the argument that health is so complex, we are not just a collection of body parts. We are not just a collection of conditions or lack thereof. Uh, 
we should have the right to decide what is therapeutic in our life, right? What, what is the benefit we get out of something? What, what do we need to feel as if we are experiencing well-being? And I think, uh, I talked about this in my presentation, I kind of ended the talk this way, that I think one of the greatest benefits of nicotine, specifically nicotine now divorced from tobacco in palatable, consumer-friendly uh, modes like e-cigarettes or snooze or nicotine pouches, is that it is it has opened the gates. It has thrown the gate, gate, gatekeepers aside and given people control over their own health, their smoking cessation uh, journey, whatever you want to call it. And that perception of yourself, self-control, of self-efficacy is huge for all types of health outcomes. This idea that I, I have the ability to understand my body, what, what makes me feel better, what m gives me better health, and I have access to those things and can do it. Uh, so I think that's a really important thing I think we need to be talking about is this idea that stigma has real physical health effects on people as well as mental. If, if you haven't already looked to the presentations, I would urge you to do so. Michelle focuses a lot on the pleasure aspect of, of nicotine, receiving nicotine. Brent, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, Bengt Viberg, Swedish snooze guy. I'd like to uh, I discuss something with Dr. Is this on? <laughs> with Dr. Sud last night, but I think everybody deserves to hear it. Uh, Sweden is in the forefront yet again when it comes to databases. There is now, during 2022, introduced a dentistry tobacco, the Swedish tobacco cohort. So what's so special with this? Everybody, I would say, in Sweden, go to the dentist once a year. Now, every patient will be asked if you are a smoker, if you are a snooze user, if you are a nicotine pouch user or an e-cigarette user, or if you are a non-nicotine user. So what's the benefit of this database? Well, the benefit is we have databases. We have patient database. We have cancer registry. We have a mortality register. We have a COVID-19 register. So this database collected by every dentist in Sweden will be able for scientists to correlate, uh, make regression analyst, uh, analytics to see actually what we are talking about here, the benefits of nicotine. Uh, I think in most other countries, uh, people might ask, do you use tobacco? So there's a great difference in risk between smoking tobacco or having a snooze or an e-cigarette. So within a year, I would say, look out for the Swedish tobacco cohort. Anyone wants to ask more about it, see me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Clive, I'll come to you. See you in the corner there. Up, up, right. Just at the corner of the wall. Hi, Clive Bates. Um, so, you know, when I first started in, like, tobacco control, I sort of consulted the, the giants of the field, or what I thought were the giants of the field, and they told me there's no functional benefits at all from using nicotine. It's an illusion. It's actually people experiencing cr the relief of craving and withdrawal, and that makes them feel less stressed and uh, concentrate better because they're not distracted by craving and withdrawal. Now, if you actually talk to people, they'll say, well, it does help me feel less stressed, less anxious. Uh, it does help me concentrate. There are functional benefits. It does sort of help me sort of regulate my mood. Where's the truth in all of this? Mm. Ricardo, would you want to kick off with that? Thank you, Clive. It's, uh, it's the question I keep asking myself. You refer to people with previous nicotine dependence. Mm -hmm. My question is, you know, it's more targeted to people who never acquired a nicotine dependence. So there's no question about relief of craving, relief of withdrawal symptoms, and things like that. Uh, I just said at the beginning, this is an area that needs to, need, needs to be investigated because the, there's very lack and scarcity of data. 
For those who have already acquired the nicotine dependence, we know all the benefits. You just mentioned those. Have I answered your question, uh, um, Clyde? Well, the thing is, Ricardo, m m the argument that's been put to me, and it was, you know, I'll be honest, it was by Robert West, who knows a thing or two, you know, is that these benefits are an illusion, that they are, they are essentially the relief of, a, of, of a, a craving and a withdrawal. So, so they feel like they're benefits, but they're not actually benefits. Now, I've become much more skeptical about that claim over time, uh, because I think if you talk to people, you do they do report that these things are beneficial. The rewards are genuine rewards. Uh, and I'm surprised uh, Robert West said something like that because there's such a huge literature mm. showing the beneficial impact of uh, nicotine, nicotine through cigarettes mainly, okay? Uh, in those who are abstaining from cigarette overnight, you will see the huge impact on, uh, on craving and uh, withdrawal symptoms. So. For Let those people, there's a clear beneficial effect. But I think when the multinational are asking what is the role of, um, of nicotine as a recreational drug, I refer to a completely different population, meaning people who never been in contact with nicotine. For example, now we have many young vapors who never smoked in their life. But I also see the statistics from the United States. They reached 21% prevalence in 2019, and now they are down to 11%. Okay, I know there are problems with collection of the data throughout the pandemics, but this to me clearly indicates that the level of dependence is not that high as it's portrayed. To me, it's a naturalistic example that uh, you're not hooked on nicotine because you can get away with that. Paul, I'd like to bring yeah. you in here. Would you like to respond yeah. to the sort of fundamental point? that? Yeah, I no, I, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I think the answer is likely somewhere in the middle that um, people just aren't the same, right? There are some people whose cognitive and emotional functioning is going to be positively impacted by nicotine. And there are many people whose functioning will be either worsened or have no benefit at all. And I think it's just not a one size fits all um, or a, a simple conclusion that it's illusory. I think that that conclusion itself is illusory. There are clearly people who will benefit from nicotinic stimulation uh, in their brains uh, who will function better with that. And there are many people who won't get benefit. And that's part of the answer to how we can sort out whether nicotine should be available as a consumer product. The reality is that many people will not need this and will not benefit from it, but there will be clearly a portion of people who do. And that sort of heterogeneity of neural functioning, we should just accept that. I Paul, can, I, can I quickly, very quick, could, Go on, could, Paul, w wouldn't you expect in that case the subset of people who get a functional benefit from it to be the people who select in to being the users, either as vapors or as smokers? In, in other I words, would. the consumption would, would yeah. concentrate on those people and, and it wouldn't be the people who get no benefit from it who use exactly. it because they get no benefit from it. With such a exactly. I, I, think that's, I think that's exactly right. And we're seeing this probably in these consumer use patterns, uh, which people self-select for those who get benefit from nicotine um, and the people who don't, don't choose to use it. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing. Yeah. People self-select to drink coffee if they like it or if they don't. And Genie self-select to use nicotine. I also use the pouch but I got all the aversive uh, effects, so I'm not self-selecting myself to pouch. So we're talking about humans. We are all different, and as Paul just said, the truth stands in the middle. With such a strong association with tobacco, it makes the subject matter even more complex in many respects, and, and therefore potentially reinforces the stigma. Let's try and get another question here. 
This gentleman here has tried a few times. I'll come to you next if that's okay. This gentleman in the front row here. And after that question, we'll come to the lady next to him. So, Michel, I think uh, what you say initially is uh, very, very interesting. It's how do we change and view the use of nicotine as pleasure, like coffee or like chocolate. I'm, I'm addicted. I've been smoking for 45 years, and I will refuse completely to stop. I just love the experience of smoking. I also bake. I'm also addicted to run. I'm a marathon runner. So in both cases, I need it. I crave it. How this can change, if we look at it differently, not as an stigma, how can that change or help in harm reduction? Can we change this look this the way people would view your choice to continue smoking and stigmatize it yeah How or, or in the overall harm reduction if we change the paradigm paradigm and start looking at this as yes you are addicted you are addicted to a pleasurable substance i think it will move the needle in a different direction and make more progress well this is why mm -hmm. i focus so much in my presentation on traditional medicine is that because i think nobody should be making the choice of how someone else lives their life, whether it's, you know, as long as the person is aware of the risks, it's perfectly fine for public health to tell people what the risks are of a thing and to try and hold companies accountable, you know, obviously not put something out that's acutely toxic, but otherwise, health and wellness, a happy, that, that is a happy life, right? That is what, you cannot have wellness if you are unhappy and don't have the ability to choose your own path in life. You're not well, you are just controlled. Uh, you may be healthy, you might live to be 80 years old, but is that wellness? I don't know. But I think the way to move the needle is, unfortunately, kind of an ideological or more principled argument that isn't just based on tobacco harm reduction. It includes drugs harm reduction. It includes you know, uh, eating fatty foods, being a little overweight if you choose, you know, if, if you don't have control over it. Some people can't choose. But I mean, this idea that public health authorities they can give us advice, but they should not be able to control the choices that people make. They're, that's not their job. Their job is to give people information so they can make informed choices about how they want to live their life. So I think this idea that pleasures have been stigmatized, meaning they've become a moral issue, like moderate drinking is a moral issue now, eating sugar is a moral issue, eating meat is a moral issue, and I think Unfortunately, some of this needs to be fought. The way to fight back at this is to assert autonomy. Is to say, no, I have a right, it is a human right for me to decide what I do with my body, what kind of health I pursue, how much I'm willing to give up to get something else, whether that's pleasure or health. Can I come to the lady next to you there? Thank you. Hello? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's any debate that nicotine helps people who have mental health issues, people who have schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, trauma. I think, well, actually there is a debate because we have a situation in the United States where the Truth Initiative has launched a campaign called Depression Stick. And so they hold up a vaping product and they call it Depression Stick. And they're saying nicotine actually causes depression. And if you smoke or you vape, you have to stop and then your depression or, or whatever, whatever your mental health issue is. And so that, that's a real problem, right? And so I know, Ricardo, you're doing research with people with schizophrenia and nicotine, if you could talk about that. And is it worth thinking about doing trials with nicotine and some of these medications that are used for depression and anxiety and ADHD, because we know people who have attention deficit issues, nicotine can really, really help. Is it worth doing trials with SSRIs or other medications alongside nicotine to see how, how what, what are the differences? Does nicotine work better? And then one quick question for, for you, Paul Newhouse. I just want to say thank you so much for your work. I've read some of your studies, and they say you use nicotine patches with your, uh, in your studies. I, I don't know if you, you still do that, but why don't you use vaping products? Why don't you give the people in your studies vaping products to do the study? Thank you. Yeah, Paul, would you want to take that first? 
Sure. Uh, well, that's a pretty easy one. <laughs> Vaping products uh, weren't available when we started this work. Um, and vaping, uh, if you can cast your mind back before the pandemic, uh, there was a vaping crisis, right? Because there were these children who were vaping products and were ending up in the hospital. And it was actually quite controversial. It actually caused a dip in our ability to actually enroll people in uh, nicotine uh, trials because of the association with this. Um, the other reason that we don't use nicotine uh, vaping products is because, because we're using it as a pharmaceutical, we have to have tight control of dosing and plasma levels. And uh, we, don't, we don't have any way, we don't have any preliminary data on how to do that with vaping products. So um, in the short run, we stick to patch because we know how to dose it. We know how to uh, up titrate and down titrate people. We know it's not associated with any you, any risk of addiction or, um, uh, or or reinforcing effects, and so we think it's very safe. Um, but that doesn't mean that in the future uh, studies could not use could possibly use vaping uh, as a way of administering nicotine. I think uh, in terms of psychiatric illness such as schizophrenia, that might be a very reasonable thing to do. Ricardo, do you want to respond to the first point? Well, actually, that's exactly what we're doing. We completed a couple of years ago a study on 40 people with schizophrenia, and they were on their usual antipsychotic treatment, including SSRIs. The interesting uh, findings were that 40% of these people were able to quit completely smoking by using uh, you know, a 5.6% uh, uh, electronic cigarette, so a very strong dose cigarette. But uh, to me, what was most interesting was that there were no decompensation of their psychotic symptoms during the trial, and some of the doctors reduced the level of those antipsychotic. So overall, uh, we were improving their quality of life, reducing the number of, of the antipsychotic drugs. Of course, there was a pilot study of 40, uh, 40 subjects, and we are now trying to replicate uh, this experience in uh, uh, international uh, multi-center randomized control trial in three states, in three countries of 225 schizophrenic patients. Stuart, did you want yeah, to make a quick point and very, come to the gentleman? Thanks. Yeah, a very quick point, Helen. I think that's a great point about how some of the campaigns more recently are trying to conflate intentionally tobacco smoke-associated harms versus those of effects of uh, nicotine-containing electronic cigarettes. I think it's just a very cheeky and I think completely unacceptable way of trying to, again, go back to the old narrative of this equals this equals this. It's all kind of trying to just put in one bucket. And that's rather, uh, that, that's, the, that's the challenge we face in how we communicate with doctors, that they're already seeing such miscommunication even now as we speak. And, and I think uh, there's a big opportunity for all those who care about this, including consumers, healthcare practitioners, and companies, really, to, uh, to challenge it the moment it comes out, which happens in some cases. You guys do it. I think more needs to happen. And, and it, it's just a continuous pushback, unfortunately. Further developments have gone. I'm afraid we've only got about five or ten minutes left, and, and I'm very conscious I'd like to bring in a, a question from our online audience. But before doing so, would, do you want to ask your question, sir? Can I please? So, this is Mohammed Sarkar from Altria. Um, I was wondering whether the panel has a point of view on the impact of nicotine on the developing brain and, you know, adolescence. I know that's the focus is on adults, but what does the panel think about? Uh, the developing brain. One for Paul and Ricardo, I think. A very quick one on that. First off, I, I don't want to minimize the problem, but most of the data is generated from animals. Point number two, if we assume that all this brain has been altered, what would have happened to a whole generation of smokers in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s today? Are those more? Uh, amenable to uh, 
the neurodegeneration? I don't think so. Actually, it happens to be exactly the opposite. There is some evidence that smokers are more protected from Parkinson's disease, for example. So, I mean, there are no specific studies that have been designed to answer that question, but annoys me to hear some expert keeping this, repeating the mantra, oh, the, the brain damage, the brain damage. Of course, you don't expose children to nicotine, you don't expose children to caffeine, you don't expose children to drugs, even medication sometimes. You, you need to be very uh, aware of that. And going back to the depression stick, I think this is gonna be an autogol. And uh, they, 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 they're, they're making fool of themselves at, the, uh, at that uh, organization. What was the name again? Uh, I tend to forget. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, would you like to add anything there? I mean, I don't really have a lot to add. I think uh, the data on nicotine in children is very, very minimal. Um, we did one study about 25 years ago, a laboratory-based study with single doses of nicotine in, in some children who had ADHD to look at the effect on a particular cognitive um, symptom. Uh, but uh, at this point, I, I think, as Ricardo said, I think the question is moot. I don't think we're gonna be exposing children to nicotine and, um, and I think uh, it's still going to be discouraged. Indeed, indeed. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I'd like, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry today. I'm gonna to take a question from our online audience. Um, and I guess it's one for all of you, so you, you'll have to be concise in your answer, but um, this is from Rob. I, I learned a lot about nicotine um, and I'm a consumer, not a patient. What do you see as the main takeaway in helping us safeguard nicotine products as a consumer product to enjoy? Do you, do you understand the question? Give me a second to think about that one. Okay, Ricardo, would you like to respond first? A takeaway. Yeah? Paul? Not everyone you can know, pass I, in this one. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I come back to this heterogeneity among people. There are people who will benefit from nicotine. There are people who won't. And I think we have to allow the possibility of people to use nicotine safely in a way that will people can self-select for whether it benefits them or not. I, I'll take that on as well. And I'm going to link back to what Clive asked. I think historically there's been lack of, I mean, I keep on saying nicotine confidence, but I think it also goes back to the history of the tobacco industry and how they would have answered questions about nicotine's effect, uh, starting with not saying it was addictive to begin with, and then not talking about what effects it might have. It's gone kind of like a pendulum. I think we are now understanding that nicotine definitely, there is potential role of nicotine in consumers like the one who's putting out there. Uh, I think the science around using just nicotine, and it's, it's, it's very, uh, we're in a good place where there are products in the market which are just clean nicotine without the accompanying smoke toxicants that come with the smoke. So there is potential for big tobacco companies, small e-cigarette companies, pouch companies to actually invest in the research now with ex-smokers who are now using these products and follow them for a time and do proper control studies to see what is the, the benefit of nicotine in these consumers. And I think that should hopefully clear some of the, the smoke around the, uh, the, the effects of nicotine vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, tobacco smoke and the, uh, and the misconceptions around nicotine, really. Did you want to add, Michelle? No, I mean, I think the cat's out of the bag uh, in, in terms of nicotine always has been, honestly, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. People have implicitly, cultures have been implicitly aware of the benefits of nicotine or, you know, but unfortunately through tobacco. Uh, the takeaway is just I think you have to keep fighting for your right to make these decisions. And going back to the previous panel on academic freedom, we're not even allowed to ask these questions. That's one of the reasons studies aren't being done including among children, for example, with seizure disorders, where there is some compelling but mostly anecdotal evidence about the therapeutic benefits that nicotine might have for seizure disorders. But it's it, because it is so controversial, because you have groups like Truth and Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, uh, Freedom-Free Kids, whatever you want to call them, uh, that 
people aren't studying this stuff. We don't have the answers. And I think everybody who uses nicotine, regardless of the product, wants those answers. Though, you know, the folks who use these products are the ones most interested in getting those answers about how much risk, what are the risks, where are the benefits, who, who does this benefit? It takes me back to the, the very first session this morning about follow the science, really, in many respects, which was a strong message coming out. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very sorry that I've not had the opportunity uh, to come to some of the, those, of, uh, those of you that wanted to ask questions, but um, our panellists here have been um, on the stage for an hour and 15 minutes, um, and I'd, I'd like you to take this opportunity to show your appreciation and uh, give them a round of applause. And just to conclude, thank you very much all to you for participating in what was a very informative and interesting session. And Jeannie, we look forward to hearing how you got on in your ballerina career in due course. So thank you very much, folks.
Hi. Can anyone?
Uh. Welcome to our uh, last panel of today on tobacco industry transformation, myth or reality. I think we've got some, some really interesting panelists for you to hear from. Thank you all very much for, for your commitment in making time for this today. Uh, I'm going to run through some, some very brief biographies to start with. Um, first up, Sasha Sedan. Sasha worked for quite a few years as a fund manager in the City of London, uh, became a board member and quite high profile director of investment stewardship at Legal and General uh, Investment Management, and then last year moved to the UK's financial regulator, the FCA, to become their first director of environment, social and governance. Hi, right, Sasha, good to see you. Um, Flora O'Kerake is the head of global regulatory insights and foresights at British American Tobacco, um, overseeing analysis of regulatory stuff across all of their 180 plus markets. And she also has responsibility for coordinating the company's policy responses to the WHO's framework convention on tobacco control, and she has a, a background in law. Uh, and then down the end there, we have Peter Stanbury, um, Dr. Peter Stanbury, uh, who's an independent political economist and sustainability consultant. Uh, he's worked with a variety of international organizations like the International Finance Corporation, the OECD, in lower and middle income countries. Uh, and amongst other projects, he's currently a strategic advisor to Nestle on their cocoa program, and he's working doing some work with uh, Japan Tobacco in Zambia and Malawi. And he mentioned to me as well that he does now and again enjoy a cigar. Uh, and then last up, me, uh, John Fell. I've worked for nearly 20 years as a financial analyst covering tobacco and uh, consumer sectors at various investment banks. And then uh, a bit under 10 years ago, set up a small investment management firm, Ash Park. And we run a fund which specializes in consumer stocks. And I need to mention that uh, we own some tobacco companies in that fund, including BAT. And having once been a social smoker, I am now a social vapor, so uh, at least we've got a little bit of consumer representation on the panel. Now, I'm going to put some questions uh, to each of the panellists in turn, and after that we'll have a, a broader discussion and some Q&A, but I was just going to put things in a little bit of context before we, um, before we turn to Sasha. So, if I can pull a slide up, I don't know whether you can help with that. Um, but I thought it was important at the start to, to discuss, or just put the context of, of, of what the global tobacco industry is. So I put this chart together. Uh, it's an estimate of the recreational nicotine and tobacco markets in cigarette equivalents. Uh, it probably heavily underestimates the size of others, uh, an informal production which we heard about yesterday in, in Sood's panel discussion. Um, but I think the, the thing to note is that the five companies commonly referred to as big tobacco, uh, I, I would guess account for about a third of total tobacco and nicotine consumption in the world. So, you know, in a way, this is, this is the first part of the industry transformation story that, that is a myth, that what's going on in companies, the large companies like BAT and PMI and Altria, reflects what's happening in the industry overall. It, it, it doesn't. But, you know, with some apologies, we're, we're going to do a panel on industry transformation which will focus on the large publicly listed companies uh, and will ignore many other parts of the industry, whether that's, you know, the US vape stores, the Chinese monopoly, the Gutka and Beedi manufacturers, or the people simply growing tobacco in their garden and smoking it in, in rolled up newspapers. But, Sasha, I, I've put this kind of slightly provocative uh, picture up of the US uh, tobacco CEOs testifying before Congress in 1994. And I think that's a, a, an image of the industry that people still have nearly 30 years on. But I'd like to ask you to start with, who is it who practically controls companies? Is it the manager or is, it, is there a more complex um, set of relationships going on, and, and what part do shareholders play? Everyone, and apologies, I can't be there. Um, I am someone who's been in the capitalist world and as an investor for many, many years, 
and a big owner of tobacco stocks over the years not now but it's important that i say that i have been absolutely overwhelmed with the way things are moving in many industries and i'm going to start with that first which is to answer your question it wasn't that long ago as a, as a fund manager i would meet some of the biggest companies in the world and they'd said they managed to to make a disposal and they didn't pay any capital gains tax and they've come to the shareholders and be very excited about such a statement now we are seeing companies say how much tax they're paying and we saw in the covid pandemic people saying voluntarily paying furlough money back to governments without being asked so i do think things are changing in quite a big way which means that who owns the company we've always thought of the milton friedman um, and shareholder primacy that's starting to change and i think that is something that is really important the reason it's changing is the owners of the assets and it's not just equities it's debt as well are the own underlying investors who are the same consumers the same people who care about things and that's happening everywhere and i've just been in the us last week and that's the same thing and the sec are looking at disclosure on climate change and, and all these things that they wouldn't have been seen doing that long ago so i do think there is definitely a change and that's why it's quite important for the tobacco industry to be thinking about this not always as a regulatory black and white line and saying how we can do things because companies are having to balance their employees their shareholders their stakeholders as well as the regulatory approach that's going on and of course the healthcare in your sector so i do think things are moving rapidly and i think it's some areas of tobacco are moving that way and others are still playing the we have to fight and defend our, our our patch and i think that's something that we can talk about in this session but i do think that, that it's not just one or the other but you've seen it in many sectors you've seen the oil and gas sector moving from not thinking it was their problem to pushing back to how do they transition and being embarrassed when some are transitioning and some aren't and that has meant that even board directors of us oil and gas companies have been removed from their board from their own shareholders so things are moving not just from their shareholders but please for the panel and everyone else it's the underlying investor that has got these beliefs and cares about things other than just profit now it might be long term profit they care about but it's not just a short term quarterly profit so as you mentioned we, we've seen a, a, a big rise in the interest uh, in investors and that they're taking in environmental social and governance factors I, I think a lot of people assume that esg investing as it called is called means not owning things that people don't like so you know tobacco arms fossil fuels sometimes alcohol etc do you think that's fair and you know what what are the different types of esg investing well first of all we've got to go back a bit this is this is a new industry but of course it's not new on the ethical side which the tobacco industry will know better than most and, and the alcohol industry will know that and the gambling industry there's been an ethical side for quite a long time jonathan you and i when we were investors and and um on the sell side you were we were talking about this there were there were always going to be exclusions and that's fine and of course as a big asset owner and as asset manager that i've done it over the past you have to you have to do what your clients want to do. I mean, that's normally quite a good selling point for a commercial organisation to listen to what your consumers and customers want, especially if they're paying you. Now, some of those want things and don't want things, but that's a very different debate. And I really want to make that clear at the beginning when we talk about ESG, the E is environmental, it's not ethics. So that gets clouded because we're now moving from a niche market where some people, and we've seen them who want certain characteristics, to more i'm with you i've got these products but i'm not happy that there's a scandal at a company and it might be a scandal in a good company or an area that people think is a good sector and of course there's no such thing as a good sector we just know that there can be good actors in any sector and they can be bad actors in any sector and i think that's the very big difference what's confusing is the money has moved into esg rapidly and you just have to go on linkedin or you just go every job is now got linked ESG, even Blackstone are hiring hundreds of people in ESG. Others are doing this in private equity 
because it's the way things are going if you want to sell things if you want to make a new product if you want to sell it back to your own industry or your other investors but this is very different to saying there should be exclusions it's simple to say that now of course the tobacco industry because of the ethics debate and for the industry which we can talk about later has been talked about very much as outside the tent but you know as well as i do and legal in general is a big owner and some of the other massive owners of tobacco are the biggest owners of assets in the world they want those companies to look after their employees they want them to pay a living wage they want them to make sure their health and safety is good they make sure that they're paying the fair amount of tax they are tobacco companies but they are still part of the responsible capitalism and they want them to play a part and quite a lot of them on that chart that you mentioned that are named are starting to do a very good job on these things and are starting to promote that of course you cannot stop some of the more ethical parts of it and we'll discuss that later but it is definitely about improving and making sure companies that you invest money in are doing what they say they're going to do most companies say that their employees are their most important asset but what does that actually mean give us examples of that and it doesn't matter which sector you're in thanks so if, if investors do want to improve companies what what tools do they have um should they be listening to a companies critics and what makes for effective engagement with management well i mean we've all been here haven't we you, you don't all just when i when i was doing my job as a, a buy side analyst and asset manager i didn't just read buy notes for a company you'd read sell notes you try and do your research you, you'd also have to have a cynical phase and i think as we've got older jobs and we've, we've all got a bit more cynical from the comments that people make to us but you have to take things and and look at them and as an investor, you have to think what's important. And so some of the biggest things that people care about in ESG, just so you know, everywhere, when I go to the US, when I'm in Singapore, Japan, certainly in Europe, they care about diversity for start. They do care about the, the employee makeup. They care about whether you're paying their supply chain on time, especially now with COVID and everything. We saw what happened with Adidas when they were paying some of their supplies in Germany and their rent late. They got lambasted and that was lambasted by the media in Germany. And that's a company that you might say makes sneakers and sports products, but they are lambasted. So you have to remember that this is the sort of thing. So it's not it's not good enough to make platitudes or have a purpose statement that doesn't have anything that's backing it up. But what you have to be able to do is say, I can't do everything. And most sectors, there are certain things that are more material to them than other things. And they should just focus on them. There's these things called the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, that people talk about. I've heard people say, I focus on all 17. How can you focus on all 17 sustainable development? I couldn't. I can't even name all 17 without having to look at a crib sheet. And I've been in this industry. So focus on the things you can, demonstrate, show how you're promoting people, how you're training people, show how you're paying your suppliers, do the things that you can do in your industry. You can't stop people being upset about what sector you're in, but you can be seen as the best in your pack, and you can be seen by most investors to be given a fair crack of the whip. And we've been very focused on tobacco today, not surprisingly, given the, the conference <laughs> title, but um, I wonder if you can say a little bit, Sasha, about other industries. Do you, do you think there are examples where investor, shareholder, pressure and messaging has actually made a difference to the way companies behave and when we look at what's going on in say autos or, or energy uh, are investors making a difference or is it other societal pressures which are driving those changes no 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 i mean i see it everywhere um and again this is newish but as i mentioned with say um Esco, the, one of the largest food retailers in the world, paying 400 million of taxpayer money back without shareholders even getting to the point of asking them it was just the board, the company was thinking, this is what we have to do as part of our job if we are going to be here, because we are eventually going to have problems with our governments, regulators, if we don't. But I see this, I mean, the energy sector is an obvious one. They spent quite a lot of time on the political lobbying side, on it's not our fault, we're quite good, we do what we can. The energy world of the, you know, of the, the world needs energy, all of that. Of course, all that makes sense, but they've now realised because of their investors and, and their employees, by the way, their employees as well, please don't forget that, that they are part of the transition. 
Now, part of transition means they still produce oil and gas, but what is their plan to go forward? And secondly, on their debt markets, their credit ratings were getting reduced if they didn't have a credible plan to how they're going to pay their coupon into it. There is a carbon price. So therefore, these kinds of things are becoming much worse. It's the rating agencies, it's the shareholders, it's the consumer, it's the employees that are all saying these things. So I think it's all of the above. And there are many instances. The meat industry is now having to explain how what it's going to do about cage-free animals and organic. This is not just tobacco. The difference is tobacco comes from a very different place than that wonderful picture you put in 1994 and where it's come from on litigation. But other sectors are feeling this pain, and you're not alone. That's great, Sasha. Thanks very much. Um, don't go away, because we've got, we're going to go through some more stuff. But I'm going to turn to, to, to Flora now. Um, Flora, can you explain to us what transformation means for BAT? What are you doing, and what's the motivation behind it? OK, so GTNF, thank you for allowing me to share the, the BAT transformation story. I am not a transformation expert, but what I am is a BAT employee that is going through an industry transformation. And so what I will tell you is testimonial of the practical things that I have seen myself before and now. And to put some context, allow me to tell you that I have grown up with BAT. I joined BAT roughly about 20 years ago. I recall, like most of my uh, counterparts, we have been taken through what we called from seed to smoke. You know how farmers farm tobacco? You have experience in the factory. You experience the, the channel and the distribution and how things are retailed. And now I'm in the center looking at regulation and how these things are regulated. But my earliest experience when I joined BAT was visiting the science lab, the R&D facility. I was shocked at how huge the facility is, was, and still is, with lots of machinery, with lots of scientists in white coat. And I was wondering, what are they doing there? But anyway. It was then explained to me, part of what they do is trying to find how to reduce the harm in cigarettes. And I thought, with all this resource, BAT came on board in 1902. How come we haven't found a safe cigarette? That question stayed in my mind. Now, fast forward about four or five years ago, boom, that thing that we wanted began to appear. Suddenly, all the new products. In case of BAT, use the vapor product Glow, Velo, reduced risk product came on board, like whoop. Some of these things has the same kind of mechanism inside them as Formula One. That is how different. All this while, while the cigarettes have remained basically the same design, now we have reduced risk. And I think it is the realization of the potential impact that these reduced risk products will have on the reduction of uh, negative impact on health that made our CEO four years ago, two years ago in March, invited the whole company to commence and embark on the transformation journey. The transformation, at the core of this transformation, was the change in our portfolio. But the clear aim is to produce products that will reduce the health impact of consumers. The health impact of consumers. With the hope that people who would have continued to smoke will have the opportunity now for a viable alternative, an array of alternatives that they could switch into. By so doing, reduce smoking rate, mortality, 
and therefore contribute something positive to society. This is the core of the transformation. And the destination of our transformation we called a better tomorrow. A better tomorrow is our vision of a preferred future where what I have just explained will happen, including a better future for the employees, a better future for our customers, a better future for, and I will explain that later. But it is not just an adage. There are some actions behind, you ask me what are some of those actions. Now, a scrupulous focus on non-combustible products. If you are where I am at the center, and whatever you are doing is not targeted towards non-combustible products, you will have to explain what you are doing. And additional investments last year, I think about almost 500 million was increasingly poured into for innovation team, for the science team, to produce these products that will be substantially, scientifically substantially um, proven to reduce health, particularly if you migrate fully. But also with the highest product stewardship of quality and safety. So that is one element. The second thing is I have noticed there is an aggressive communication to our smokers. Did you know that every single day in the BAT world, 150 million smokers have interaction with BAT through our channel? So through this channel, the benefit of switching is being communicated. I understand that at the last count, one billion messages of this nature has been sent through insights in the packs to all these smokers, encouraging them to switch. There's also, and I, I will tell you, when you have some moment, please do look at bad science and see the amount of publication, peer-reviewed research that has been published at the last count, probably 136 seriously peer-reviewed documents that tells the relative risk, that explains all the science that underpin this new product. That is not all. There's also issue of availability. To date, our reduced risk products are in 57 markets, and there are plans to expand those markets. The interesting thing about those 57 markets is that 20 out of those 50, when I say markets, I mean countries, 20 out of those are the highest smoking prevalence countries. So we are targeting where there is high prevalence. But do you know, it is not all. The real way I have real seen the real uh, uh, thing is the target, the commercial target that has been given in order to achieve the transformation. It might be commercial target, but what is underpinning it? If we achieve it, it that means that there will be reduction in smoking prevalence. The target, 50 million consumers that will transfer into the risk product in 2030. Currently, I think we have reached or converted 19.4 million. That is the target. In terms of revenue, at the moment, reduced risk product brings in, I think, maybe about 2 billion, but the target is to get to 5 in 2025. Apparently, I believe that that will be uh, realized. Good. Thanks very much for that, Flora. That was a great intro to, to what Better Tomorrow is about. But I've, I've got a put this question to you that you know, some, some of your critics would say that the easiest and best way for BAT to transform would just be to, to stop selling cigarettes tomorrow or at least set a, set a date on when you'll stop cigarettes. Is it as simple as that? Uh, and if it isn't, why? I suppose that's one way of looking at it. But in the real world, while we try all this stuff I'm explaining to 
move people along. There is still one billion consumers that have the legal right to continue to smoke. If we stop abruptly, what happens to those? The second thing is there are an array in the value chain of the tobacco you know, manufacturing and selling. There are farmers, there are retailers, there's all the economic multiplier. They are tobacco dependent economies. If you abruptly stop, what happens to those? We need to think about the impact that goes beyond tobacco. Should we say, for instance, I have told you the investment that is being made to achieve this transition, where would it come if we stop? Should we say, because electronic cars are now out there, Conventional cars and motors should be stopped manufacturing. We wouldn't say that. So we need to think about impacts and consequences um, when we are sort of trying to say um, those kind of comment. Sure, I understand that. Um, and I'm going to put another, another challenge to you now as well, which is a kind of a related one, which is... You're, you're, again, you're, the, your critics would say, well, if you, if, you, if you really believed in this stuff, then you would stop selling things or stop doing things that make cigarettes more attractive, like marketing flavours, and you might stop challenging regulations such as flavour bans or, or taxes or plain packaging. What, what are the nuances of I that? I would say that in order to achieve where we are focusing, promotion rather than prohibition would be a better approach. And I would also say that in terms of advertising, we communicate. It is necessary to communicate. And I don't think that not communicating is going to be very helpful. In terms of challenging regulation, every country, most countries that are looking at regulation invite all relevant stakeholders to participate. I think our participation enable us to share our experiences, share consequences, share impact, share views as to how we think some of this regulation should be designed. So our contribution, I would say, is positive. It's a positive contribution. There are small instances where regulation may impin upon the rights of either individual or companies contrary to what the Constitution say. And I think in those small, narrow elements, it should be challenged so that the supremacy of the Constitution is maintained. Thank you very much. Peter, I'm going to come to you now. Um, so, Sasha talked about companies changing in, across all sorts of in, industries. Um, he's seen that. I think you've had a different experience of, of watching companies change because you've been sometimes been in, involved in those projects. What, what, what do you think drives companies to change? Is it normally something that comes internally or is it, again, kind of external factors driving things? I think it's, it comes down to it's a bit of everything. I mean, I very much recognise what Sasha was saying about investors. <clears throat> I think um, one of my hats, I'm a director of something called the Sustainable Wine Roundtable. Um, we've got sort of 60 organizations in the, it's great fun, um, 60 organizations in the wine sector, everything from big producers like Moet Hennessy through to the big alcohol monopolies in, in Scandinavia. And we did a straw poll amongst their members a couple of weeks ago about what drives sustainability. Now, fine, by definition, this is a set of organizations that have pre-selected to be sustainable or to be interested. But it was a mixture of things. It was, in, in some cases, it was wanting to be a better company, not better in some sort of ethical sense, although that was part of it, but the sense of, well, we want our wines to be the best. We want our viticulture to be excellent. So therefore, why would we not also want to lead on sustainability issues? And then there was sort of quite a lot of, a mix of sort of ESG plus consumers plus regulatory reform, a sort of sense of all that coming together. But, but all of that really re sort of reflects what I've seen in, in, in sort of other, um, other industries. Um, and you talked about internal drivers. Um, in my view, one of the biggest internal drivers is for those companies who've cocked it up monumentally in the past. Um, you know, they've, they've found themselves on the, on the receiving end of, of, of stick. And a good example of this is BP. Um, I worked with them on the Baku Chehan pipeline in Azerbaijan a few years ago. Um, and it was an absolute model um, example of communicating with local communities, um, <coughs> restitution of land and all that sort of stuff. And it was, it was brilliant. Um, and part of the reason for that was the guy who led the business there was a chap called David Woodward. 
um, who'd been head of external affairs for um, uh, BP for BP in um, uh, Colombia when they'd been associated with um, their security guards going and killing the local populations, and he never ever wanted to be in that position again. So internally, it's it's people realizing that things need to be different and having the drive to do it. In terms of the external drivers, um, Sash has already talked very ably um, to the question of, of, of the investment community. Um, regulation is, an, is another key thing. Um, I mean, certainly in, in anti-corruption work I've, I've worked on, the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act has, has always been a useful tool to actually try and to drive those things. Um, and you've got coming down the pipe now um, EU due diligence uh, legislation on supply chain. So that's going to have a, you know, a significant impact. Um, although there are potentially, we'll come back to this later on, but some potentially negative externalities. And then, of course, campaigners and NGOs. Um, again, um, they're not perfect, but they've certainly done very well in, on getting a lot of these issues up the agenda. And certainly, I think many companies will want to change just because they don't want that kicking. Now, uh, another really important thing I think Sasha picked up on was, was, was saying that companies need to focus on what's important for them. They can't, can't do everything. And uh, something which comes up in the tobacco industry now and again is, is the companies, understandably, you know, they trumpet their achievements in, in things like uh, other ESG factors, the environment, you know, forestry, water use, etc. Do you think that's important? Or is it basically irrelevant in the context of, of the product and the harm that the combustible cigarettes cause? Yeah, and again, I think you're, you're right that that's the way it's often presented, and I think that's, frankly, a, a bit of a stupid position for people to take. Um, I mean, Sasha made the point very ably as well. The fact that um, some people um, have a challenge with the product that is made does not mean that there's not a huge amount of other aspects to those businesses which also need to be taken account of. And, and, and Flora was mentioning that just now, and I'm going to give a bit of colour to that. Um, as, as John said at the beginning, um, I'm working at the moment with JTI in Malawi and Zambia, um, and they put in place a, a programme called Market Match, which is trying to encourage farmers to grow a second crop as a commercial crop. So as they, as a company, are gradually buying less tobacco, they're maintaining the, um, the incomes of those farmers, or seeking to maintain those incomes. Uh, and to give an example, a very specific example, I was up in the western province of, of, of Zambia um, in March this year, uh, met lots of farmers, including one called Lillian Kahale. Uh, now, in the last growing season, she grew a hectare of tobacco, from which she made $2,100. She also grew um, a quarter hectare of ground nut under the market match program, um, from which she made $167. So if you gross that up to you know, the equivalent as a, as a hectare, that's about $680 from a hectare of of, of ground nut. Now, fine, she's got productivity improvements that she can still make, but you're realistically looking at being able to make about twice as much from tobacco as from other commercial crops. Now, what do you tell, if, if you're someone that, 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 that says, well, it doesn't matter what these companies do because they're making cigarettes, well, try telling that to Lillian. Try telling her that, you know, she can't afford her children's school books, that she can't, if she's got a sick father, she can't afford his medication. You know, that it's, it's simplifying things to a ridiculous degree to pretend that that's, uh, that's what you can do. And, and then, um, John, you mentioned it just now, what about those countries? Um, you know, the um, campaign community is, is talking a lot about international development and um, bringing forward of, of emerging economies. Well, what do you tell the Zambian government? What do you tell the Malawi government? If, if you're saying we don't want your, t your cigarettes, your, your tobacco anymore. So there's, there's a lot of complexity that's saying we're own, it, it, it's almost to prioritise one stakeholder, i.e. the use of cigarettes, against everyone else, which is frankly a bit silly. So let, let's say I'm an activist wanting to change how a company behaves. Do, do you think it's best to, to engage with a company and... and persuade them to do something, or are you better off actually just trying to make them an outcast, push them beyond the pale and force change that way? Or, or does it depend on the context and the, and the, and the, the industry? I, I think there's sort of a role for both. Um, I think there's no doubt that high-profile campaigns, not just in tobacco, but, you know, um, bearing in mind, you, I'm old enough to, my first sustainability gig was the Euro 96 football hand-stitched by five-year-olds in Sialkot. You know, and that was a, a very high-profile NGO campaign that, that brought a, a serious issue to the fore. So campaigning that um, brings issues to the fore is absolutely necessary. But at the end of the day, if you're going to say, 
we're not going to deal with you. Well, where, what's the point in that? Um, I think completely to, to, to try and push organizations beyond the pale is, is, is not helpful. Because I've tried to express, change is a complicated process. And to ignore that by stepping away implies that you think it's a binary black and white process. What, what, what not just tobacco companies, but tobacco companies in, in every sector need are those that can engage, can support, can help them on that journey over time. Um, and also, it, it, if you do disengage, it just means that people go elsewhere. You know, if you, it's, it's not impossible for the sake of argument. I mean, looking at that um, chart that John put up just now, look at the size of the Chinese market. Well, if the big international companies find themselves pushed too far, may they just not say, well, bugger it, we'll sell to the Chinese. Um, it, it, you're not giving people a way forward if you d don't engage with them. And the last one for you, Peter. Um, in lots of industries, who, who, who or companies say they're changing, but there's always this need to, for external people to verify that. Um, you know, one, how, how, how do we verify that if tobacco companies say they're changing that they, they really are? And there's a kind of problem you sometimes come across in this, in this sector, which is that you know, the people who, who help do the verifying yeah. can just get tarred with the tobacco brush and you know, called you know, enablers or, or worse. How do we deal with that? Um, well, the not trusting thing isn't new, and I don't just mean that in the t context of tobacco. That's why we have accountants. You know, if people trusted companies, there wouldn't be an audit process. So the, the fact of people not trusting is, is kind of inherent within what business has been up to for, you know, 200 years. Um, I think, again, I think there's a, there's a logical disconnect um, to, to, to criticize those who, who verify change by saying they're enablers, simply because, well, you're trying to, you're trying to have your cake and eat it to use a very Boris Johnson phrase, for which I apologize, um, that on the one hand, we want you to change. We're, going, we're not going to get in, involved with you. We want you to change. But when you do, do try and change, we don't like the people you're trying to change with. It's, it's not a helpful position to take. Um, in terms of, 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 of what that means, uh, I mean, it's what's interesting, and we'll talk about this a bit more in a minute, is that this whole question of how do you verify is very much up for grabs at the moment. Um, I mean, we've, we're all aware of the labels you get on quite a lot of products like coffee, cocoa, you know, fair trade, rainforest alliance. That model is bust, basically. Um, you know, although, for example, most cocoa out of West Africa um, is fair trade certified, there's still child labor, lots of it. Um, it would need the price of coffee, cocoa to double, and then only 6% more farmers would have a living income. So that model isn't working. So it's what is, what does the new process look like? Um, and, and, you know, there's no real answer to that yet, but I think traceability has got to be key thing. You know, being able to get all the way right back down to the individual field that something came from, that's very difficult if you've got indirect supply chains. You know, working with JTI, they've got, they could literally take a, 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 some tobacco and say, right, we know exactly which part of which field it came from, um, you know, what the pay rates were of the migrant workers, what the inputs were onto that field. But that's very difficult to sustain if you haven't got that sort of direct supply chain. You know, blockchain processes can help, um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult one because you're trying to sustain um, visibility and transparency in very, very complicated environments. Um, and at the moment, I don't think the answer's there yet. But I think the idea of standards and certification as it is at the moment, won't work. Quite what that means with the tobacco sector, I don't know. I'd like to broaden it out a bit now and, and bring <coughs> Sasha back in too. Sasha, you, you made, I think, what's a really important distinction between ESG and ethics. Just delving into that a little bit more, I mean, do you think that tobacco is in a class of its own, a kind of uniquely untouchable industry from an ESG ethical perspective and could we ever have, do you, do you think you could ever sell as a fund manager in good faith a, 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 an ESG compliant or branded product that included tobacco stocks? Uh, let's start from the beginning. I think it'll be hard, especially at the moment. Um, let's go back to this whole conversation we've had so far. I, I still think there's, I mean, there's still such a lack of trust in the sector. And you beautifully put that um, nice slide up from 1994. And I, I just can remember it. You know, you can sort of remember that. I was obviously pretty young then, but you remember that kind of time. 
and i think the industry sometimes does itself a disservice because it's been harangued so let's let's be on the nice side because it's been harangued a lot and shouted at it's very defensive still and even some of the comments today are more we we now get it we're doing this as a there's still things that aren't going right and and peter you mentioned it about fair trade and coffee it isn't perfect and humility is a really important part of that and therefore i do think there's still a long way to go but of course if you employ that many people you can actually do stuff that really helps materially help people and i know the industry is doing that but it hasn't had that voice because maybe it's because people still believe that it spends all of its money on political lobbying now i don't know where it is on that but let's go through some examples so let's literally go through some examples the oil and gas sector has been lambasted and, and mining sector this is mining something different the mining sector that we all know bhp billiton the largest miner and now rio tinto which again have had their problems even in the last couple of years so we're not talking they're all great at all but they now have committed because they've been pushed to publish which lobbying associations they're spending money with and who they're on there and they're voluntary doing them voluntary it's voluntary with a big push but they are doing that because people didn't believe even in the mining sector that they really did want to change so you have to show demonstrate actions with how much money you're spending the iea the international energy agency is now saying that we shouldn't be producing any more coal i mean that's that's from their own that's from their own agency now that was the one that people used to use against when a greenpeace or someone else and so things are moving quite a bit so i think we can do that of course i was looking at this section thinking unilever again another global player like all the players that are on that chart, Unilever is committed now 2030 to paying the living wage globally for all its employees and the supply chain. Now that's blooming hard and I know it's going to take them a while, but wouldn't that be good if this sector did that and said it and then try to get out of the, we're still like the past, which people have got the lack of trust. So there are things it could do that could then help it to go to the question that you've asked me and show that. And already, things like finance people are buying bonds impact bonds well obviously it, people would be surprised but why can't the tobacco industry have impact bonds on things it can materially change whether it's forestry people's rights um, and those sorts of things i think it could be part of it but it's going to take quite a while because of where it's come from but obviously there are many investors who still invest in tobacco huge amounts uh, uh, that you know and love so i don't think it's it's completely impossible, but it needs to do a lot more on the demonstrating these things. Thanks. Peter or Flo, do you want to add, add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everything that Sasha said makes a, makes a lot of sense, and I think the industry does need to be less defensive. But I think it's also important to point out that there are quite a lot of industries which you wouldn't necessarily think of as being bad guys um, are seen as being completely acceptable by the, um, by the mainstream investment yeah. community. Uh, you look at fast food. Um, I mean, e even as far ago as 2004, there was an article in the British Medical Journal that um, talked about fast food companies using the same sort of approaches to defend their position that tobacco was accused of using back in the 60s and 70s. You know, so are we going to be sitting in a conference in 20 years' time, you know, trying to sort of, um, you know, reposition the, the fast food industry? You know, the apparel sector, um, I don't know whether um, anyone would like to guess how much that was ordered from factories in South Asia didn't get paid for. Big retailers like JCPenney, Marks and Spencers ordered and had delivered goods during lockdown, um, but they didn't pay $16 billion. So that's quite a lot of money that's not going to pay for health and safety improvements, not paying for living wages. Um, so there are quite a lot of other sectors where there's some very, very big questions about their business practices and the need for fairly fundamental reform. Um, but at the moment, the pressure's not been on them. Um, but I think that's something that perhaps ESG can help with. Just, Do you want to say something? Paul? Yeah, so I, I, I listen to what you say. I think the issue is that you've raised the question of trust. You've raised what we're doing or not doing. If we, if we bother to look into actually what we do and not sit out and criticize, they will see that there has been a significant change internally in what we do. 
as I was explaining about our transformation, what has hit me is that our voice as employee have become in the forefront. Our employees are the ones that are now demanding that the company does things in a particular way that society approves us. That we do things with integrity. And they are listening. And things have significantly changed. If you look at our company, 79% of the people who are coming in now are hired from outside the tobacco industry to help bring new capabilities to support our transformation. 39% of women in, in, in BAT are in managerial position, and there are plans to reach up to 50. I know there has been um, cynicism when it comes to environmental stuff, and I hear you, you know, but BAT has been part of the Dow Jones membership for the past 20 years, even before ECG became the flavor of the month. I know there are cynicism about a lot of the awards that have been given, but if all this credible award that people have come in and verified and looked at it, if I'm sitting where you are sitting, I must be saying there must be something right and good that they are doing to be given these awards. So the issue of trust, do you want me to address that? I saw that you put out the picture, the famous picture. Well, I, I, actually, maybe before we go on to trust, the, mm. the defensiveness point that Sasha yeah. made, do you think that's, do you think that's I, 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 I don't really think so. To be honest with you, there is a resurgence of pride in the, in the organization that we work for. The, be tomorrow, the, the Better Tomorrow um, destination has given us the opportunity to see that we can contribute positively to society. And that, as a rallying call, has brought us together to have one common purpose that we think is good. And that has energized. We do no longer feel defensive. We will speak up. We, would, we are very proud of what we are doing. We just need a lot more people to see it. Thank you. I, mean, I think you raise a really important point there about the employees you know there's a there's that a, there's is real where i in, see the real people yeah. the biggest change that is happening and um that is why i am so happy to be part of what is going on i'm glad that i have stayed on to see the changes happen and I'm, i want to do one more uh, sort of investment specific question if i can which is which is about divestment because we we hear this quite a lot and, and in tobacco there's quite well known divestment campaigns. So again, I guess direct this at Sasha and Peter to start with, but what, what is the theory of change with divestment? And if I give up my BAT dividend tomorrow, is, is, is someone going to stop smoking? Sasha, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, look, I've been, I've been a, a big proponent always, and um, chairman of BATS and Imperial over the years, and would probably say they'd wish I'd left the room sometimes because I was always one of their largest investors and I'd rather stay and help influence because they are very important companies and part of the investment chain. And therefore, I, I, do not, I did not always like the divest. Now, obviously, we've talked about the ethical side of divest. I'm spent, one of the reasons I've come to the regulator, I didn't, I didn't want to waste people's time on that, but as one of the, you know, I was a reasonably senior person in ESG globally and I was worried that it was going to become a, a, a basically a box ticking exercise of this sector's good, that sector's bad, buy this product, if it's, if it's in, it's in, and if it's out, it's out. It's like, how do you change it? If we just look at climate, which is the big one for now, and of course it's big, you don't change climate by just owning some wind farms. They're still going to keep doing the things they're doing. It'd be an absolute travesty if we didn't try to get towards one and a half degrees. And we're only going to get there if we're involved with the BPs and others, and Exxon. And just back to the activist point, um, engine number one did win four seats on the Exxon board. Now, it used every tool, and we back to Peter's point on activists, the activists are getting much more sophisticated. Obviously, in the past, they say the returns are bad, you need to get a new management team and I can make more profits. They now say the diversity of the board isn't very good. And I'm, not, I'm laughing at some of these activists who haven't had much diversity of their boards or their people, but they're 
they're using the language of the, the, the psyche of what the market is doing. And that's what I think the tobacco industry needs to realize that th this is not sort of just that we make, we're really trying harder and we're doing better. It's about demonstrating that, which of course some parts of it they are doing, but it is still new. I mean, um, it's just new in this area. And so I just think divest, we can't get rid of divest, but I'm spending my life trying to have things like improve label, improve. It's better to be inside the tent and improve and be involved. But you will not get away from some divest, but divest doesn't normally do it because someone else normally buys. The difference in things like um, electrification of cars or climate is people don't want to buy a coal fired power station because they're worried they won't be able to sell it on to someone because it won't be worth anything in nine years time. That's different. That's different to the past where it was like, if you don't buy it, someone else will buy it and you're just passing the parcel which is something that I think is something that this industry needs to work out. Can I pick on some of those points? Uh, with you entirely, Sasha. I mean, I think divestment is intellectually lame and, and practically counterproductive. Um, I agree with everything that he's been saying about you need to engage. Um, it's, it's sort of the intellectual equivalent of going... <laughs> um, rather than actually bothering to understand what the problems are and, and, and trying to bring people forward. And I think the best of the example of that at the moment is what's going on in Russia. You know, this mad rush to divest from everything Russian. Well, let's have a look at the detail of that. Let's park to one side whether or not those divestments will be effective in, you know, reducing uh, or, or, or turning back what the, the, the Kremlin's doing. And I personally don't think they're going to have any effect at all. But the question is, well, what actually happens? You know, so McDonald's, they've now withdrawn completely, but their first announcement was they were going to carry on pay, paying their staff. What about their supply chain? It's back to this point about there's a lot more riding on this. It's not a black and white issue. These things are complicated. McDonald's have now withdrawn completely. So, okay, well, Will their workers get paid decent wages? Will their health and safety standards maintain? Um, will their reliance, will their working with their supply chain be as reliable as it has under McDonald's? And what about BP and Shell? They both said they're selling their holdings. Well, to whom? Um, BP's partner is Rosneft, which is owned by a former deputy prime minister of Russia. So exactly how does divestment help take power away from the Kremlin? It simply doesn't. It's, it's silly. Um, people want simple answers to complex questions and the only way you get to those complex questions is by collaboration by working with people uh, and divestment is is frankly the opposite of that um, it maybe makes people feel good because they can say they've taken a stand they can have their 15 minutes of fame on um, you know some news broadcast show but it doesn't actually change anything right i want to turn to floor again now because yeah. um some, sometimes this debate uh, you know appears to, to carry on as though the companies can just do stuff uh, irrelevant of, of the context in which they're, they're operating. So I want to ask you, what, what do you think the barriers are to BAT and other tobacco companies transforming more quickly? And, wh and what frustrations do you have uh, in, in terms of the environment in which you're, you're having to operate? When I look at it, misinformation about the product, about what is being done, about the relative risk is huge. Lack of adequate training and education awareness, particularly amongst the health service provided, is a big issue. The entrance of some players who give no hoot to safety or to um, youth access is a big issue. They don't help. Um, the wrong regulatory framework that does not encourage smokers to move along or that does not incentivize manufacturers to innovate is a big issue. And the lack of willingness to consider tobacco um, harm reduction or to adopt it or to see the role that some of these new products could play in the reduction of risk is a big issue. So there is an array of things that, and the constant relentless criticism and activities of prohibitionist is not helpful. It is the distraction and it weighs things back. It will be good if there is a constructive way 
to get regulation that will support um, this new product, that will incentivize uh, the way that um, manufacturers produce these things, but at the same time also make efforts to protect vulnerable communities. That will help. Thanks. We've heard quite a lot about the WHO over the last day or two um, and, and, the, and the peculiar role that they play in uh, tobacco harm reduction, or, or rather don't play quite often. And I, I want to ask Sasha and Peter again, because very often the, de the debate about industry and, and corporate change carries on as though you know, it's always the corporate guys who are the bad actors and NGOs, supranational organizations, etc., who who are the good guys. Do you think, I mean, does that, does that work? Or, or do you think there are situations maybe outside tobacco as well where, where sometimes NGOs are, are, are pushing in what turns out to be the wrong direction? Peter, go first, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, I think NGOs get sort of deified. Um, you know, they're almost seen as being a, they can do no wrong. But you start to scratch below the surface. You know, you can sometimes find some quite mixed motives. Um, I don't know whether anyone remembers the Brent Spa episode from the 1990s. Um, Shell wanted to destroy, they wanted to sink an oil storage platform in the middle of the Atlantic, which was standard practice, and Greenpeace launched a great campaign to stop this happening. Um, and it was suggested at the time that part of the reason that Greenpeace did that is because their membership was dipping and they needed a high-profile issue to, um, on which to get members. Um, but you see, uh, you know, now you, 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 you still get this, or not the same issue, but you get NGOs trying to oversimplify simplify things in order to get a message across. Um, and the classic case at the moment is, um, again, uh, uh, Cocoa in West Africa, um, a number of campaigning NGOs um, came up with this idea of the living income differential. Um, Cocoa is about $2,000 a tonne. Um, they asked the governments to put an additional $400 on that tonne in order that that could go in and increase the incomes of, of farming families. Well, a number of issues. First of all, um, there's very good evidence that that's driven corruption in the country. Um, officials saying, well, pay me 100, put 100 into the, um, uh, into the kitty and you can keep the rest. Um, it's also unsurprisingly led some companies to go and buy elsewhere, because why wouldn't you? Um, then there's the question of, well, is that money actually getting through to farmers? Um, irrespective of whether you, 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 you look at some of the um, sort of corruption indices for those countries, the fact still remains that they, they do poorly on some governance indicators. So a lot of that money will simply get lost in the wash. So it's, it's whereas actually what needs to happen is engagement with, um, okay, if we really want to increase um, incomes of, of smallholder farmers, we have to address the fact that most of them are farming on less than two hectares. Will that ever be viable? Um, that means engaging with the government on things like like land reform. It means engaging on issues like increasing the uh, proportion of uh, onward processing that is done onshore, so the, the country create, keeps more of that, that revenue. So it's um, NGOs, bless them, um, but they are not necessarily as, as wonderful as sometimes they're portrayed as being. I think, I, I think you made a really important point in something I read of yours as well, which is, and, and it came up a bit this morning in Mark Gunter's presentation, which is that... Um, NGOs aren't always very accountable. I mean, you can turn up to companies and <coughs> complain to the shareholder or to com complain to the CEO, vote in the AGM. Um, quite often those things just don't happen with NGOs. No, um, NGOs can be completely a law unto themselves. Um, and I, mean, I, I wrote an article about, which I think the one you wrote a few, few years ago, is that when they're successful, it's because they manage to cohere a sort of sense, you know, amongst the pop, amongst Joe Public, that, that, that something needs to be done. And they're able to act as the sort of the conduit for that. But there's always a risk for them that if they, if they try and do something which doesn't really enjoy mass support, then, um, then they're, they're going to have difficulties. But I say the difficulty with that from, from their perspective is they need to be able to crystallize what sounds like a simple message. And again, the living income differential, 400 bucks, solves the farmer income issue. It's not in their interest necessarily to start looking at that complexity, because that's a lot harder to get across. So yes, they don't, they're not accountable. Do you want to say anything, Sasha? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think um, 
So, yeah, I've been on the other side of NGOs who said that my portfolios aren't as good as possible and all of those things. I've seen it, obviously not so much. Um, but the, the first thing you'll remember is that there is normally a kernel of truth of some of the things that they're looking at normally, and that helps them. And the best campaigns that we've seen have been ones where they've managed to get the coalition. The thing is, things are getting to that point. People do want some of the things that they want. What they don't understand is how complicated it is. And you've made that point very clearly, Pete, so I won't go through that. But it doesn't mean that they're, they're wrong in some of the things that they're asking for. Sometimes I've seen some of the shareholder proposals, for example, and you're thinking, I wouldn't have written it like that. And it's not the way that you, a company, you can't ask a board to be that prescriptive, so we can't support it. But do we want some of the things that they want? Yes, you do. And maybe the answers in the past, if we go back to the tobacco sector, we haven't always had the best answers. So therefore they get some momentum. And I think that's what happens a lot of the time. Um, I, was, I was thinking, I'm going to, um, Oxford uh, the week after next and there's a lot of NGOs talking about how they've and investors about how they've been campaigned and what worked and what didn't work and how they can be better going forward to get more coalition a lot of it's on meat and chemicals so it's not, they're not tobacco isn't on the agenda and I do, so I do need you to realize that this is something that is around it's getting bigger um, the, the people have been so excited in the oil and gas sector that they've, they've managed to get Exxon directors removed from the board that they're not going to stop there. And so therefore there is going to be more of this. Of course, half the time you sit there and go, really? Is that the best campaign? Out of all the things you could worry about, is that the thing that a, a FTSE 100 company should be looking at? Probably not. And therefore we've got to balance it with real world, real world practical examples. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and just before we open it up for, for, for wider Q&A, I want to, to finish with a couple of questions on, on the consumer. Um, so when we're talking about uh, tobacco industry transformation, it, it seems to me, to put it really simplistically, you've got, you've got carrots and sticks, where the carrots are all the alternative products that are significantly less dangerous than combustible cigarettes, you know, the vapes, the heating, the oil, etc. Those are carrots and, and the ways of marketing them. And then you've got sticks, so the things which make combustible cigarettes less attractive, you know, whether that's advertising bans, plain packaging, all the way through to, to taking all the nicotine out. So I'm wondering, do, do you think there is a need, and I'm going to ask this to all the panellists, for, for, for more of the stick than we are currently having? I, and, and also, to what extent should the industry be pushing, even coercing its consumers to make that journey and what do we do about the people who maybe just like to have a cigarette now and again all the time so, you want to go first, Flora? Yeah, right so as I said before I do not believe that prohibition is the way to go history have told us if it's been tried in the alcohol industry it didn't work we do not the question of you asking me should um, with consumers, what is the best way to do? Should it be industry? I think it should be a combined effort between the industry doing what they can and also the regulators and public health doing. It should be a combined effort, a constructive effort. And the more that we focus on transition and making whatever measures that are available to nudge people to move on, I think better effort spent on that is probably will yield better fruit than piling up um, stricter, stricter regulation or prohibition. And because we have seen it so far, this has been happening, and the results are, in fact, haven't been that encouraging. So that would be where I think we should go. Thanks, Peter. Do you want to? Yeah, I'm not a tobacco industry expert, but it, it, the prohibition route doesn't seem to be the way forward. Just speaking as someone who quite likes the idea of freedom, um, the, the idea of being told there's something I can't do. Uh, and also at the moment, you know, perhaps it was different in the 50s and 60s, but I don't think anyone now could legitimately claim they didn't understand the risk to themselves of smoking. And as you say, m many of my friends will smoke the occasional cigarette because they like to do it. I smoke cigars because I like to do it. I know there's a risk involved, but, um, you know, uh, 
I ought to have the, the choice of doing that. And I think there's a lot of other things that people do that are a lot more harmful. I return to my comments about the fast food industry. Um, you know, I think if you look at quality adjusted life years, um, you know, fast food obesity is much, much more damaging to, to public health than, than cigarettes are. Um, and I, I think what Flora was just saying about, you know, the nudge over time, um, both from um, government and regulators and from the industry, I think is, is the way to go. Because I think a lot of what we've seen has been an awful lot of, an awful lot of stick rather than, okay, well, how do we positively encourage people um, in, in a way that doesn't make people feel like they're, they're, they're sort of some sort of outsider because they happen to like a fag from time to time. And criminalised all the time. Yes, and you know, if you look at criminalising of, of drugs, I mean, that really works as well, doesn't it? Sasha, anything to add to Yeah, that? I just think we've just, um, we've just sort of, in, a, in the nicest possible way, said that the NGOs sometimes make this too simplistic. And I think... If we're playing devil's advocate, we could say the tobacco industry is saying prohibition doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, and of course that word. I mean, who wants that word? I mean, I'm a capitalist for a start. The last thing I want is that word prohibition. But there are so many parts of that nuance, a bit like it's not easy just to do one thing in the countries you mentioned, Peter. But, you know, the, stuff, the work on corruption, um, the living wage, the political lobbying, the... You've mentioned it, Jonathan, about flavours for young adults and all of those other things. There's definitely things that the industry could do a lot more. And even a wonderful company like Bats, it was March the 18th, 2020, the building Better Tomorrow, two years and three months ago. It's not, and that's why people go, I'm not sure I'm going to give them the trust because it's not started that long ago in that sense. I know it, it started a little bit before that in terms of the planning and things. So I do think... Yes, we can say there's been sticks, but I think the industry can definitely do more and not always think that it's all about prohibition doesn't work. I mean, that to me is just a bit too simple. Lovely. And then just last one, uh, we'll, we'll start with Flora on this. I mean, one of the really heartening things for me to see, I think, on, and everyone to see on, on tobacco harm reduction is there's this group of committed and passionate consumer advocates trying to help and move the cause along. Can the industry support those groups and individuals, or is it better off staying out the way, given your history? I do not see what is wrong um, supporting a group of uh, associations that share common interest, that share um, common objectives, or that are aligned in some way with what you are trying to achieve. There are, though, some governance around it that one should make sure um, it's in there. We should not do the same thing that we criticize the likes of um, Bloomberg and, and Gate, where you uh, offer money with conditionalities. So a contribution towards whatever that organization is doing, where others are also contributing, but you have no undue influence to determine how to do it or what they have to do because of the money that you have contributed or the support. But by the way, it's not only money. Sometimes it's, uh, it's brain power and all kinds of things. The support that, that you give. So if those kind of uh, governance and transparency are put around it, I do not see anything wrong in, in um, supporting those organizations in some way or form. Great. I think we'll, we'll uh, end my questioning there, hopefully, and um, see if we've got some questions from the audience here. I know we've got a couple on, on, online already, so let, let's take some from the, let's take a couple from the room to start with if, if people have questions. Stick your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Down at the front here, Harry. Oh, great. Um, the theme of this conference is tobacco harm reduction here for good. And much of what we think about that is just the whole, the whole business of activism and trying to get regulation change and, uh, uh, and pushing for decent public health. So, but the question is, from a company's point of view, um, is the business, and taking into account vapes, heated tobacco products, snus and all mm -hmm. the rest of it, have we got to a point now where the business is too big to fail? Or is there a risk if things go wrong from a regulatory point of view and given the profits 
that are still being made by selling cigarettes. Companies just shrug their shoulders and say, well, we did our best. We did try, but look what's happening. And, you know, we go, we go backwards. Or have we got past that point now? <laughs> I, I wish I know what's the right answer. But uh, if you look at what is happening as part of the transformation, we are also diversifying into other things, cannabis and, and uh, wellness and uh, uh, treatment. And this is so that we remain sustainable and avoid being so reliant on uh, combustibles. So to your question, I don't think it's a question of whether we are too big to fail. Uh, probably would like to think so, because uh, um, we also have uh, Be Tomorrow ventures that are looking at other things. So perhaps we have sufficient the sustainability to go all the way, I would say. So you think, to try and paraphrase, the, 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 the momentum towards transformation is kind of unstoppable now. Do you think that's true? I think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it is, it's, it's a full steam ahead. There is no looking back. You can only get to the destination. Can I just throw just something in there and say what you're talking about is, is uh, transformation for the whole company into all sorts of different areas of activity. I suppose what I was focusing on was just the production of the tobacco harm reduction products and whether you could, whether that business is, uh, is, is kind of sustainable. I think it is sustainable. I think it is sustainable. This is why when I said about the targets and we are seeing success, people are moving over. And uh, if we hit the target that we have set ourselves, it is sustainable. It will carry on. Thank you. I think we've got a question over, over here. Um, good evening. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, currently, who is this transformation sort of geared towards or directed it? Because it seems like for your poorer um, cigarette consumers or tobacco consumers, they've sort of been left behind because um, in developing countries such as mine, which is South Africa, the products themselves are expensive and you've got a lot of smokers that are dependent on government grants and someone's not willing to spend 30% of what they get from government on a device. Maybe the little, the refills, they might be cheaper, but the device itself is expensive and I'd rather buy food than buy a device um, that might take 30 or 40% of what I get from government. So just. Currently, it seems like the poor, they're still left behind. And just what is the plan to then get or reach those people in future? I totally um, identify with what you have just said. I spend, I am from Africa. I know the area very well. And I know also um, the income level. The journey to our destination is not you know, um, a one. It will carry on. And if you remember when I said about 57 countries and more plans to um, launch more, but also this is why I think with VAT, having a multi-category different products, some of it, you know, vape, some are expensive, some are less, some are, and that innovation will continue. And I'm sure with time, the prices, just like the telephones and everything else, the price will keep coming down as you um, scale up. So it is not, you are correct, that most of the developing countries or where there is uh, people of higher income can afford the higher devices, but um, they, the pouch is, is probably more, um, if I think about Africa, where already we use those um, snuffs and stuff, it is, it is possible. It's a matter of time, I think. Thanks. We've got uh, one online, which I'm going to read out now. Um, 
and then maybe actually Peter is best placed to answer this Far away. first. Uh, if tobacco harm reduction was broadly accepted and becomes bigger and bigger, um, how do we provide an alternative income to, to the growers, people who historically made their living out of growing tobacco? Yeah. I think, I mean, I think it's A, to recognise that that is actually a factor, um, that, 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 that you can't just effectively say to, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers uh, across Latin America, um, sub-Saharan Africa, um, sorry chaps, you can't earn a living anymore. Uh, and that requires engagement over a lot of years, um, that even to get farmers to change small elements of their farming practices can take three or four years. So if you're trying to get them to grow a completely different commodity or completely different thing, um, that's going to take decades because they trust what they grow because they've grown it for years, their father grew it before them, their great-grandfather before them. <clears throat> You've got that tradition, that history. You've also got to look at what agronomically will work. Um, you've got to have something that's going to work within the soils. You're also seeing huge changes um, from climate change. The same um, in Malawi, they said that the rains used to come just after Independence Day, which is in November. The rains this year didn't come until the beginning of January. So that you've got a very, very considerable changes in the growing sequence. So you've, you've, you've got to look at this as a long-term 20, 30, 40 year transformation. You've got to bring the governments on board um, and that can sometimes be difficult because you often get different bits of government that have different agendas. Um, but that, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's complicated, but that's what needs to happen. And there needs to be a, a, structured, a structured plan to do that. Um, you know, maybe it's something that the, the tobacco sector collectively could do to engage with some of these governments and, and say, well, what do we do? What would the... Come to one of the points that Sasha made earlier about, um, you know, perhaps the industry being, you know, proactive about we're going to do X, we're going to do Y. Maybe that will be something that could be done to say, right, okay, we're going to work in, for the sake of argument, Zambia, Malawi, um, and we're going to work with the government about, okay, what would an alternative, a new, a new crop be, and how do we get there over 10, 20, 30 years? That's correct. And one more uh, online question, which is uh, going to go to Flora. So can you talk a bit about um, you know, situations where you can't sell tobacco harm reduction products because they're, they're banned. And there's unfortunately quite a few places around the world. How actively do you campaign to repeal those bans? And, and what are some of the difficulties involved in, in doing that? Yeah, well, as, 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 as I said, um, it is difficult and, and you have to, there's only so much resource and time and energy that you have um, to service places where it is not banned. And most of these are the places where the opportunity um, opens up or there's a consultation or there's an invitation, we submit. Um, papers, we submit our opinion, we engage to see um, if it can be unbanned. But it, it, it is difficult. Some countries um, have taken the view that um, they wouldn't open up the doors and they will welcome it. Um, so we will comply with the laws, whatever there is, or that is in each of those countries. So um, we, we're, we're, we're not going to take, take up arms against the government because uh, they will not uh, accept or adopt, but we will continue to encourage them to do so. And I believe as they see the reduction in smoking prevalence in places where uh, reduced risk products have been uh, introduced, perhaps that will encourage them if they genuinely want that transfer to be made to um, allow those uh, reviews. Places like Brazil are reviewing their law and they're making uh, taking submissions to see if they will refer to it. Another question down here at the, the, the front. Hi, uh, so a question for Flora. What I would love to see is a commitment from BAT and from the other big tobacco companies that every year they'll produce fewer cigarettes than they produced the year before. And ideally, that they would have a plan that they would cut back their production by, say, 5% a year over the next 20 years until they'd reach zero. Yes, it I have heard that um, talks about the sinking lead to make a commitment. But again, um, I'm not sure whether it is a, a supply 
chain issue if we say, oh, well, we won't, uh, we won't produce this. I think the point that we have taken to say we will focus on reducing um, the health impact. We are making um, a lot of effort now to, even the fact that I'm able to say nicotine is addictive openly, even the fact that I'm able to say it has a negative health impact on your health, the only way to stop it is not to smoke. It's so liberating if you know where we came from. And I, I think making statements about uh, we will stop um, this year, we won't produce six, it, it really doesn't um, change anything. I, do, I don't see how that changes anything. But what will change things when things have happened is when people have made a conscious effort on their side to stop smoking. And once they stop, they'll never go back. And do you know? If people are not are moving, there is no need for us to produce it. And I can tell you, even without making those statements, even without making the commitment publicly that you'd say, the production levels are not what they used to be. And that is just because of uh, supply and demand. Yeah. With respect, I think the question we've presented here today is tobacco industry transformation, myth or reality. And if you're not prepared to make that commitment, in my book, it's a myth. Well, um, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, how do I say it? You're entitled to your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if I might add something here, I think um, as, as a practical matter, there are many markets where already combustible volumes have been falling at 5% for, for quite a few years, and we're probably not that far off globally that that happening every year That's anyway and I you know I think uh, you make a very fair point I think but for, for various reasons the industry so far has prepared to, to to target the flip side of that which is assuming that if they are selling more and more THR products and if those products become a larger and larger portion of their revenue base then Combustible cigarette volumes Would must be declining anyway. But at the moment they're not. At the moment they're increasing, globally. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that's true. But maybe we can have a discussion about that afterwards. Can I, can I, can I come in as well? Um, yeah, please do, Sasha. I, I, think, I think one of the things I would say to that comment as well would be, you know, if you look at BP, it's not waiting till there's a law that it has to reduce its oil and gas production. It's now come up and committed it. So is Shell, so are the others. And climate change has not been as known for as long as um, tobacco addiction or health. And they're not waiting because, until people don't want to buy oil or gas and they want to buy a, a renewable or an electric car or whatever it is. And I think it would be good to see the industry, the industry, not Flora, it's not Flora's job, but the industry to sometimes say, not wait until people want these THR products. We are not just committed to it, but it would give the trust if people were seeing that there was more of a commitment to trying to move people over the rather than offering a selection and letting them choose. And I think that's the bit that probably there's still a bit of a credibility issue from what I see as, a, as, as someone from the outside. I think that's a very fair point as well, Sasha. I mean, the one thing I would say about the difference between climate change stuff and tobacco is that, I mean, with, with, with a few exceptions, most of the world does agree that moving away from, from, uh, from carbon-based fuels is a, is a good thing. You know, as we've heard today, unfortunately in tobacco, a lot of parts of the world aren't, aren't there yet. So it, 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 it does become quite hard for the industry to transform in some countries if they're not given an option of actually selling the products which would, 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 would help facilitate that. And that, that is correct. one of the barriers, maybe. Uh, we've got another question at the, the back there. Mark. Is, Mark, is it Martin? Hello. All right. Um, hi, yeah. Uh, um, when we talk about transformation in the industry, um, tobacco companies say they're transforming, uh, but the cynic would say, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? And on the opposite end, we have public health who says there's no transformation whatsoever. 
And how they come to that was uh, they, they produced a report in March which said um, to, they define transformation as companies which have made, uh, demonstrated, sorry, uh, substantial, rapid and verifiable progress towards eliminating the production and sale of tobacco products within five years in all markets where it operates, which is quite simply unachievable. So is there a place for an independent arbiter of what transformation is going on, which could help with trust and credibility, and maybe even lead to competition between companies to transform quicker than their comp competitors? Oh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, we already have, I suppose, uh, a, a first stab at this in the Tobacco Transformation Index, which the, which the um, Foundation for a Smoke-Free World has, uh, has, has set up. And I think we've got another version of that coming out uh, later this year. But I'll turn that over to the, to the panel. Anyone want to, to answer yeah, that? Just, I, I like the idea of it. The difficulty, I, it would seem to me, is who would be the referee? Yeah. that almost anyone that got to be referee would be distrusted by someone else who didn't want them to be the referee because they'd be seen uh, because as to, to put it simplistically you know, that the, the WHO government end is that this is a heinous ghastly business that that needs to be got rid of as soon as possible others will say as Flora's very ably said today actually people want to buy this stuff why shouldn't we make it for them um, so almost there's, there's almost an impossibility of getting a neutral a neutral point. I think what I would say, though, which I, I suppose comes back to um, the point that Sashi was making just now, my response to that previous question about, um, uh, you know, how do we, what do we do about smallholder farmers, is you know some you know some sort of structure that says, well, okay, how are we going to do this? You know, okay, it may not be global. It may be only in certain developed markets where um, where it's more feasible to make change happen. But to to start, you know, plotting some form of movement. Um, collected with the industry that looks at the smallholder supply chain that looks at you know how do you shift it because I think I love the idea of there being some sort of global you know institution to do this but I just think that someone's going to you know say ERF you blind yeah Always yeah I'd, I'd go two points um, sorry Flora after you no no carry on after you um, um, two points one look at some of the other industries um, and again. Uh, mining and oil and gas are obvious examples. Most of, especially on oil and gas, there are many ESG um, people who are purists who don't like them. But Christina Figueres, who helped, instrumental, I should say, on arranging the Paris Agreement for COP, she's now an advisor to an oil and gas company. And there are people who probably say to her, what are you doing? But she's going there as someone who can hopefully be a bridge between the two sides that the question asked to show someone. Now, I don't know how many people are having a go at Christina Figueres, but I think not many people are having a go at her credibility. And I think the industry could try very hard to do something of the same in that sense on an advisory. So that's PMI advisory committees with people who are not part of the industry. Of course, there'll be people that say they are because they've just joined that board or an advisor. But it has to be advisory, it has to be independent. So I think there are things. Secondly, I'm much more with Peter's point though. I'd rather less about individual actions and everyone transforming and doing this. I'd rather have the industry, which of course is worried because of litigation and lawyers and everything else. The industry saying, here are things that we can do together to help on certain things, and we, this is what we commit to together, and we jump over the side of the uncertain void to try and fix a problem. And I think that would show a lot more credibility to the outside world, and I, I'd like to see more of that. And you mentioned the farmers. That's a perfect example. Yeah, that's a great point, Sasha. I think there is, a, there is a lot of what seems externally anyway quite silly squabbling amongst the companies, which seems sometimes unnecessary. I'm going to, I, I've, I've had last question whispered in my ear, but I am going to try and cheekily take one from the gentleman there who's had his hand up for a while. We might have to answer it quite quick. Hi, uh, it's Andrew Manson here as a former industry person, but been out of the industry for five years. I just want to answer uh, uh, the, the question of the guy at the front about the industry transformation. I think in other industries, uh, such as climate change, there is no restriction on renewable energies by governments. There's no restriction on healthy foods uh, by governments 
to encourage the fast food industry to, trans, uh, to, to translate to, to healthier products, there is a clear restriction by many governments, Australia, okay. India, Brazil, on the alternatives to cigarettes. And the challenge the industry can put to those governments is you release those, trans, uh, you release those restrictions and then you put the onus on us to, to move uh, smokers over to alternatives. But in the absence of alternatives because of government restrictions, it's then unreasonable to ask the tobacco industry to, uh, to migrate towards zero. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we are going to have to, to end it there. Um, but thank you very much indeed to all our panellists, Sasha, uh, Peter and Flora. You, I know you've made a lot of efforts to, to join us today. It's really appreciated. I certainly really enjoyed the discussion, found it very useful, and I hope uh, our audiences have as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the commentary session. Uh, I'm Dr. John Oyston. I'm pleased to be here with Dr. With Dr. Brad Radu and David Sweener. Uh, so I thank the Global Forum of Nicotine for asking me to do this session. And I must admit when I first was invited, my first thought was, this is just a great opportunity to spend half an hour with a couple of people that I admire <laughs> and to chat to them without any other interruptions or distractions, uh, nobody tapping anybody on the shoulder and saying, you have to come and do this, you have to go and do that. So one of the things I really enjoy about this meeting is that we have so many people from so many different countries and different walks of life uh, who all join together because we believe in the cause of reducing the death, disease, and disability caused by tobacco smoking. Uh, and we believe that consumers have the right to be educated about alternative sources. Uh, but it, it's intriguing to me to find out exactly what paths people have followed and how uh, their lives have taken them to the fact that we're all here in Warsaw talking about nicotine reduction, nicotine uh, at the Global Forum on Nicotine. Uh, so first of all, David Sweener is from Ottawa. He's a lawyer. I believe he's the first lawyer in the world to dedicate himself to tobacco control issues. <laughs> So I'd like to ask you, David, how was it at what stage in your legal career did you decide that this is the aspect of law that interested you and this is what you're going to dedicate your career to? Well, I mean, very early on, I mean, the, um, I started off doing my articles at a corporate commercial law firm in downtown Toronto, uh, quickly decided that that was very boring, uh, and I was very interested in uh, policy change and issues of health. And this one just uh, st uh, stuck out in that I... Already, cigarette smoking was our leading cause of preventable death. Science had shown us that so clearly. So the information of the scientists and the doctors is that this is a horrendous cause of death and disease. This is what was filling our hospitals. This is why people were watching patients die. And, and then the idea that scientists and doctors are really good at identifying what's making people sick. But dealing with it is a social, legal, political issue. We needed policy. And that's the sort of stuff that lawyers, politicians uh, uh, get, can do something about. So that's what got me involved in the policy. And as you said, I was the first lawyer in the world to work full time on policy measures to reduce cigarette smoking. And I, um, I, I think, uh, you know, the work must be addictive because I've, I've stuck with it. <laughs> as far as you know, are you the only lawyer here today? Oh, I assume that there's other lawyers, and I've even thought about it, but it's, it's become quite a common area. There's a tremendous number of lawyers now working on issues dealing with uh, tobacco and nicotine. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Radu, so uh, until yesterday, I assumed that simply because you had a title doctor uh, and that you were a professor of medicine, uh, that you were, <laughs> in fact, like myself, a physician. Uh, so I found out the other day that you were a dentist. Um, so that makes it that's all the more intriguing. So do you want to explain how that came about? Sure, John. I, I'm a dentist, but I never practiced dentistry. I specialized right away in pathology, and from there took a position at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where I took care of hundreds of cancer patients. Most of those cancers derive from a career of smoking. 
So I saw all of the lethal side effects. I, con I, I diagnosed their cancers under microscope. I saw them clinically after horrendous chemotherapy and radiation treatments. I was part of a team. So like you, the, the deadly effects of smoking brought me to try to search for another way for smokers to quit without abstaining completely from nicotine and tobacco. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so congratulations on your award. Um, and obviously one of the things you're most well known for is your takedown of the Stan Glantz article uh, on cigarette smoking, uh, on vaping and heart attacks. So I have this image in my mind that you know, one day you came across this article and you thought, eh, there's something a little fishy here. And then you went into your office and you thought, I'm going to have like a really boring couple of days wading into some data. And then suddenly you had this eureka moment when you realized that he was counting people who had heart attacks before they started vaping into his data. Is that how it worked or have I completely idealized the whole thing? No, uh, you, were, you were pretty accurate. Um, we're finding now that the effects or the supposed effects of vaping have so been, been so exaggerated that it's hard to believe that uh, you know, some of the effects are, are real. And with the heart attack, um, the, the heart attack study, the, the, the problem was that most vapors are also smokers. That's been the problem for many of these studies, is the uh, confounding of any effects you might blame on vaping from their prior cigarette smoking. So that was what I first started to examine. But then I discovered in the actual data uh, that uh, a lot of these heart attacks had occurred on average 10 years before the person reported even picking up his first cigarette. And first it, vape. First vape. Yeah. Or sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. First vape. First e-cigarette. And I mean, I checked the, the, the data twice, had my colleague check the data because I thought something was wrong. I had miscoded something. But I hadn't. And we decided that this was not just exaggeration, but pure fraud in reporting research results. You can't be wrong about this. This has to be a, a false result. And so we decided that uh, we had to contact the journal. Um, we usually are very patient, wait six, eight months for a journal to respond. But this time I also spoke with uh, media and try, uh, decided that uh, we needed to, uh, this needed to be corrected far before millions of vapors thought it was better for them to go back to smoking. Well, and instead, I actually had a chance to talk to Stan Glantz about this, I think in January or February of 2020, when he was at the <laughs> Ottawa Model for Smoking Cessation Conference. And at that stage, he stood by it entirely. He just said, you know, this is how the project's done. This is how I did it. Uh, this is normal for epidemiological studies. And he was quite unabashed by the whole thing, which I found quite fascinating. Stan stands by everything he's done, and he never gives an inch on it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've known Stan for, for decades. And uh, he did a lot of, uh, of key work uh, dealing with issues of secondhand smoke. And because of the work I was doing to protect non-smokers, right. you know, I would look at that. But then as a lawyer, um, one of the ways I look at anything that I'm going to use is how would I feel if I were in court trying to justify legislation I've helped get passed right. based on any particular piece of research right. when I'm being cross-examined by competent counsel? Right. And the more I looked at Stan's stuff, the more I thought I will never use anything by Stan <laughs> because right. any competent counsel could just absolutely rip you to pieces for paying attention to the sort of stuff that he does. Right. So um, in Brad's case, that was one of the pieces of work that first brought you to my attention. And I think it's one of the things you know, that you're going to go down and be remembered for. I, I just wondered, David, is there, what would be, is there an equivalent in your life? Is there something that you're particularly proud of or something that stands out? Uh, more than anything else that you've done? Well, I, I think trying to, to figure out things at a, at a macro level. I mean, I, I'm certainly uh, very proud of, of things I did on 
some of the litigation against the cigarette companies on various things that they were up to, particularly on contraband. Um, absolutely fascinating work. Uh, you know, global, um, very large sums of money involved. Uh, really top-notch people in pulling together the information necessary. And we changed the market. I mean, much of the anti-smoking community didn't understand what that litigation did, yeah. um, which is too bad because we could have had far more effect. Uh, but you know, very, very interesting. But I've had many of those experiences because I've had you know, 40 years doing this. So right. there's a lot of things that you see as being really beneficial. And then there's a lot of these road to Damascus sort of moments where you, you reevaluate things that you're doing and say, we, we need to do a better job here, or what I believe to be the case no longer is. Right. You know, there's enough science that's developed where I've got better information right. to say some of the things that, uh, that I've been promoting or believed in just simply weren't true, right. in including um, on things like how many people quit smoking uh, successfully with a quit attempt. You know, early in my career, the, the line we got from the uh, public education people with major health charities, right. and keep my, I'm a lawyer, right? I'm right. not a doctor. I'm right. not a cessation expert. Right. I had to go with the information people gave me yeah. to get policy. Right. And I was told every time somebody tries to quit, they have a one in five chance of success. Right. Every time. And I thought, well, so I just conceptualized that as that, that, that just, you know, you, you, you spin a dial. Right. Yeah. And you got a one in five chance every time. Like... This is easy. Just keep doing things to motivate people to try to quit. Right. And then uh, um, a late colleague, uh, Dr. John Slade, um, convinced me to go to a meeting of the American Society of Addiction Medicine because I clearly knew lots about tobacco and I should be talking to right. these people. And I walked into a room and the first poster I saw was somebody talking about the chance of success of an unaided quit attempt being 5%. Right. Now, I'm a lawyer, so of course I assume I know more medicine than any doctor. Right. And I over to the poster to say, that's not right. And she turns to me and says, yes, you're right. It's actually about 3%. Yeah. And that was right. Yeah. And I thought, so what are we doing? Because if the average success rate of an unaided quit attempt is 3%, and we all know people who had no problem at all quitting. So I used to smoke two packs a day, and then one day I just decided I'm not going to do it, and I right. left a pack on my desk, I left a pack on my car, I left a pack in my office at home, and I never had another one. That means there's other people, including people who had been calling into me any time I'd be on a radio phone-in right. show. Yep. Didn't matter what the topic was. Some people are wanting advice on quitting smoking. And some of them, they were never going to be able to quit smoking. At least they were never going to get off nicotine. Right. Yep. And telling them that they could was just cruel. Right. It's like telling somebody you don't have to worry about people coming here to beat yep. you up. You just have to jump over that six-foot-high fence. Right. And maybe... You know, maybe they, they can't jump that high. Right. Maybe physiologically they just can't do it. And if you're just saying, hurry up or you're going to get beat up, right. you know, that's only making their life worse. Sure. So I think it's trying to understand now what do we do? Because you can't just do the abstinence-only thing. Right. Uh, that there's many people, there's reasons why they are not able to just completely quit using sure. nicotine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, for scheduling reasons, I missed the session on McCarthyism. But in the spirit of that, I have to ask you both, are you now or have you ever been a smoker <laughs> or a vapor? Vlad. Well, I, I think that session was about uh, people, including myself, who have taken an un, um, unusual and uh, uncommon stand Right. that hasn't been endorsed by the medical mu community at large. Right. And uh, we've taken our hits for it. Yep. We've taken a lot of criticism and in some cases some additional punishments. And uh, so they're, they're, that's becoming a kind of a common theme. And uh, I think it's an example of... Uh, we, we've seen it in other fields. Right. Uh, the... Uh, the gentleman, and you may know this better than me, the gentleman that uh, discovered hemophilus, uh, in, or the, the uh, H, yeah. gastric ulcer. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. H. pylori. Bacteria, yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, it, it took, took it yeah. for years yeah. trying yeah. to get that bug treated yeah. with antibiotics, yeah. and yeah. now it's standard treatment. Yeah. But I, I have to do my lawyer interpretation and ask for a yes or no answer. Have you ever been a smoker or a vapor? Oh, absolutely not, no. Neither? No, N uh, no. Nicotine doesn't do it for me, but don't, 
don't take my coffee away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And well, I, I mean, we, we have to be totally frank on this, in, in part because I'm soon to be calling the, uh, the, the, the person who played the role in this. When I was seven, uh, me and my friends had found a pack of cigarettes and decided <laughs> to smoke them. And, uh, and my mother uh, found us. And, uh, and she said, as the other kids ran away, I had nowhere to go because we were at my house. Uh, and she said, David, you're seven years old. You're, you're all grown up now. If you want to smoke a cigarette, you can. I mean, you know, your dad and I don't. Nobody else in the family does. But if you want to, go right ahead. You just have to do it properly. You want to inhale it deep into your lungs. You know, go ahead. Never had another cigarette. <laughs> Never had. And mom's about to turn 99, and I thank her frequently for, uh, for having done that. That was, that was my one smoking experience. And have you ever vaped? No. Okay. Well, I've probably uh, tried uh, vaping products when people had uh, talked about them, but oh, never, yeah. never, you know, been an, an actual vapor. Yeah. Okay. Um, so going back to Brad, so what have you learned from the conference so far? What's been a highlight for you up to date? Well, it reflects what Dave said earlier, that there, or what you said, there's a large contingent of people from all walks of life here. And I learn a lot by talking to people that aren't just like me. So much in tobacco control is in a, um, is in a, 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 a vacuum, and they're only talking to each other. Where here, we're talking to all kinds of folks that are professionals, they're interested in harm reduction, they're vapors, and it's the vaping community. And I think that's very educational. I always learn a lot. For example, earlier this afternoon, a vapor described to me that just before he was diagnosed with COPD, he, he quit smoking and started vaping, and it was totally stabilized. Mm. And he's now a uh, physical trainer. He's in great shape. This was several years ago, and that, that's an amazing story because, as you know, John, dying from COPD is no fun no. at all. And, and the thing is, that we know from work done by Ricardo Peloso, that people with COPD, they get better, both objectively yeah. and subjectively, yes. if they switch from smoking to vaping. And yet that doesn't seem to be part of the protocols for treating COPD. Yeah. yeah. So David, the same question, what have you learned recently? Uh, well, I've come to all these meetings other than the, um, uh, the virtual ones the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I, I learn an awful lot here, as Brad was saying, you've got such a cross-section of people from, you know, wh whether they're consumers who are saying, you know, this saved my life, I'm, I want to, to work with others, you've, you've got people who are public health, you've got some people who are involved in the, the business side of this, you also have people who see this as um, an entrepreneurial or scientific uh, 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 a quest. You know, right. how do you get better products? And that's the stuff that has constantly blown me away here. The people I meet who have ideas for new products can get people off cigarettes right. and uh, replace cigarettes. Yep. And the idea that, you know, as someone who spent so much of my career dealing with the economics of smoking right. and how do you change the economics, to consider that worldwide, people are spending over 800 billion American dollars a year, like over a trillion of our Canadian dollars a year, buying cigarettes. Yep. That is an enormous market. Yep. And if you got even a fraction of 1% of that market, it's a really viable business. So what we see is, is the potential to segment the market. You don't need one thing to replace cigarettes. You know, it's a mistake some governments make to say, we'll allow this product, but nothing else. It's going to get segmented probably the way the caffeine market got segmented. Right, yep. You can buy all sorts of different types of coffee and tea and chocolates and uh, colas. Uh, and will we be seeing ever more um, diversification of, 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 of sources where somebody can say, this person is clearly self-medicating with nicotine to treat a psychiatric condition such as schizophrenia. They need to have some sort of pharmaceutical product that meets that need. And that's a multi-billion yep. dollar market. Yep. There's other people who will find snus to be totally acceptable. They need to have it. Yep. Other people want modern oral. Some people want the heated tobacco product. Some people want some combination of these right. things. And some people, it's sort of like, you know, early in the day of mobile uh, technology, there's a huge unmet demand for products nobody knows about yet. Hmm. Right. You know, yep. We just need to allow that entrepreneurial activity to go on in a regulatory environment that encourages the replacement of cigarettes, just like we had a regulatory in environment that encouraged to move away from snake oil to science-based pharmaceuticals, yep. or from impure food to, to sanitary food, right. or from unsafe automobiles to safer automobiles. We're gonna see that happen, and you, you can watch it in real time here with the, right. the people with their ideas. Yeah. 
Okay, I think I'm getting a warning that my time is up. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank you both very much, and uh, we'll uh, keep on the conversation. And we have one more day, so I hope we'll have a great time tomorrow as well. Thank you, um, John. Thank you very much for participating. Great chatting with you. Yeah.